Hey everybody, let's get into the high school practical chemistry course for year eight science using the wonderful tiny science lab chemistry set. Now, this course is designed for um, year eight students in Australia, age level oh, 12 to 14 uh, or thereabouts. And it's very important that we um, do all of our experiments very, very safely. So let's please keep safety in mind at all times. If you haven't yet purchased this electronic document, which you can print out at home, make sure to head over to www.tinysciencelab.com.au so that you can purchase a legitimate copy of um, this booklet and support the work that we do here at Tiny Science Lab. The chemistry set equipment. So, you will hopefully have a chemistry set that looks something like this. Uh, wash bottles are also very, very helpful. Safety glasses are an absolute must. And you will need to make sure that you buy some butane. This can be bought online from Bunnings. Uh, the brand is not overly important. I've bought lots of different brands and so far I haven't had one that's been a problem. And either some matches or a little electric sparky clicker to light our Bunsen burners. So the chemistry set has got lots of different and exciting components. So. When we draw scientific equipment in science, we don't use it as an opportunity to show our fantastic artistic skills. Scientific drawings are actually quite simple. They're in two dimensions, and what they are is pretend you get a saw or a knife and you cut the object in half, what you're actually drawing is just the cross section, okay? So, Use a ruler where possible, a pencil, and the drawings will be able to, you'll be able to see them here as I show each piece of equipment. So let's get into the equipment now. So the first one we're going to look at is the beaker. This is a 10 mil glass beaker. Um, now beakers are not designed to, to measure volumes accurately. I'll just tell you that now. Um, they're, they're approximate values. Now, beakers are used for heating liquids in. You can even heat solids in them, if it's like, usually if it's a powder or something like that. Uh, very good for stirring mixtures, uh, dissolving, uh, leaving experiments over time. The glass is very, very robust. You can see through it. It's transparent, which makes it very useful. Very easy to wash and very robust. Um, but don't drop them onto the concrete floor because uh, then you'll find you'll have an empty spot in your um, <laughs> in your chemistry set. But uh, Tiny Science Lab does sell every single component separately. So you can always buy uh, components from us if you happen to break them. The conical flask is also um, made out of glass. It's called a conical flask because it's shaped like a cone. Uh, again, it's used for heating liquids. Um, great for biological experiments, uh, being leaving, leaving them over time to grow stuff in. Be careful you don't produce a biological hazard though. And fitted is a rubber stopper. And the rubber stopper is oh, very rubbery <laughs> and can push in quite firmly. Um, and that can actually be used to um, stop items falling in or even to stop stuff coming out that you don't want to come out. So, now, there's a glass tube with a rubber stopper. Now, glass is very, very fragile, brittle, breaks easy. So, when you push this in, this rubber stopper with the glass tube in, always push the rubber. Don't, don't push the glass because you'll end up snapping the glass. And glass, glass can cause cuts and you certainly don't want a piece of glass to lodge in your body so always be careful when you put on a um, rubber stop with a glass tube that you only push the glass the rubber the rubber in like so um, the let me put this away it's very important to keep your sets tidy 
when you wash them, when you wash the equipment, just shake the, the water out, as much of the water out as possible. And then usually you can put the equipment away wet. Uh, and if you leave the, leave the lid open, then it should dry. It should dry. And then later on you can close the lid and you won't get too much water condensing on the inside. Uh, the glass funnel, glass funnel, beautiful uh, little piece of equipment. It's quite brittle. So be careful not to break it or to exert too much force on it. What you might notice is that the peg holds it beautifully like so. And later on, I'll show you how to use the retort stand, um, but it actually is held nicely in the peg. So good for transferring liquids. So perfect for transferring liquids. Also, you can put some filter paper in it and use it for filtering. So sometimes called a filter funnel. Um, you can transfer powders, but they do need to be quite fine and the funnel needs to be dry, otherwise the powder will stick to it. So that's the glass funnel. The measuring cylinder. Okay, measuring cylinders, uh, five mil measuring cylinders. Later on um, in another uh, lesson, you'll be learning how to use them accurately. Uh, one important thing to uh, do is to have them on a level surface to bring your eye level down to avoid parallax error and always measure uh, water and most liquids from the bottom of meniscus. So these are um, five mil uh, in 0.1 millimeter graduations and I believe that they're accurate to plus or minus I think 0.1 millimeters so quite accurate quite accurate. Everybody's favorite, the glass stirring rod. Very, very good for stirring. <laughs> no surprise there. Not good for banging. <laughs> if you bang, 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 you'll break, break, break. So don't go banging, go stir, stir, stir. Um, very easy to clean. Um, you can heat them up a little bit, although I wouldn't recommend that, uh, to be honest, but they can certainly go into hot liquids without melting because glass has got a very high melting point, nicely rounded at both ends, so beautiful. Now, there's a something called a watch glass. Now, a watch glass is about the same size as a watch. Now, if you don't know what a watch is, well, look it up on the internet. Um, <laughs> you can get bigger ones, and they're called clock glasses, because clocks are big and watches are small. But of course, with Tiny Science Lab, you, we're using small ones. Now, watch glasses, you can put liquids on there, you can put uh, powders on there. Uh, do not heat it directly over a flame though. If you were to use the Bunsen burner and heat that directly, it will crack, okay? As it expands uh, the, ins the middle where it's heating, it will expand and the outside will be cool and contracted. It's guaranteed to crack. So you do not heat these directly. But later on, we're going to learn how to heat them with a water bath and very good for evaporating our solutions to find out what the dissolved substance is. So that's our watch glass. Test tube. Oh, test tubes are very, very important pieces of uh, equipment made from glass. Great for um, heating chemicals, liquids, um, storing chemical or experiments over time. Uh, they can be washed with water, and there's a test tube brush that can be used to wash your um, test tube, and the brush can also be used to wash your um, beaker, or your conical flask, or your funnel, okay? So test tube and test tube brushes are very, very helpful. And a little plastic plate is great for putting chemicals on. And talking about plastic, there's also a 20 mil plastic container, which is also quite helpful for using with our sets. There, the tiny spoon. Everybody loves the tiny spoon. Very good for um, distributing chemicals, powders. Not good for getting wet, okay? The, do not use this spoon to stir. That's why we've included the stirring rod, okay? If you do get it wet, um, make sure you wash it in clean water and dry it very, very quickly. 
Uh, if you get chemicals that are stuck to it, like copper sulfate, make sure you dry, uh, you wash them and you dry it to keep it clean and to make sure it doesn't corrode. Okay, so uh, look after your tiny little spoon. Uh, they're actually fairly expensive to buy. They're just not. They're just not a normal like metal iron spoon. They're actually quite special. So do look after it. The wooden peg. Okay, so. <clears throat> Wooden peg, uh, it's a insulator of heat, so heat doesn't travel through it. So you can use it to hold something that's hot without burning yourself. Now, I've shown you that it's very good for holding a funnel, and it can also be used to hold a conical flask. Now, it is possible that the peg sort of like separates from the, the metal or something like that. It's got a little spring in there. Whoa, see, mine just separated. Now, that doesn't mean it's broken. You can actually fix it quite easily, okay? It's an easy fix. You just put the parts together, you put the parts together, and with a little bit of effort, not a lot of effort, you can actually, let me see if I can do it right here, live on camera, ta-da! There we go, I fixed it, it's not broken. It's almost impossible to break them, they will fall apart, but you can put it back together. So, don't say my peg's broken. No, your peg, peg just needs putting back together, okay? Then, we have got the mortar and the pestle. Now, how do you remember which one's the mortar and which one's the pestle? Well, the mortar holds water. Uh, hear the rhyme there? Mortar holds water, although you don't usually put water in there. <laughs> Normally you put in powders that need to be ground up. Okay, so you might have a, you know, maybe like uh, some sodium carbonate decahydrate, and uh, you will pop that in and you might grind it to a powder. Now when you uh, grind chemicals to a powder, that increases their surface area, which uh, probably will increase their rate of reaction uh, when you do a chemical reaction with them. Now, it's probably best to wear safety goggles when you're grinding um, things in the mortar and pestle because it has been known that that energy, that heat of uh, grinding can actually cause the chemical reaction to occur with some chemicals, can cause an ignition point. Uh, and so, <clears throat> so just be safe and uh, if in doubt, always wear safety goggles, or even when not in doubt, wear safety goggles. Ah, the heart of our system, the Bunsen burner, okay? Absolutely wonderful piece of equipment. Changes the chemical potential energy of the butane into heat energy. Now, whenever I take it out of the case, I always like to just hold the top and just rotate, just to, I'm, I'm, I'm just, making sure the top metal part is tight, okay? So sometimes it can become loose, so you just need to make sure it's tight. Um, it's also important to have a little look to make sure the top, that it's clean, and it's very important to keep this part clean. Now, it is possible to wash it with water and then to dry it, okay, if it does get any bits and pieces of chemicals in it, but the best thing to do is not to get any bits and pieces of chemicals chemicals in it at all because you really want to look after this um, Bunsen burner. Now the Bunsen burner, it fits into the table when the legs are out, you'll see after on. So Bunsen burner, beautiful. Then there's two, um, there's two heat proof mats. There's one heat proof mat that goes, whoop, that goes over the Bunsen burner. And there's one heat proof mat that goes sitting on the table. Now, these are to put hot things on. These will protect your table from getting burnt. Now, if your table does get burnt, doesn't matter. Bit of black, you know, black charring here and some scratches and some chemicals here. Or make it look used, which is wonderful. I, I don't want to see pristine tables. I want to see used tables. That shows that you're doing chemistry. <laughs> so you can wash them with water. Um, over time, they will get stained and even scratched, but they'll still function as heat proof mats, so that's good to remember. The tripod. Uh, triangles have got three legs, and the tripod has got three legs. Um, and 
they're, they're actually cut from steel and the legs are welded in and these are used above the Bunsen burner. Uh, now they can get quite hot, they will get quite hot when the Bunsen burner's on. So I always usually uh, like to handle them with the, the tweezers which I'll show you later on. Now don't put them back into the foam hot because they'll melt the foam. Okay, so don't put them back into the foam hot. It's usually best just to let them cool down naturally over time. And what you'll find is that this tripod will probably go rusty over time. Now, if you don't like the rust, that's fine. You can get some sandpaper and sand it off. For some of you will like the rust because it sort of looks, I don't know, authentic. So totally up to you whether you want to keep it rust free or not. The wire gauze, which can be found under a heat proof mat, is used to go onto the tripod, like so, and is used to uh, distribute the heat of the flame. So again, it gets hot, and so you'll handle it later on with the tweezers, okay, so that you don't burn yourself. Speaking of which, if you do burn yourself, um, go run your burn under cold water and seek um, medical attention. So, now I've mentioned the tweezers a few times. Now, your tweezers probably will have a little rubber tube on them, and that's to keep them closed. And whenever I take the rubber tube off, I actually put it in the end where the tweezers go so that I know where it is. Now, the tweezers are a very helpful piece of equipment for our chemistry sets. Uh, the tweezers can be used to pick up the tripod. The tweezers can be used to pick up the wire gauze. Now, with the tiny science lab, I actually use the tweezers to actually handle the glassware as well. Now, normally with regular size equipment, I'd say don't do that. But with our equipment, um, actually handing, handling the glassware with the uh, tweezers seems to be quite fine. You can even hold the... Um, conical flask although what you will notice is that it does have a little bit of a it does sort of like pivot in there um, so it's not it's not as good uh, the tweezers is not as good as the wooden peg but still um, oh look in fact look if I hold it there we go sort of there we go if I hold it uh, closer towards my hand there um, look at that that's actually fairly um, firm in there. So if you are picking up the um, conical flask with the tweezers, maybe hold them further away from the end. So tweezers, excellent. And before I put them away, I will put the little rubber tubey on and then pop them back in there like that. Now, that brings me to the thermometer. And the thermometer is accurate to one decimal place. Uh, well, it shows one decimal place. So this reading is actually 16.4 degrees Celsius. There's a little tiny point there. So it's in Celsius, not Fahrenheit, and there's a little point there. Now, you might have a little cable tie on yours, or you might not. And this is actually called, this little silver part here is called the probe. That's called the probe. And that's where, that's the thing that you put where you want to measure the temperature. Now that, that probe can go in boiling water, okay? Um, in fact, it's okay if this lead goes in boiling water, but don't, don't heat this lead up with the Bunsen burner because it's just made out of rubber and the rubber will, the plastic will burn and melt and then you'll have to buy another, um, you'll have to buy another thermometer from us. So very, very good, very, very handy, great for measuring all sorts of temperatures in the fridge, the freezer, in your experiments outside in the sun. Lots of experiments can be done with this. Now, eventually the batteries will go flat, okay? Because it's always on and you can't turn it off. So the batteries will go flat. So to replace the batteries, what you do is you grab the lead and you give it a little bit of a yank and it pulls out like this. And there's two LR44 button batteries that you can um, replace them with. And then you pop them back in Make sure you dispose of the old ones carefully. Uh, make sure they are kept away from young children.
because they look a little bit like lollies and we don't want kids to swallow those button batteries under any circumstances whatsoever. So keep the button batteries away from little children. Um, and then you can find out from your local council's website how to dispose safely of your button batteries. So let me pop that back in. And that can be washed with water. That probe can be washed with water. Um, so then we've got some scales. Now these scales are quite special. Very, very accurate. Always put them on a firm surface, fully on a, on a firm surface. They, these are not a toy. These are actually quite a precision scientific uh, piece of equipment. I'll open them up. Now your hinge might um, you, they're actually designed to take this plastic case off, but sometimes the hinge is, you know, doesn't go click on perfectly, but that's okay. Um, then once it's all firm and there's no bumping, then you can turn it on and you wait, just wait. It'll take some time to settle and then hopefully it should read 0, 0.0, there we go, 0, 0.00. So just be patient if you want to weigh something you can gently put something on there like that. It says it's 7.97 grams. Um, you could put a plastic plate on it there like that, 2.64 grams. And if I wanted to weigh out like a gram of say copper sulfate, then I'd use my tiny spoon. Now, what I would do then is I'd put my plate on and then I'd press the tear button, T-A-R-E. That brings it to zero then I can weigh out my copper sulfate or whatever substance. Now, you would not normally put any chemical directly on the surface of that metal plate, okay? You always put a chemical into a container and weigh it like that, okay? So don't put chemicals directly onto those plates. Uh, that's not, the scales do not like that at all. Then you can turn them off and then close them up and put them back into your case. That brings me to the retort stand. Now, I personally has, have designed this retort stand. I think it's much better than ones found in schools. Notice that uh, it's this, you've got a fitting here that slides up and down. It's friction fitting, okay? There's no knobs to turn and twist and that sort of stuff. It's a, it's a friction fitting. And you'll find that this black end piece slides in and out as well. Now, you might be thinking, doesn't that mean if that is a friction fitting, won't this like just come down over time? And the answer is no, because when you apply the weight here, it causes it to twist here, and that twisting increases the, the friction. Now, let's say I want to hold the funnel. I want to hold, I want to hold the funnel. Then I will get the red fitting, Okay, the little red fitting. And I will push the peg into the fitting like so. So the red fitting holds the peg. And then I'll push that into the end of the, um, this, I guess you could call it the clamp. And then I can put the, hey! And so if I want to adjust the height, I can bring it down like that. I can bring it up. And I can slide it in, I can slide it out. How good is that? That's the uh, retort stand. What else can I hold with it? Well, if I take out the peg and change the fitting to the blue fitting, like this, okay, pop that on. Yay! There we go, that's holding in place. And this time, two that fitting. Yay! I did it. There we go. So you can actually use the blue fitting to hold an open peg like that. So, very helpful uh, piece of equipment, the retort stand. Another classic use for it is to, if I take that peg out uh, and swap it around again, swap, 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 take this, it's just a friction fit. And if it doesn't fit in that well, just push a little bit harder. And it's very actually, very useful to hold the probe. Okay, so it's actually very, very useful to hold that probe, that temperature probe in a beaker of liquid. So, 
Excellent, excellent. Now, I love to make sure that the equipment is always put away in its spot. So, if you put it away clean, and you put it away in its spot, then it's very easy to use the next time you get your equipment out. So, now, there's a plastic pipette, is next. And if I get a little bit of water into a beaker, plastic pipette is used to, you squeeze the bulb, and then you release the bulb and water will go up into the plastic pipette. And you can release it dropwise, drop, 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 count the drops, or you can give it a squeeze. And there are some measurements along the side here. Now you've probably got a two mil, um, a two mil pipette. And I think that it's graduated in half mil graduation. So like half, one, one and a half, two mil. Now it is important to recognize that uh, these plastic pipettes are not really accurate either, but very good for transferring liquid. Now I've got a little bit of liquid in this beaker, and so I usually have some type of container that I use as a waste container. So. Now, the wash bottle, um, it's not a water pistol. Do not squirt anybody ever with any piece of equipment from this set because, you know, someone may one day use, you know, an acid or, you know, something corrosive or caustic. And if you go and squeeze that water, which you think is just water, you might actually spray something nasty on them. So none of, none of our gear is a toy. So don't muck around with it, please. Now you should have some water in it. And the best way to use a wash bottle is to hold it vertically and then just to squeeze and water will come out the top, okay? So that's how we use a, whoop, a wash bottle. A rubber tube, the rubber tube can be cut to length and the rubber tube will fit over the glass tube for different experiments. That's the chemistry set uh, equipment and uh, I hope that when you use it, you use it safely and carefully and that it will enhance your enjoyment and learning of science and chemistry. Bye for now. Hello everybody. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at hazards and risks. Now hazards are anything that have the potential to cause injury. It could be sharp objects, it could be chemicals, it could be hot objects, it could be things likely to, to explode. Um, but there's, it could be a trip hazard, it could be a slip hazard, <laughs> lots of hazards in today's society. Now, a risk though, is the likelihood for a hazard to cause injury. So, oh, <laughs> I've just blown out this Bunsen burner. <laughs> um, what's a hazard here? Well, if I, uh, I'm going to protect my eyes from uh, any possible uh, hazard that could affect my eyes, which I guess um, could be some hot water spurting out. What's the, the risk of that? Oh, quite low, quite low, but um, I'll put my safety goggles on anyway. Um, let me turn this gas up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, now, oh, the hazard is a hot match. So I'll put the hot match on the heat proof mat. So a risk, a risk is how, you know, how likely that hazard is to cause injury. Now, let's have a little look at this setup here and look at the, the hazard and the risk factor. Now a hazard obviously is the hot water in this beaker. Now, because there's only a little bit of water, the risk is low. And because it's actually not that high off the table, the risk is also fairly low. Um, the hotter it becomes, the hotter it becomes, the, the, the greater the hazard and the more likelihood it is to cause injury. So look at that, it's bumping away there. I'm going to turn turn that heat down now. There we go, now, now it's sort of just boiling gently. But did you notice that I um, was using my tweezers to move some of the equipment around to help keep it safe? Uh, so we've got glassware that, um, you know, it, it's hazardous if it uh, breaks because glass broken is sharp 
and can cause cuts and injuries. I've got a, a wire gauze here. Let me show you the wire gauze. Oh, and it's actually glowing. Whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> oh, let me fix this up. Oh, what a disaster. There we go. Oh, that's better. Um, so I'm handling the wire gauze with my um, tweezers because of the heat. Uh, the tripod itself is made from metal. And so that's a hazard. Uh, it, you know, uh, how sharp are the edges? You can consider that. Is it hot? Yes, it is. Uh, what's the risk factor? Fairly low because I'm, you know, uh, <laughs> if, I, if I did get burnt by it, I'd just go and run my burn under cold water and uh, the injury wouldn't be too severe. So, hmm, I don't want to over, overrate the risk. And we've got a flame there. Now, that flame can be quite dangerous. Um, its risk factor is relatively high, but we can do things to reduce the risk factor. For example, just putting the wire gauze over there. Now, have a look at this conical flask with the rubber tube and the, the glass rod. Is that hazardous at all? Absolutely, absolutely. Because this is really, really quite um, firm and sharp. If I came down quickly with my head, I could actually poke that into my forehead uh, or into my eyes. Um, so sometimes there's hazards that aren't obvious and they're sometimes the most dangerous ones, the most risky ones, because you don't really realize how dangerous or hazardous they actually are. So always, yeah, glass rods, glass tubes are quite hazardous. So take care around them. So ways to reduce risk, obviously, I've had a look uh, at some things already with you, but ways to reduce risk in with the Tiny Science Lab is to handle our equipment with our tweezers uh, rather than your hands. Uh, even, even if you don't think it looks hot, I like to get into that, like this tripod doesn't look particularly hot, yeah? But I wonder if I put a little bit of water on it. Whoa, <laughs> see that? It did not look hot, but in actual fact, it was very hot. So see that steam, right. So that should be a good point of uh, warning for you. Whenever I have my Bunsen burner on, once I've lit in it, um, it's very good form, in my opinion, to quickly put the tripod and wire gauze over the flame as soon as you possibly can. Whoa, there we go. Because a flame like that is actually quite risky, whereas if I put the tripod there, all of a sudden that sort of forms a little bit of a barricade and then the wire gauze diffuses the heat. Lovely. Um, make, rendering it uh, very, you know, not particularly risky at all. Um, using the Bunsen burner, always use my uh, safety glasses and um, if you keep all these things in mind, you actually can have a, a quite safe experience with the tiny science lab. All science experiments are inherently dangerous. Um, the good thing about tiny science lab is the risk is much lower. Why? Because the volumes are much lower. So you're using less hot water, you're using less chemicals. And so that's a, a number of ways where tiny science lab equipment reduces risk. Anyway, I hopefully you've enjoyed this um, lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in this lesson we're looking at PPE, personal protective equipment. Now, do you wanna know what I think is probably the most important piece of PPT, <laughs> PPE in um, chemistry? Hmm, you're probably thinking like safety glasses. Well, I actually think it's this thing. This is a hair tie. And I have seen more accidents with long hair getting burnt in Bunsen burners in schools than I have seen kids being damaged with their eyes. It is very important 
that you tie your long hair back with a hair tie so that there is no hair hanging in front of a, or on top of a Bunsen burner flame. Hair is actually very flammable, so make sure you tie your hair back. Obviously, I don't have much of a problem with that given my fairly short hair, but if you've got long hair, and I'm even talking about wisps of hair coming from the side here, make sure you tie them back. I don't want to see you catching on fire. <laughs> anyway, but safety glasses are also uh, very important, and um, probably uh, the, the, the most, the worst incidents I ever had was a time when I wasn't wearing them, when I wasn't expecting for something to happen. I had a can of paint, and I was shaking the can of paint for quite some time. It was heavy zinc uh, galvanizing paint. I was shaking it. Uh, I didn't have safety glasses on, uh, I didn't think I was going to need them. I opened up the can and it, psh, it sprayed my face. Now, thankfully I was able to close my eyes just in time, but where the paint hit my skin, it actually burnt, you know, really, it really hurt. Had my eyes been opened, I'm sure I would have had some serious damage there. So unexpectedly, is the, <laughs> that, that's, that's probably when you need your safety glasses the most, when those things that you the surprises, the surprises that occur. Uh, it could be a rubber stopper blowing off a test tube or something like that, or a chemical spurting out when you least expect it. Safety glasses protect your eyes. So very important. Now, I don't normally wear um, lab coats. And the reason I don't normally wear a lab coat is I actually don't like doing experiments that would have actually need a lab coat. I don't like to do experiments that are going to spray and shoot stuff off and, you know, uh, that I have to protect my clothes. I actually like to do experiments that I'm almost 100% sure are going to be perfectly safe and perfectly contained. But if you do wear a lab coat, make sure, make sure it's a good lab, lab coat because I'm going to show you that not all lab coats are the same. In fact, some lab coats are actually more dangerous wearing the lab coat than if you didn't have the lab coat on in the first place. How is that possible? Well, it's because some lab coats are actually quite flammable. So I brought these um, relatively cheap lab coats um, for Tiny Science Lab and way too cheap and the reason I <laughs> the reason that they were so cheap is that they're made from a synthetic material um, based from petroleum and let me show you what happens if you hold it in the flame are you watching look here we go whoa look at that it see that hole it just melted a hole straight into it whoa and if I hold it on a little bit longer look whoa see that Oh, quite flammable, quite toxic, and that's that actually burnt really quickly. Let me do that once more. Imagine if you're wearing, imagine if you're wearing that, right? Imagine if you're wearing that and it caught on fire. Let me, whoa, whoa! See that? That that burning plastic that would stick to you, right? Very very dangerous. Especially, look at that, it's catching, I'll, I'll blow it out, but it's become quite sticky and hot. This would cause some serious injury to your, to your skin. So, it's probably made out of nylon. Um, and so, definitely, definitely a no-go. Um, this is a, a better one. Uh, it's heavier duty, and I'm fairly sure that it's made from cotton. Okay, I'm quite sure that there's a lot more cotton involved here which is not synthetic and I will I'll get the base of it and let's have a look to see what happens if I hold it in the flame what happens if I hold it in the flame oh flame's gone out so let me just quickly relight that there we go and hold it in the flame let's see what happens Oh, that actually, 
<laughs> that, actually, that actually burnt quite well too, didn't it? <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Whoa, whoa, that's probably even worse. Oh, you. I really don't know my lab coat material, do I? <laughs> oh, that probably goes to show that I, you probably should assume that every lab coat is flammable, right? And if you're wearing a lab coat like so, see how this sleeve is hanging down? I would not have that sleeve hanging down like that. I would probably uh, put the sleeve up like this um, to... Um, so that it can't, you don't have it too much loose material hanging around to get burnt. Oh wow, I don't think I'll ever trust a, a trust a um, lab coat again in terms of flammability. What a disaster. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, what's also very important, uh, heavy duty shoes, usually made out of leather, so that if you drop um, you know, a heavy beaker, now we don't really have any really heavy beakers, or really heavy equipment, but sometimes you might accidentally tip some chemicals or something, um, and then a pair of enclosed shoes is really good. And some people really like to wear gloves. Um, again, um, I'm not a huge glove wearer, uh, because typically if I feel, if I'm dealing with some chemicals and I feel my hands get wet, then I just go wash them. Um, I assume that if anything goes on my hands, it's dangerous, and so I just go wash them off in water. Uh, I have had it once where a teacher was helping me make liquid nitrogen ice cream, and he had gloves on and he was stirring it, and the, the gloves froze, and then they sort of froze his fingers a bit, and he got a little bit of frostbite. Now, I know that if you're not wearing gloves, you actually feel it get cold, and so you actually move away, um, and so... You know, um, it's up to you whether you think it's important to wear gloves, but just beware that also gloves, some gloves can be flammable as well, particularly like rubber gloves. Um, and so be careful with the PPE that you're, you're wearing, that it's actually not going to cause you more harm than if you weren't wearing it. So my two favorite pieces, of course, are safety glasses and hair ties. Very, very important. Okay, well, hopefully uh, you've enjoyed this lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be learning how to light a match the Tiny Science Lab way. And that is a safe way, particularly if you're in a group of students using this equipment, um, and so you might be sitting quite close to each other, lighting match the TSL way will be a great way to go. So for this um, activity, you're going to need your heat proof mat, um, some safety glasses, a box of matches, of course, and it will be handy to have your tweezers ready. Now, the tweezers have got a little loop there and that loop keeps them closed. And so I always put that loop back at, back in the slot in the foam case to, so that I don't lose it. All right, so I'm going to put my glasses on and this part of the matchbox is called the strike plate, the strike plate. Now in the olden days, matches didn't need a strike plate. You could actually strike a match on almost any surface. You could strike it on a window, you could strike it get on the bottom of your boot. Uh, I saw a movie where a cowboy struck it on the stubble of his uh, cheek. And all that striking produced um, heat from friction, and that heat was enough to ignite the chemical in the match. Now, fast forward, I don't know, 100 years or so, and now we have something called safety matches. Now, just because they're safety matches doesn't mean they're safe. <laughs> I mean, a safety match can still burn down a bedroom or even a house. So the reason it's called a safety match is because you need both the match and this special strike plate to ignite the match because the strike plate actually contains some chemicals as well. Oh, look at this, my uh, glasses are fogging up. <laughs> so I'm just going to get the corner of my shirt 
and I'll use the corner of my shirt to wipe the glasses and that's better. Now, I like to put the um, heat proof mat in the center of my table and then I aim the strike plate towards the very, very center of the heat proof mat. Now I hold it at quite a steep angle and then the match itself, I actually hold red end down and I actually hold it vertically and I'm actually going to strike down vertically and you'll see that the light mat, the match lights up very easily. Are you ready? Strike down. <laughs> Strike down. Hey, look at that. I get it burning and then I hold it horizontal. Okay. So once it's burning, hold it horizontal or upwards like that. Because otherwise, I've seen kids, they keep holding the match like that. You know what happens? Ah! They burn themselves. And if you do burn yourself, run your burn under cold water. Now, the burnt match, I'm going to put here on the corner of my heat proof mat so that it doesn't damage the table. Let's do that again. So, get out a match. I will hold it um, with the strike plate aimed towards the center of the heat proof mat and I'll strike straight down. I'll get it burning and then I'll go horizontal like so. So if you get it burning well, then it, the match doesn't go out terribly easy, which is really, really good. Now, this is a chemical reaction. It's producing light, it's producing heat, uh, it's producing a new substance. I can see black charcoal now. All classic, classic signs of a chemical reaction. <laughs> this is a non-reversible change or an irreversible change. Oh, a little bit of smoke. <laughs> now, why is this safe? It's safe because, well, nothing is really safe, um, <laughs> but it's a safer way to light a match because I've seen kids who light a match where they, they flick it like this and I've seen the burnt match woo, heading off and landing on the, the, the lap of another kid. If you strike it towards yourself, I've seen little burnt matches like land on the person's shirt. But if you hold the strike plate towards the centre and you strike straight, <laughs> straight down <laughs> you're, you're almost guaranteed to light the match get it burning well and then you can hold it horizontally now we can have a little bit of a challenge if we want let's see who can actually burn the match for the longest so I'm going to get out my mobile phone stopwatch and I will put it on stopwatch and it's on the clock there we go, and the stopwatch reset, it's ready to go. And the question is, who can actually burn the match for the longest um, without burning themselves? And this is where you need to have your tweezers at the ready. So, are we ready? Once I get it burning, I'll press start. Okay, that's burning, so I press start. I'm now going to hold it in my um, tweezers. And look, you can actually see the the time happening there and so you sort of have to hold it horizontal you don't want it to burn too quick because the challenge is who can make it burn the longest is mine going out and mine's out oh my stopwatch didn't work <laughs> oh dear oh dear oh dear <laughs> or is it working oh it is working it is working I think it was about 32 seconds no a bit less than that so I'm going to do it again Let's just call that one a practice round. <laughs> Nothing wrong with having practice rounds, okay? Yeah, that was that was definitely just a practice round. Okay, uh, light my match. Oh, press start, and I'm getting it burning. Okay, let's have a look this time. Oh no, the flame was too big there. It was burning too quickly. You want to find that balance of just. Um, just burning, I don't want it to go out yet, I want it to burn all the wood. Hmm, I think last time I got about 28 seconds, to be honest. Uh-oh, uh-oh, got it burning again. Don't go out, don't go out. Oh, what do we got? Oh, it's not too bad. I should stop talking because of the... Oh, oh don't forget that last little bit of wood. And it's out. 44 seconds! Yay! Oh, that's not too bad, I think. 44 seconds. How did you go? Okay, how did you go? Um, 
Friction, very important. Friction is a force that resists motion, but if you rub your hands together, you will notice um, that it gets warmer. Yeah, your hands get warmer. Friction, friction forces often produce heat. Yeah. Um, now, when you do that previous experiment, it's best to actually repeat it three times, and then you add those numbers, those times together, you divide by three to get yourself an average. Okay, that's how we work out averages. You add up all the numbers, and then you divide by how many there are, the number, how many numbers you added up, and that will give you the average. Now, one of the chemicals in um, the match head is red phosphorus, or phosphorus, and phosphorus is an element uh, but phosphorus can actually take on some different physical forms. Phosphorus can actually take on uh, being a red phosphorus, something called red phosphorus, and white phosphorus. Carbon is an element that can actually be like diamond, black soot, graphite. It's got what we call three allotropes. Allotropes are examples of the same element, but with different physical properties. Uh, and the physical property might be its uh, boiling point or its density, uh, even its colour. Uh, I put it to you that you should research uh, what an allotrope is and how it relates to matches and red phosphorus and white phosphorus because that will give you a better idea of how a safety match works. Okay, hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hello everybody, in this lesson we're looking at filling and lighting the Bunsen burner. So this is the Tiny Science Lab Bunsen burner. It's got a fuel reservoir here which holds the gas. Uh, that goes beneath the table and the little Bunsen burner part sits above the table. Now the gas required is butane. Butane is a hydrocarbon and I'm going to make a model of it. Now, this black ball represents a carbon atom, and I'm going to push into it four hydrogen atoms. Now, these four hydrogen atoms and one carbon atom form the molecule methane. Methane, now methane is a flammable gas, uh, belched out by cows, and uh, it's actually uh, belched out by uh, humans uh, from the other end. Uh, but if I get a second carbon atom and now place um, another three hydrogen atoms so that the carbon atoms are fully surrounded by hydrogen, I, now I have ethane, a molecule of ethane. And ethane is uh, one of the precursors to uh, making polyethylene bags. So. Let, let's now take off one of these hydrogen atoms so that I can bond to it a third, a third carbon atom. And so let's fully surround that by hydrogen atoms. And I've got a little cute little doggy. Woof, woof. <laughs> woof, woof. Now you can do this with um, plasticine uh, model uh, molecules. Now the correct name for this is propane. So we've got, had methane, ethane, propane. And propane uh, is your barbecue gas. Uh, it's what you get in those bottles that you can get refilled. Propane, liquid petroleum gas, is uh, mainly propane. Which finally brings us to butane, which if I add one more carbon atom, so that I have four carbon atoms, surrounded by, surrounded by 10 hydrogen atoms are uh, chemically bonded together, I now have a molecule of butane. Okay, there's a molecule of butane. And if I want to draw it, which I do, okay, um, let's draw that molecule of butane. And this is just going to be a very simple um, ball and stick model. Very, very simple. Four carbon atoms, so I call it C4. And then if I get 10 hydrogen atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10. I've got C4, H10, and that is our model of butane. And when I have trillions of those molecules, that's what makes up this liquid. Now, this liquid uh, quickly goes into a gas, which is why these uh, Bunsen burners use butane, because under a little bit of pressure, it's a liquid, but then if you release the pressure, it becomes a gas, which makes it very useful for Bunsen burners. So I purchased this from Bunnings. Now you can purchase it online. Um, now I have bought quite a lot of different um, uh, brands over the years and I've found every single uh, brand has worked very well in these Bunsen burners. So how do we fill up the Bunsen burner? Well, a homeschool student showed me this. I think this is the best way where you put the Bunsen burner upside down into the hole in the table so that it's quite firm. And I take off the lid and I'm actually just going to use, I don't actually need the adapter. Now there's, sometimes you'll see adapters in the lids, but I've found that that size actually fits our Bunsen burners. Now I will be coming vertically straight down and once I engage, I will just give it a firm push and hold it there. Now we might get a little bit of gas coming out. A little bit is okay, but we don't want too much coming out. Otherwise it means you haven't seated the, the valve in properly. Also I wanna make sure that nobody has um, got a lit Bunsen around us or that there's any flames around us because the gas that might escape is quite flammable. So we have to be very, very careful. And then the final thing is, we don't need to overfill the Bunsen burner, okay? We just need to bring it up to about 80%, eight tenths the way up. In fact, I'm not even going to bring it up to the, it's about eight tenths. You'll see what I mean when I fill it up. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm going to hold the, the base with my left hand, the can with my right hand, push down firmly, and that's full. Even though it, there's a gap up the top, that's fine. 80% is perfectly fine. This will give at least 20 minutes of burning time. So yeah, don't overfill these please because otherwise well, they might not function properly. So we now can put it in the table, but what I want you to notice is pretend your hand, your left hand is the table and you're going to hold the black ring. Well, when you turn on the gas, I actually have to turn it clockwise to turn on. So. Rotate to turn it on, and then anti-clockwise to turn it off. And what you'll notice is that there's a little bit of a lump here, that's called a key, and there's a hole in the hole, so to speak, a notch out of the hole, and that key goes into that notch. And that will allow us to rotate the base without the whole thing turning. So, there we go, it's in the um, table now, and I'll be able to adjust the um, gas with my left hand. I'm going to put my goggles on, like so, and I'm going to get out my solid heat proof mat, which I will put near the Bunsen burner. I will put my um, heat proof mat with the hole in it over the top of the Bunsen burner, like that. And I'll probably get my tripod ready and my wire gauze ready for once I've actually lit it. So we can use our matches and you know what, I usually like to get the matches burning before I actually turn the gas on. Now when I do turn the gas on, I only give the, the, the bottle about half a turn. So I'm going down here with my left hand, I'm grasping the, the base of the Bunsen burner and I'm rotating. Now you don't need to have it on full. In fact, it won't work very well in, on full at all. The, the flame, the gas will blow out the match. So usually I just have it so that it's just audible. Okay, just audible. And so I light my match and I aim my strike plate towards the center of the heat proof mat and I strike straight down. And now the match is lighting. I bring it to the side. I bring it to the side of the Bunsen burner and I could tell that the gas was um, too high to start with. It was blowing out the flame, so I reduced the size of the, the amount of gas coming out. And I can make the gas go 
uh, low. And I can make the gas go high and just get used to rotating it with your left hand so that you feel con full control of the Bunsen burner. Let me do that again. I've turned the gas off. It does take a little bit of time for the gas to stop coming out once you have turned it off. And let me light my match. I wait till I have full control of the match that it's burning quite well. There's no rush, no rush at all. And I slowly increase the size, the amount of gas coming out by rotating the knob. And very simple to light, very simple to light. Ah, beautiful. Ah, very nice flame. And it's important to put the tri wire gauze, the tripod and wire gauze over as soon as possible. Now, there are a lot of benefits to lighting matches. It's good for learning. However, matches, you know, they cost money and they cause produce waste. And so Tiny Science Lab actually sells this beautiful little um, clicker. It's a little uh, piezo clicker, which produces a tiny little spark. Let's see if you can see the spark when I click it. Let's, I'll hold it still and you see if you can see the spark. Can you see the spark there when I'm clicking? Hmm, we'll find out later. But let's see if I can use this to light my Bunsen burner. I put, I put it on the top in the middle, turn on the gas, click. Oh, look at that. I'm going to do that again. Click, click, yay! Once more. So if you don't want to buy matches, you can buy one of these clickers of fuss. And it fits very nicely in the set where the um, test tube brush and the plastic pipette are. Very nice indeed. So, um, safety precautions. Um, as I've said, once you've lit it, put the tripod on and, um, and the wire gauze, and then that stops you from putting your hand over the, the Bunsen burner flame and burning yourself. If you do burn yourself, put your burn under cold water and seek some medical attention. So I hope that you've enjoyed this lesson of filling and lighting the Bunsen burner. Uh, a very key takeaway, a key takeaway is to only ever fill your Bunsen burner up 80% and not to overfill it. Okay, I look forward to seeing you next lesson. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be investigating matter. Now, there was a little kid and he was crying in science class. <laughs> and the teacher went up to him and said, Hey, what's the matter? And the kid said, Everything! Everything's the matter! <laughs> anyway, matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. Anything that takes up space, so has volume, and has mass, i.e. Uh, gravity acts on it, uh, it, it weighs something, um, that it has some type of inertial resistance to movement. Um, I guess mass is a bit of a concept that needs to be built up. But anyway, the question is, um, does air, you know, the air around us, does that count as matter? Obviously, you know, like this pen that it has mass, I can weigh it and um, it takes up some space. Uh, I can work out the volume via the air of the, the base of the circle times the height. You know, it's a pretty basic cylinder. Um, but does the air around us um, count as matter? So hopefully we're going to actually try and show that the air around us firstly takes up space. So I've got a glass of water here, um, nothing fancy, and I'm just going to put in some food colouring, a little bit of green food colouring. Well, that was quite cool actually, watching that uh, ring of um, food dye sink to the bottom. And as I can see, the colour slowly diffusing. Now I might mix it to make it mix quicker. So I've got a nice solution there of green food dye. Then I'm going to need a 10 mil beaker and I've got a little bit of tissue here 
And so I'm going to tear off some of the tissue. Now, if this tissue gets wet in this water, my guess is that it's going to go green. Let's have a little, oh, I can see that it's soggy and wet, but it's not very green. So I might actually put a little bit more food coloring in it. There we go. Make it nice and strong. Beautiful. Um, now, if I put it in there, oh, <laughs> yeah, that definitely goes green. So that's what I wanted to show. And I'm going to get my little bit of um, tissue paper and I'm going to stick it with some sticky tape in the bottom of the beaker. So I've got my um, tissue paper and I'm going to get a bit of sticky tape and I'll just roll it back on itself so that it becomes like double-sided tape. And I can push that down into the bottom of the beaker, like so. You can just sort of see it in there. And I'm going to fold the tissue paper over, stick that in, ta-da! You can see that there's some tissue paper there, yeah, on the bottom, and it's not coming out. And so, does air take up space? Let's have a look. I'm going to turn this upside down and push it into the water. Now, down, 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 down. Now, that beaker is fully, fully under the water, agree? Now, if air didn't take up any space, you'd probably make an assumption that that, that green water would go up into the beaker, yeah? Now, Let's have a look. I'll take it out, give it a bit of a shake. And what color is that paper? White. It's white because it hasn't gotten wet. Because the air has taken up space, right? And so water hasn't been able to go up there. Yay! That's one way to show that air takes up space. Now, does air um, have mass? Can we weigh air? Now, let's have a look. There's a fairly, I guess, common experiment to show that air has mass. And let's see if we can do that. So I've got my scales here. And I'll open up my scales and I'll put them on the table. The scales are quite sensitive pieces of equipment. I always have them on a firm table. Just turn them on and then wait a little bit. Okay, wait a little bit. And while I'm waiting, I'm going to get out my uh, little rubber balloon. Now, I've got some rubber balloons here in this little plastic container. And the first thing I'm going to do is weigh the rubber balloon. So, mine says 0.18 grams. Okay, so let's jot that down. Uh, balloon, empty, empty is not point, <laughs> it changes as I breathe. So the, the weight changes as, as I breathe. It's quite, it's quite delicate, so I have to be quite careful here. I'm just going to tear it, zero, zero, zero. Put it like in the, in the center. 0.18, okay? 0.18 grams. Now, my Inference is that if I blow this up and put air into it, so now it is hard to blow. So what you can do is you can pre-stretch your balloon. If you pre-stretch your balloon, that will actually make it easier to blow up. So give it a bit of a stretch, but not so much that you tear the thing apart. <laughs> so just, just stretch him a bit, okay? Don't overdo it. And I mean, if you, I don't want to put any spit on it. Okay, so that's a good size, and I think I'll be able to tie that into a knot. Some people hate balloons. And so, now, I'm guessing that, I'm saying that air, I'm saying that air is matter, so I've shown that it has, takes up space. Now I'm showing, hopefully, that it has got mass. And so if I pop that on, I'm expecting, I'm expecting it to be more than 0.18. So, whoop. Just turned off because it's got it's got it you know turns itself off after 30, 30 seconds pop that on oh 
it's actually showing 0.19 grams. Okay. So the the mass has gone up a little bit by 0.1 gram. So <laughs> mass empty uh, and the balloon full. Um, 0.19 grams. So therefore, it has gone up by 0.01 grams. So in actual fact, I'm a little bit surprised because occasionally, occasionally the mass doesn't go up at all. And I've even seen times where the mass has gone down and that's quite confusing because not all is as it seems. When you actually blow this up with air, the volume actually increases. Now, if you were to put this balloon, this empty balloon, and put it under underwater, you know, it'd be quite easy to put this underwater. But if you try and put this underwater, whoa, the buoyancy force pushes it up, yeah? Well, we're not underwater, but we're under air. And air around us is actually pushing up as well. And so the more space you take up, the, the bigger the buoyancy force. And that's probably going to explain why you get some very strange results here. It's because of the buoyancy force of the air pushing up on this balloon. Okay. But is there a better way or a different way to show that gas has mass? Well, I think there is. Okay, I think there is. So what I'm going to do is I've got a fairly lightweight glass here. Now, your scales probably only weigh up to a maximum of 100 grams. So probably best, I'm just going to check the mass of that cup. Well, it's 60 grams. So um, that just means I can only like put in 40 grams of coke. <laughs> so we're actually going to see whether carbon dioxide, which is a gas, has mass. So. I will just open that up. And for the purposes of scientific investigation, I'm just going to make sure it is coat. Okay, yeah, it's coat, perfect. All right, so I'm going to put that glass there and gently, 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 I don't want it to bubble too much. Oh, that's not very good at all. I'm dribbling, dribbling all over the place. Okay, yes, mine, this is definitely only... Um, 100 grams, it's gone overload, so I take some out, still overloaded. Okay, here we go, perfect. Not quite perfect, because I actually have to put a Mentos on here. Now, again, for the purposes of... Okay, definitely Mentos. Um, I have to put the Mentos on the scale as well. Oh, 99.00. I'm gonna film this. I'm gonna film this, okay? So, video. Perfect, 99.00. And pop that in. And let's see what happens. Oh, I got bubbles. Bubbles of gas. Did you notice though that the the number went down? Is it going to go down further? I'm at ninety eight point nine six. Go down more. Please go down. I want the mass to go down. Ninety eight point nine six. I don't think it is going to go down anymore. Mm. Mm. Normally, mm. not happy, not happy. Mm. Oh, oh, and my scale, my scales turned off. Right. Pop them back on. Oh no, it's gone to zero now. Hmm. So, is, what improvement can I make to this experiment? Okay, I know what I can do. I need to use a plastic cup so that I can get more coke into it. So, let me get another cup. Okay, I've got a little plastic cup and I'm going to gently fill it up with Coca-Cola. 
I don't want it to bubble yet. I don't want the bubbles to come out. Alright, let's turn that on. I do want it filled almost to the very, very top for this. Let's try it. Almost to the top. Alright. Alright, let's pop that on there. 71.33. Let's get the Mentos because we need to weigh that as well. We're at 74.12. Now, to demonstrate, to demonstrate that this has got um, mass, we're now going to pop that in. We're hoping to see We're hoping to see the, the weight go down. Yes, 74 point. Go down, 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 down. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, it's trying to go down. Did you see it? It's, it's like flickering between 74.11 and 74.10. Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't know how conclusive this is, people. <laughs> I don't know whether I've been able to convince you or not that gas has mass. <laughs> <laughs> oh well i wonder how you go when you try this um i won't call it an experiment uh, we'll call it a well we're, we're trying to find out some scientific principle were you able to succeed who knows all right <laughs> thanks for joining me this lesson and i look forward to seeing you again soon bye for now Hey everybody, in today's lesson we're going to be looking at gas has mass and um, going to be using some Coca-Cola today as well. So, um, going to start, we're going to need some scales and we're going to actually need to set up the Bunsen burner <laughs> uh, because we're going to be boiling um, or at least heating up gently, maybe not just, maybe not boiling, but heating up gently. Okay, I've got some gas in there. Tighten that up. That's great. And pop him in. Heat proof mat. I always like to get my tripod and wire gauze out. That protects uh, myself quite well. And we need a little beaker. And I'll just put this Mentos to the side for now. And I think that's all we need. So, first thing I'm going to do is fill up this beaker with coke. Now I'm going to use my little um, funnel and pour him in. Now I actually don't want it to bubble too much because that bubble, it bubbles is, is carbon dioxide coming off and I don't want too much to come off. All right, so that's quite full. And I'll give this a little bit of a rinse before I put it back into the set because it's got sticky coke on it now. So I'm just using my wash bottle to rinse it off. There we go. That's a good, good wash. That will do. And now I can just give it a shake and then into the set it goes. Okay, so I'm going to weigh the coke and the beaker. All right. So wait for this to zero. And as soon as it's zeroed, I place that in the middle. And the mass is 20.47 grams. So let me record that. 20.47 grams. Now, we're going to heat up this beaker. Now I've got my little clicker here. And I might remove that. Lovely, pop him on and get my safety goggles. And now I'm going to just heat this gently, okay? Now the moment I put it on, the moment I put it on, I actually start seeing bubbles coming out. That is not boiling, people. That is not boiling. What is basically happening there, what is basically happening is that as water heats up, it actually doesn't, can't dissolve as much gas as it, it can when it's colder, right? And so as the water heats up, the, the sugary water, the, the carbon dioxide gas comes out of the solution, right? Now, 
what is the temperature? I can actually measure the temperature, no problem at all. Um, but I, I would say that the temperature at the moment is probably only about, mm, my guess is only about maybe 40 degrees or something like that. Let's just pop that in and let's see what the, the temperature is in here. Um, 32, 35, 37, 39, so 41, 43. Okay, so the temperature is going up, but it's nowhere near like boiling point for water. Okay, nowhere near. Now, I'll just give that a little bit of a shake. Okay, a little bit of a shake. And basically, when it stops, when it stops boiling, when it stops boiling, um, not <laughs> when it stops bubbling, because it's not boiling yet at all. When it stops bubbling, I'll put these back on. When it stops bubbling, which is about now, that means the coke has gone flat. There's no more carbon dioxide dissolved in it when it stopped bubbling, which is pretty close to that point now. This would be flat, warm coke. Ah, disgusting. So I'm going to turn off the Bunsen burner and we're going to re-weigh it. Now, remember our original weight was 20.47. Now, to show that gas has mass, we're expecting that value to go down. All right, so here we go. I'm going to pop it on there, the middle, and it now says 20.38, 20.38, and that is a difference of, um, or the mass lost is 0.0, .0 nine so 0 0.09 grams which is close to 0 0.1 grams so it appears that the amount of gas that has disappeared into the atmosphere is 0 0.1 grams have i shown have i shown that gas has mass mm. appears so but there's actually something i did that was not a very good idea I wonder if you know what it was that actually has led to, uh, it, it's made it look like gas has mass, but there's a big mistake that I made. Do you know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. Remember when I, in my excitement, I wanted to show that it wasn't boiling. And so I put this thermometer probe in. Well, what happens to the thermometer probe? It gets wet, right? It's got a little bit of coke on it. And so when I actually put the thermometer in and then I took the thermometer out and put it down here, I'm actually taking some of the liquid with me, yeah? And that liquid has mass, a little bit of mass. Um, and so really, I should repeat this experiment without putting in the probe and taking out a little bit of water. Um, so there we go. It's always good to analyze what you've done along the way to see if you've made any like big mistakes like that, um, big obvious mistake. That's actually a big obvious mistake. Now I should wash this quickly with water um, so that I can put it away without it getting all sticky. There we go. Perfect. So one more, one more activity with Coke and Mentos. Going to attempt, I'm going to attempt to do like the Coke uh, Coca-Cola Mentos Fountain. Now I do know that this works better with Diet Coke. 100% it works better with Diet Coke. I don't even know where, whether it's going to work today or not. Um, literally I have no idea. I suspect it won't <laughs> because whenever I try things like for the first or second time things don't work. Um, and that's the third, fourth, fifth, fifth time as well. So what do I need? I need my little um, conical flask and I need my rubber stopper. Now, with, with the glass tube. Now, what I need to do is actually have the glass tube sticking through further. Now, you could push it through with, hmm, that's actually quite a firm fit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my goggles on. I'm going to put this on the table and I'm just going to push down firmly, but not really, really hard. Okay, there we go. I've pushed the rubber stopper down and so the glass tube has come up. So it looks something like this. And I'm just going to test it. Okay, that's good. I actually want it to go down a little bit further. I want, 
I want the glass tube that when I push it in, I want the glass tube to be near the bottom. Well, oh, can you see that? But not touching the bottom. I, need, I, I want it near the bottom, but not touching the bottom. Then I need a Mentos. I'm not going to eat it this time. Uh, I need a Mentos. But I need to cut off a little bit. So I've got myself a knife here, a knife. Now, this is going to be sort of fun. I'll just get my my what my tweezers so I can move that. I want to actually heat up my knife. So you'll see why in a moment. Wonderful. Okay, let's heat up the knife. So heating up the knife. I'm going to actually try and cut a bit of the Mentos off with the knife, the hot knife. I like it. Oh, it's actually glowing red, glowing orange. Look at that. Woo! <laughs> oh, look at that hot tip. Whoa. Okay, I'm going to cut a little bit. Whoa! Oh, oh that scared me. Wow. Wow. Oh, look at that. I love it. <laughs> oh, I've sort of made toffee now. Oh, beautiful. Oh, wow. It's got a crispy outside and a soft inside. So I've got a little bit of Mentos that I'm going to now sort of... Ah, look. It's, I've managed to stick it to the glass tube because of the heat. That's it. And I sort of actually want it to go down a little bit. Will, can I move it down? Yeah. Nice. Nice. Look at that. <laughs> All right. So, are we ready? I think this might work. I think. I don't know. Let's have a look. Let's put some Coke in. Can we do the Mentos fountain with Tiny Science Lab? I've got the Mentos there, and I'm going to put this in super, super quick and see what happens. So the bubbles, I think, will come out of solution because this will the rubber stopper will be on, that, that gas will push on the liquid, the liquid will be pushed down and then up through the tube, and then it's going to spray all over the place. Maybe. Let's see. Ready, set, go! Sort of like, sort of slowly bubbling out the top. That was very disappointing, wasn't it? I wonder, I wonder whether it works better with Diet Coke. I don't even know whether you can buy Diet Coke anymore. It's like the zero or I don't know, no sugar, I don't know. But anyway, um, was that a failure? Mm, let's just call it a learning experience. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thanks for joining me today and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. So everybody, in this video, we're going to look at a, a very important um, concept called conservation of mass. Now, the word conserve in science means to not lose anything. That is that the final amount is the same as the init initial amount. And mass is the amount of matter uh, something, you know, exists or has. Uh, the SI unit or the system international unit for matter is, uh, for mass, is the kilogram. And a kilogram can be divided up into a thousand equal parts and those equal parts are grams. So that's what a gram is. It's a thousandth of a kilogram. 
And we're going to start with a quite a simple chemical reaction, uh, but we're going to convert it from, I guess, the simple uh, to the quantitative. We're actually going to be looking at some quantities. And although this is a simple chemical reaction, we're actually going to look at something called a stoichiometric ratio. So I know it sounds confusing, but all will become clear. We need to start with five mil of vinegar. Now, you could use a beaker because it's graduated, you know, it says two, four, six, eight, ten 10 mils, and then there's a line. So you could actually put five mil of vinegar up to that line, but a 10 mil beaker is actually not all that accurate. So to actually get five mils of vinegar um, as accurate as possible, we should be using a little measuring cylinder. So what I'll do is I'm going to get my funnel and my vinegar. Now there's lots of different brands of vinegar and I'm just going to use white vinegar. I think white vinegar is best for this. But different brands will have different concentrations. I'm not too sure whether there's a standard or not um, for vinegar. Now, you can't see that vinegar. Now, before I put this funnel away, because it's got vinegar on it, I'm just going to give it a bit of a squirt with water and the end, and then there's my washing up done. <laughs> so I can pop that back in the set. I'm also just going to put um, a little bit of food dye so that I can colour that vinegar red so that it's easier to see. And I'm going to use my plastic transfer pipette. Well, maybe a little bit later. To start with, I might just actually pour close to 5 mil. Okay. Not exactly, a little bit under. Because now I'm going to get my transfer pipette. I'm going to bring my eyes down to the same level as the graduations. And the bottom of the meniscus needs to be on the five mil mark. One more drop. That's pretty close. Excellent. There we go. Now again, uh, I've got a little bit of vinegar in this plastic pipette. So what I'll do is put some clean water into that little beaker, draw up some, give a little bit of a shake, and squeeze that in there like that. Once more, there we go. I've done my washing up. Fantastic. So I'm going to tip out that water now. Tip, 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 tip. And put in my five mil of vinegar there. And it's probably interesting to see that in actual fact, it actually has gone up to the six mil mark, which shows that these markings are not particularly accurate. Now, I need a stirring rod and I've got some bicarbonate of soda. Now, bicarbonate of soda is a compound um, and it doesn't matter what brand you purchase, it should, it should be pure bicarbonate of soda, whatever you, you buy. And I need my tiny little spoon, and I get one spoonful. Now I need a level spoonful. I need a level spoonful, so I'm actually going to use the back of my tweezers. Aha! There we go. So I've got a beautiful level spoon of bicarb soda. Now I'm just going to add it gradually. I don't want to tip it all in at once, because I don't want this to over flow with the gases. So here's a chemical reaction. It's producing carbon dioxide gas. Yeah. And there we go. Oh, don't go over. Don't go over. Don't go over. Please don't go over. Oh, yes. <laughs> Whew. Otherwise, we'll have to start again. So tip that in and we've got bubbles of carbon dioxide are being produced in this chemical reaction. Now I know it's a chemical reaction because a new substance is produced and that new substance is carbon dioxide gas. You'll just have to take my word for it at the moment that it's carbon dioxide gas produced. And also the sodium bicarbonate sol uh, solid ha has disappeared. 
Now, has it dissolved? Yes, it's dissolved, but in that dissolving, it has also reacted now with the vinegar. Now, I'm now going to add a second spoon of um, bicarb. Now, keep in mind how many spoons we're adding, because this is very important to find the stoichiometric uh, amount of the reaction. Now, notice, notice that time, it didn't sort of look like it was going to froth up. There was, there, there, there was not as much reaction happening. Why is that? Well, it was the same amount of sodium bicarbonate, but the vinegar has changed. Some of the vinegar molecules were used up, so it's not as concentrated, okay? So we're actually using up the vinegar molecules. You know, this is not pure vinegar. This is only a little bit of vinegar with a lot of water, a lot of water. And so we're actually just using up the um, vinegar molecules. Let's do a third one. Okay, third spoon. Notice I'm not getting my spoon wet. I'm keeping my spoon dry. And, oh, that was, we've still got reaction, but not nearly as much. Not nearly as much. So, now if you've got, if you've got double strength vinegar at home, you probably find that it was quite, um, reactive on that third spoon. But this is just plain old cold single strength vinegar. And I think, I think the stoichiometric ratio is three spoons of bicarb to five mil of vinegar. That's it. That's what you need for this reaction. So now that I know those quantities, we're ready to do our experiment. So we will need a, a conical flask, uh, we will need a balloon, and we need to put into that balloon uh, three spoons of bicarb soda. Now that's not an easy job, that's not an easy job. I can't really use my funnel to transfer it because it's wet. All right, if it was dry, I'd, that would be a different scenario altogether. So, hmm, how am I going to do this? How are we going to get three spoons of bicarb in? So, well, I'm, I'm really opening up the, I'm really opening it. I've sort of turned the balloon inside out. So I'm going to get my first spoon. Remember, it's a level spoon. I'm actually going to see if I can encapsulate that spoon spoon with the, this might be easier with two people. I'm going over the spoon with the balloon. Will that work? Mm, no. That's a bit of a duck. Mm. This is not an easy job. It's easy with two people. There's lots of experiments that are actually done better in groups because, you know, I could get one person to hold this open and then the other person puts the spoon in. Okay, so maybe I'll just try and try to force the spoon in. Will that work? Oh! <clears throat> mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. Um, hmm, thinking, thinking, thinking. Hmm. Hmm, there's a little instruction sheet here for the scales. What would happen? <laughs> If I put my bicarb on the instruction sheet, so I've got a little bit of a V funnel there, and then I like V funnel it into the balloon. Oh, there we go. Yay! Yay! Okay, that worked. So I need another two spoons in, so I might just do those spoons straight away. One, to a little bit more, okay? A little bit more. It's okay to have a little bit of excess bicarbonate in this activity. Um, it won't change our, it won't affect the outcome. Better to have a little bit more 
Whoa, uh-oh. <laughs> See what I mean? A little bit extra because I've like just spilt some. And how are you going with this? <laughs> are you struggling like I'm struggling or do you have help? Or have you found a better way? If you have, I'm happy for you to share it with me. You can send an email to Tiny Science Lab. Say, I've worked out a better way to put the bicarb into the balloon, Jacob. Well, <laughs> sometimes I wonder whether I should ever been a teacher. Hmm. What, what would I have done if I wasn't a teacher? Hmm. Screw the toilet. No, not the screw the toilet. Screw the toothpaste lids onto the toothpaste, toothpaste tubes. I was thinking rolling the toilet paper onto the toilet paper rolls. Something simple, but I'm guessing that maybe there's machines to do that. Okay, so I've got my bicarb there. Perfect, perfect. And now I need five mil of acid. Now, remember, of vinegar, and vinegar is an acid. Remember I measured it really accurately before, but it went up to the six mil mark, so I'm just going to go up to the six mil mark. Perfect, that's close enough. So let's now put this vinegar into there like so. So we're looking at the conservation of mass in a chemical reaction and that is that after the chemical reaction, the mass is the same as before the chemical reaction. But we need to trap the carbon dioxide gas. That's why I've put it into a balloon. Now, flip it over there like that, but I haven't flipped it over yet. I've put it over the rim and I need my scales. Hello, where are you scales? Let's get my scales. And we're going to write down the total mass before the reaction, the total mass before reaction. So total mass and Initial is a better word than before. And so let's pop that there on there. And it's 17.68 grams. 17.68 grams. And we will now do the chemical reaction. We'll now do the chemical reaction by flipping open the balloon. Way! Look at that. Look at that. I've got a chemical reaction happening. But I'm, I'm, I'm capturing the gases produced. I'm cap capturing the gases produced. And in actual fact, the final mass, the final mass, it says 17.67 grams. Oh dear! Some of you say, well, the mass has gone down. In this chemical reaction, mass has not been conserved. You know, you've lost some mass. Well, there's something else going on. And the thing is that as this balloon blows up, it increases the buoyancy force. And so I'm actually expecting the mass to go down just a smidgen, which indeed it has. So the atoms in these compounds, and vinegar is a compound, and sodium carbonate is a compound, have been rearranged in this chemical reaction. But the the atoms, the matter, has not been destroyed in the chemical reaction. And this is what this, this experiment shows us. That in any chemical reaction, in any interaction, that mass is conserved. You can't destroy mass. You can move it around, you can change the molecules, you can change the atoms and that sort of stuff. But you can't destroy matter. You can't destroy mass. Now, if you're cluey, you'll say, well, doesn't uh, nuclear reaction like fusion destroy mass well yes it does it changes mass into energy according to our famous or well, the famous equation equals mc squared but if you ignore that little tiny part of science <laughs> then the rest of science tells us that conservation of mass is it, it happens every time in fact because it happens every time we call it a law the law of conservation of mass and that is that you can neither create nor destroy matter there you go. Hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson. Hopefully you've had some success. Uh, like I've actually finally, finally had success. Woo! <laughs> and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.
Hello everybody, welcome to this lesson on solids, liquids and gases. Now, solids, liquids and gases are three states of matter. There is a fourth state of matter called plasma, uh, but the ones we're going to deal with in the laboratory are solids, liquids and gases. Now the kinetic particle theory of science um, says that all matter is made up of tiny little particles, hence the kinetic particle, uh, the particle, so small little tiny particles, and that those particles are in constant motion. There's the word kinetic. Now theory is basically a big idea. So the big idea is that everything is made up of little particles and those little particles are in constant motion. So how about we start with a couple of ice cubes. Now, um, in the sets, there's a little ice cube tray, and hopefully you've got some ice cubes ready for this lesson. If you don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, okay? Promise. Um, maybe you can, anyway. You don't have to have ice cubes for this lesson. It's just the, it's just the first little bit. I'm just going to melt an ice cube to talk about the kinetic particle theory. So let's get out the Bunsen burner. And, oh look, I've got, <laughs> I've got a solid, liquid and gas right here. The solid Bunsen burner, the liquid butane, and there's actually gaseous butane up the top as well. So I've got the three states of matter right here in my hand. And let's get a heat proof mat, of course, and a tripod, of course, wire gauze, good, good, good. And I've got a giant um, ice cube tray. <laughs> and so I'm gonna just pop out a few of my ice cubes. And these ice cubes are in the solid state. You know, when I push on them, they can resist the force. Um, they've got a, a constant shape, until they start melting, of course. Um, the particles, they're made up of particles, and those particles are all cl quite close together. And if I get a beaker and put a um, ice cube in the beaker like that, just one little ice cube, see a little ice cube like that, I can actually represent it. <laughs> Look at my wonderful drawing of a beaker here. I can represent the ice cube with these nine little particles, yeah? See that? I've sort of got a square shape here, two-dimensional, of course. This is three-dimensional, but, you know. And this is made up of trillions and trillions of particles. This is only made up of nine. It's a model. I'm modeling what's going on to help us understand the particle nature of science here. Now, what's very important to know is that the particles should be vibrating. So this this is not a great model because, you know, it's, it's, it's actually not showing this vibration. And the vibration is a little tiny movement backwards and forwards, movement backwards and forwards, movement backwards and forwards. Um, the colder something is, the slower the movements. The hotter something is, the faster the movements. So let's have a little look. Let's just quickly light our Bunsen burner and light the, match the tiny science lab way and light the Bunsen burner. Wonderful. And as I heat up the um, ice cube, the particles start moving and vibrating more and more and more, right? So the particles are vibrating more and more. The hotter they get, the higher the temperature, the more the vibration happens, yeah? Now, what's actually holding them together are bonds, okay? Bonds between the molecules, okay? Intermolecular bonds, we call them in science. Now, as you heat it up, look, the, the bonds, because of the vibrations, the bonds actually break. And because the bonds actually break, we actually go to this next state of matter, which is called the liquid state. Now, in the liquid state, the particles still are quite close together, but they start moving around each other. They, they're, they're not in the same location as they are um, in a solid. And they actually take the shape of the bottom of the vessel, all right? That's, oh, I better put my Bunsen burner back on because I wanna to get to the next state, which won't take long with our equipment. There we go, woo! This will blast it up. <laughs> as, I, as I put in heat, that, that movement occurs even more rapidly. There's more vibrations, there's more lateral movement as these particles move around. And then eventually, you see this gas coming out? Zhoo! Off goes a particle. 
Pew! Off goes another one. 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 Shoo! 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 And before you know it, there's none left in the beaker. The entire... <laughs> whoa! <laughs> the entire... Uh, all the water particles have headed off out into the atmosphere. Um, still vibrating, still moving apart. Uh, and I should show that they actually then, these particles, over time, they actually will fill the entire room and sort of be like randomly set, you know, apart like this, that they're, they're sort of a long distance apart. But they're zipping around, they're, they're bumping against the walls, they're bumping against each other. Uh, very, very exciting. So, <laughs> so, having a look at our worksheet, um, can you weigh a solid? Can you weigh a solid? Well, of course you can weigh a solid. You can get your scales out, you can get your solid, you can put your, um, can you weigh a solid? Absolutely, yes, solids can be weighed. D does, do, do these take up space? Do solids take up space? Well, I can actually show you that they do because what we can do is I can fill up this beaker to the absolute brim, right? So let me fill up this beaker to the brim. Let's get a little bit of food coloring in it. Yeah, Whoop, there we go. Uh, it's not quite up to the brim yet. I can actually fit a bit more. And what you'll find, what you'll find is that there's actually surface tension here. Uh, oh, well, I don't want it to run out yet. Now, if, if a solid takes up space, if a solid takes up space, then when I put the solid in, then liquid should come out because, yeah, it does. Look, can you see this? Have a look. <laughs> as I put in a liquid, the liquid takes up, as I put in a solid, the solid takes up space and it causes the liquid to come out. That's called displacing the liquid. Now, do solids have a fixed shape? Well, this mortar has a fixed shape. It's a solid. Um, what else? This um, plastic dish has a fixed shape. It's a solid. Uh, the conical flask, it has a fixed shape. It's a solid. But not everything, not everything is as simple as we always make it out to be. So for example, what about sand? Is sand a solid or a liquid? Hmm. Well, the individual crystals have their own little shape, but as a whole, the sand sort of, the particles move apart and spread apart. So a little bit complicated. Some things are not as straightforward as what we, as what we think. Fixed volume, is the volume the same for a, well, can you, can you squish? Can you squish a solid? Yeah, generally you'd say no, but what about a sponge? Oh, why can't things in life just be easy? Anyway, it <laughs> doesn't matter. Can it be compressed? Can you compress a solid? Well, this is a solid. Can I squeeze it? Don't squeeze it too hard because it might break, of course, and then it might cut you. But um, solids, because the particles, because the particles are close together, right, in a solid, and here I am, I'm freezing this gas. First I liquefy it, then I freeze it. Um, oh no! A particle, oh, there it is. <laughs> Can you compress this solid? Well, the particles are already close together. So no, there's, you can't really compress a solid, yeah? All right, now, what about a liquid? All right, well, oh, look, these, um, these, ice, these ice cubes have actually melted. Can you weigh a liquid? Well, yes, you can. I mean, if I turn on the scale and I squirt water onto it, it will show the weight, but the, the water will run off. So that's not, that's not a great idea. Do liquids take up space? Well, obviously, this liquid is filling up this beaker. So yes, liquids take up space. Do they have a fixed shape? No, no, liquids don't have a fixed shape. And let me show you. At the moment, this liquid is in the shape, <laughs> it's in the shape of a beaker but I'm going to perform a magic trick. A magic science trick of science. Do, 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 do. Oh, dribble, dribble. Um, look at this. Whoa, I've just poured. <laughs> what a mess. I've just changed the shape of the liquid. It's now the shape of a conical flask. So no, liquids don't have a fixed shape. They actually take, they actually take up the shape of the um, container or the vessel that they're going in. Do they have a fixed volume? Ah, do they take up the same, you know, can you change the volume of a liquid? Well, well, we'll talk about that. With a liquid, 
what we have to notice is that the particles are actually still quite close together. And because they're quite close together, that means the, 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 the liquid has got a fixed volume. And can it be compressed? Hmm, we'll do a little bit of experiment to show that no, liquids can't really be compressed and they can't be compressed because as you can see, there's no, there's no real gap between those solids. But gases, gases are a different story altogether. Gases, let's turn this into a gas, let's heat it up. We got the liquid, there we go, vibrations, the movement, and then pew, 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 we're, we're heating, we're feeling it. If I put a lid, if I put a lid on, if I put a lid on this beaker and heat it up like this, put a lid on like this, so I've got a beaker like that, and I've got a lid on it, and I heat it up. Do you know actually what I've got here? I've actually got like a bomb. Yes, because you know what a bomb is? A bomb is when the particles are moving so fast that they're pushing against the walls of the vessel that they're contained in and they actually blast out. So if I keep heating this, the, the energy of these, these gas particles moves around and I guess the question is, can you weigh a gas? And the answer is absolutely, you can weigh a gas. I could actually put different gases into a glass jar and if you weighed the glass jar, the weight would be different depending on the gas. Hydrogen gas? <laughs> if, don't breathe in helium balloons, kids, but if you do, it changes your, the pitch of your, your vocal cords. Hydrogen gas is lighter than air, and so it actually lifts in, things up. Hydrogen helium is lighter than air, and so it lifts things up. Um, sulfur hexafluoride, sulfur hexafluoride, it's a very dense gas, and it makes your, uh, the words come out quite, um, uh, what's the word, quite, uh, a very low pitch. Do gases take up space? Do gases take up space? Absolutely they take up space. <laughs> Making all those noises because this is the same balloon that had the bicarb soda in it. Ah, it tastes terrible. Anyway, look at that. I have filled this up with gas and it's taking up a lot of space. Yeah? It's taking up a lot of space. So, but do they have a fixed shape? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The air in this balloon, if I let it go, those particles will now spread out and over time they will spread out and they will actually take the shape of this entire room. If I let them out of the door, they'll actually take... Oh, they'll, oh, let's not talk about that shape. <laughs> they will... Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about... Oh, they will take the... Look, the air, the air in here has got the shape of the conical flask. So yes. Now, do they have a fixed volume? What do you think? Do they have a fixed volume? Absolutely not. Because I could actually, if this was a plunger and I pushed it down, I could actually force the gas to take up less space. I could push those particles together. And can these particles be compressed? Absolutely. If you push them together, you can compress them. So before we do our little activity, our little practical activity, I have got a water bottle here, giant water bottle. I know this is supposed to be tiny science lab, but just for this lesson, it's going to be big tiny science lab. Yeah, whatever. Um, and you can see that there's lots of little orbies here. Now, at the moment, let's call them representing a like a, a flat solid, as if I've frozen water in here. And what you'll notice is that they are vibrating. Okay, those particles are vibrating, but they're not moving around. But if I heat up the, this solid, then, and I give them some more energy, notice that the particles are moving around. They're, they're moving about, they're changing position. They're still quite close to each other. But then if I heat them up even more, then eventually you get all these particles, woo, filling up the entire, the entire vessel. And that would represent the gas, okay? So that represents the gas. So now, for this activity, um, you'll need your pipette. Now pretend that you filled it up with sand. If you filled it up with sand and squished it, you wouldn't be able to squish it, okay? That's because sand is not compressible. But what I want you to do now is suck up some, I want you to try and fill this up with water. Now it's not, well, it's actually not an easy job to fill this thing up with water. I'm actually got to flick the liquid Maybe there's a better way to fill this up with a liquid. I have to sort of like, hmm, 
So turned it upside, well, turned it upside down. I'm squeezing the bulb now as much as I can. And now I'm going to get some more. There we go. And again, I think I'll be able to. I think I'll be able to fill this up with liquid. Not an easy job because of surface tension and pressures and stuff like that. So there we go. Oh, I've still got some air in here. How am I going to get that air out? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to get the. Oh, I think I've. I think I've managed to work it out. Yay! I've got that 100% full of liquid, liquid water, and I'm going to put my finger on the end. Okay, put my. And now, whoa! Now, it does flex a little bit. It does flex a little bit, and you might say, "Oh, that's because the liquid's compressing." But in actual fact, I can actually feel the whole pipette expanding when I squeeze. A liquid actually carries the force throughout the entire liquid. I'd have to say that liquids do not compress. Liquids do not compress. And if I now empty this, squeezy, 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 go, 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 go. And if I put my finger over it like that, ah, I can compress the gas. I can compress the gas, like so. All right. Now, this brings me to I used to love this uh, little experiment, or it's a demonstration. I used to do it as a kid with um, a milk bottle and a plate, but I think we can do it with this equipment. So you'll need your little um, white plastic plate. You'll need a birthday candle. Now, I also need to have a conical flask. Now, I'm going to be putting the conical flask there like that. It's got to go over the balloon, so I think I've still got my knife from a previous lesson and I'm going to just cut off the now don't cut yourself um, cut off the base of the there we go perfect and I need to glue when I say glue well let's slide it this way I need to glue I'm going to use I'm going to use a different candle actually I'm going to I'm going to actually use a bit of candle wax to glue this other candle on. Oh, ah, the wax put out the candle. <laughs> or the wax put out the flame, I should say. So, light that again. And I need a drop of wax. Drop it onto the plate. I might even get two or three drops, just to be sure. Oh, it sort of ran down down the wick. There we go, it's running down the wick, you can see that. Oh, drip, drip, drip. That should be ample. And now I put my can, well, I'm actually gonna heat up the bottom a little bit. Yeah, I think that will do it. I think so. Let's have a look. Yay! See, I have glued it. Yeah, I have glued it. I wish it wasn't on an angle, though. Hopefully this will still work. And I'm going to put water... Whoa! <laughs> overflowed. Water has overflowed. I've filled up the little um, plastic container, the plastic plate with water. And now let's get this candle burning. Now... This little demonstration has got a lot to do with solids, liquids, and gases. Now, I'm actually not going to fully explain, or even partially explain what's going on here. Um, but I'm hoping that when I put this um, conical flask over the candle and over the water, I'm ho hoping that some water will get... Now, some people say water gets sucked up, but that's actually wrong. Water is actually pushed up by the air pressure around us, the particles that are pushing on that water. Some people also say that the water goes up 20% because they say there's 20% oxygen in the air and the flame uses 20% oxygen. That's only part of the story. The rest of the story is too complicated for this year, this sort of level of this course. You got to, you have to do a year 11 and 12 chemistry course to fully understand this. 
Are we ready? I have to do this relatively quickly for this for anything to happen. Ready, set, go. Zoop. Hmm. You know what the problem was? Problem was there's not there's there's not a lot of oxygen in this. <laughs> there's not a lot of oxygen. Oh, maybe 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 tiny science lab is not perfect. Maybe sometimes, maybe, maybe just maybe, and I don't want to admit to this, but maybe maybe that candle's too tall. Maybe that's the problem. I think that might. Maybe that's the problem. Oh, because there's hardly any oxygen in that neck, as I go over like that, it goes out. I do have a solution to that later on, maybe in the next course. Okay, in a future lesson, there's a way that we can resolve this issue. We can actually fill this up with oxygen gas so that when I go over, uh, the flame won't go out. Maybe you can do this on a slightly bigger scale. Go okay, with a bigger glass jar and a bigger bowl of water and a bigger candle. It's very, it's very interesting to do and it's a, great, it's a great trick to do as a magic show. Continuing on with solids, liquids and gases. I'm going to do one of the favourite things I used to do as a kid uh, when I had my science box set up at the kitchen table when mum was cooking the dinner. You know, I'd have candles and matches and nails and bits of wood and cotton wool and string and uh, hosted all sorts of science experiments. Now I've just put a bit of water in this 20 mil container and there's a 20 mil container in our sets. And let me pop on my safety glasses and I've got a few birthday candles here. Now birthday candles, they are tiny, which makes them, which I like. But they're not ideal for this um, activity. The best candles are actually like the, the large household candles. The thing with birthday candles is that they, they, they've got a lot of um, dyes and ink and so they don't actually burn that particularly well. Uh, I've got some more matches. And so I might actually just get my Bunsen burner going. Um, so, oh, actually I don't need matches. I can use my little clicker. Here we go. Let's get my Bunsen going with the little clicker. Yay, wonderful. And let's pop it here. And might just turn that down a little bit. And I call this activity islands and continents. And so you drip, well, there we go. That's why I've got two candles. You drip little droplets in of wax into the water and each droplet individually makes a little island. But then eventually when you have enough islands, then you actually start connecting them up with wax to form continents. Now the heat from the flame is causing the solid wax to melt. Now I could actually, I could actually be using my tongs here, my tweezers and not get burnt. There we go, I've got my safety glasses on, I've got tongs, this is awesome. Um, so the heat from the um, fire causes the particles to move faster and faster. Uh, intermolecular bonds are broken, causing it to go from a solid to a liquid, and then that liquid runs off. Now if you keep heating the liquid though, it turns into gaseous wax, and it's actually that gaseous wax which is actually burning. It's not actually the um, wick. Some people think it's the wick that burns, but no, it's actually like the, the candle uh, gas, that is, or the wax gas, that's actually burning. Oh, look at this. I'm a pro. Fantastic. I'm making a lovely um, continent now. Now I'm thickening it up. And whew, oh, look at that, fireballs. I wonder how they look in slow motion. Oh, that's actually quite hot. <laughs> um, I might actually spray a little bit of water on top to cool it down. Whoa, there we go. To go from a liquid to a solid, you'd need to remove the heat and remove the kinetic energy of those particles. And now I can pull it out. I'll just harden it up by putting it under the cold water. And we can see, eh, it's not overly impressive, but it's quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> 
Oh, very, very good. Um, another thing I used to love doing was, I'll call it the magic candle trick. Uh, that doesn't sound right, but let's pop that there. And I need to get another candle. Ooh, it must have a bit of water on it. I'll just blow this one out and see that... Ooh, that wasn't that impressive. Hmm, I love it when the smoke, oh, the smoke. Hmm, I wonder if you can do this better than I am. It's where, when you blow it out, the smoke travels upwards and you can actually ignite the smoke and the flame jumps down. Hmm, the jumping flame. Hmm, not particularly awesome in this particular case. Maybe, oh, that was not too bad. Woo, see that? So it's actually, you can see it's the smoke that actually ignites. Yay, not fantastic, but pretty good. Um, that, that smoke ignites and the flame sort of travels down. And then one last thing um, is I've got some ice cubes here that have been melting away. And so I'll tip some out. They should come out quite easy because they're um, been sitting there uh, melting for probably about 10, 15 minutes. And I've got some string. And if I hold this string, let's say I hold it above the, the ice cube, nothing really happens. See this? Hold it above the ice cube, put it on the top of the ice cube, Nothing happens. That's not surprising. But now, <laughs> drum roll, drum roll. <laughs> it's like I'm cooking some magic pizza here. And what about now if I put it on top of the ice cube? Hold it there for a, a moment. <laughs> Nothing changes. Maybe I have to put the string down. Uh, what about if I try the string down and then it works so good in the book, kids. Yeah? <laughs> okay. So let's try that again. I'm going to put the string on the ice cube. And then I'm going to put a lot of salt on. Oh, dear. That's, I'm sure that's way too much. That was just silly. That's a ridiculous amount of salt. Um, hang on. Hang on. Hello. Hello. Ah, I thought I thought I might have had some success then, but no, no. Bit of pressure downwards. No. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I wonder what the trick is to this magic trick. <laughs> the salt lowers the melting point of the ice, causing it to melt, but then it refreezes again, and that should then make the ice cube pick up part of our solids, liquids and gases. So yet again, another failure from Jacob, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you can do better. Okay, maybe you can find a better technique. Maybe I need a larger, dare I say, ice cube for this to work. Come on. Hmm. Okay, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I need like, not like Himalayan salt. Maybe I need Australian salt. <laughs> no, like maybe I need like little crystals, not like big coarse crystals that I'm like grinding up. That's probably, probably the main reason. What do you think? Um, shall we, one more try. One more try. Let's put the ice cube there. The ice cube there. I'm going to put the string on it. Like that. One more try. A little bit. I'm gonna just push with my finger for a moment. Oh, it's really cold. It's stuck. It's much colder with the salt. It is cold with the salt, I'm sure of it. Please, 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 let's have success. Oh, 
did you see it lift just a little tiny bit? I did see it lift. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that a full success, 100% success. All right. Okay. All right. Another successful science lesson. Woo. All right. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey, everybody. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the light and frost effect with an ice cube. So the light and frost effect, uh, it's a wonderful combination of liquids and gases and some amazing interactions. So uh, let's check it out straight away. Now I'm going to need my safety glasses, your Bunsen burner, tripod, wire gauze, and a steel pan from your set. Now you can use the aluminium pan, but it might melt. So I like to go for the steel one, and that's the one that's magnetic. Now the first thing I'm going to do is light up my Bunsen. Wonderful. Put on my tripod and wire gauze. Lovely. And I'm going to need a little bit of water. And I like to have coloured water, so <laughs> let's put some water here and a little bit of red food colouring. Wonderful, beautiful. And I'm going to put on my steel pan straight away like that. Now, it won't take long for that steel pan to heat up. It's got to be very hot for the light, light and frost effect. Um, because uh, if it's not hot enough, you'll just boil water. But if it is hot enough, then something amazing will happen. So I'm going to press record on this side camera so that we can see the action up close. I think this will be hot enough now. So let me get a drop or some water up into the pipette and add it to the, oh, straight away. Straight away, we're getting the light and frost effect. Look at that, a nice ball of water. Woo! <laughs> and that pan is really, really hot. Look at it move around when I blow it. Oh, it's like a little race. Around we go, around we go, woo! So what's actually happening is, the bottom of that um, drop is actually boiling, producing steam, and then that steam lifts the drop up off the pan, insulating it from the heat. Now it will get smaller and smaller over time as it, oh no, we just lost the light and frost effect. It's gotta be very, very hot for the light and frost effect. Oh, I just lost my heat. <laughs> Um, now, if you keep losing your heat, the best thing to probably do is to actually get rid of the wire gauze. So I'm going to remove the wire gauze and put the pan on like so, and it will be easier to sustain the light and frost effect. Oh, that didn't sustain it very good at all. Let's try again. Yay, there we go. Oh, I'm getting it quite big and moving it around like that. Fantastic. Now, the big question is, can we do this with an ice cube? Hmm, that is a very interesting question. I'm going to tip off that, <laughs> that ball of water. And for it to work with an ice cube, we definitely need to get it super, super, super hot. So that's what I'm going to blast it now with the Bunsen burner. Wow, it's going to get very, very, very hot. And I'm going to pick a small ice cube and hopefully we can do the light and frost effect with an ice cube. Are we ready? Are we steady? And on we go. Oh, it was so, so close. It was so close. I had it there, I had it going for a moment. Okay, I had it going for a moment and then it sort of like disappeared, uh, the effect. So I'm really blasting that with heat. That is going to get super, super hot. Let's get another ice cube. Hopefully I can get a really a small, small one. Okay, let's try this one. Okay, I can see that glowing red and are we ready? On it goes, yes, yes, no, no, oh, oh, come on. Let's try a small ice cube. I've got a massive ice cube tray here. Um, what I might do is just drop the ice cube in the water for a moment, just to make it a little bit smaller, okay? Just to, just to reduce the size of it so it doesn't quite have the same volume. 
And that's really hot now. Okay. All right. If this doesn't work, then nothing will work. All ready, set, go. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. And success. Look at that. We have we have achieved the light and frost effect with a tiny ice cube. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, if I turn off the heat, if I turn off the heat, the pan will start to cool down. But you know what? That tripod is super, super hot. So I'm actually going to squirt a little bit of water on the tripod to cool the tripod down. If you, you look at this. Look at the heat coming off that tripod. And very, in a moment, that water droplet will lose the light and frost effect. Because I'm removing... Whoa! There we go. <laughs> How good was that? So, um, yes, you can do the light and frost effect with a small little light glow, <laughs> light glow, uh, ice cube uh, on very high heat. Now, let's look at one of my next favourite... Um, one of my next favorite demos, and that is water pump up. Now for water pump up, I need to put the uh, wire gauze back on, and I need a full beaker of water, and colored water is fantastic. And we need our little um, conical flask with a little bit of water in it. Not a lot of water, okay, just enough to cover the base. So less than a mil, but just enough to cover the base. And I'm going to put this glass tube in uh, with the rubber stopper. Now I always push on the rubber stopper, not on the glass, okay? Um, because otherwise you might hurt yourself if the glass breaks unexpectedly. And let me click that up and put this on like so. And now let's get this happening. Now that's cold water and above it, above it in the conical flask is just air. Now we want to somehow get rid of the air and the way that we're going to do that is by boiling that water and it won't take long to boil at all. In fact, I can actually, if I really blast it, that water's going to, to heat up. I can actually see some condensation happening here, uh, which is very exciting. And, um, <laughs> there we go, that's boiling nicely. Okay, that's boiling nicely. Uh, filling it filling it up with um, steam. See that, filling it up with steam. And the steam is now coming out and that steam is actually carrying out the, the air. So now it's just filled up with steam. I've had a phase change, a change of state from liquid to a gas. And I'm going to now invert, flip this upside down into that beaker. So, are we ready? And keep your eyes, keep your eyes on the conical flask. Around we go. Keep your eye on the conical flask. Woo! How good is that? The water is actually pushed up. The water is pushed up because when the steam condenses, it leaves a vacuum behind and uh, air pressure is able to push it up. Now the question is, how high can I push it up? Well, I'm going to pull out that glass tube and replace it with this glass tube. It's, oh, it's at least a foot long. Much, much longer. There we go. And let's pop that in there. Ah! And put that on the fire, <laughs> on the heat. And do you think, if I invert this, do you think it will go up? What do you think? What's the verdict? Will air pressure be strong enough to push water up like one foot or 33 centimeters? So it's boiling now. It's turned, the water's turning into steam. I can sort of, sort of hear a little bit of popping and noise here. I mean, the, what you have to remember is that as the steam goes up, it cools down uh, until, and then it will uh, condense, but then when the tube becomes hot, then the steam comes out. So there we go. Perfect, and it's ready to try. So I'll just hold that with the peg and this with the, um, okay, here we go. I'm going to go this way around. Ready, set, upside down, and 
like so. And watching. And woo! <laughs> it did it again. Now I knew it would do that because in actual fact, air pressure is so strong, it could actually pump up water 30 times that distance, 30 feet or 10 meters. Air pressure is a very strong force and uh, I don't have a tube that long and my ceiling is certainly not able to do that, but air pressure is super, super strong. Okay, well, thanks for uh, joining me today. Hopefully you enjoyed the lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at some unusual or an unusual um, liquid slash solid, commonly known as ooblick. Um, I like to call it magic mud. Uh, but for it, you need corn flour, and I quite like this corn flour, but you can use wheaten corn flour as well, and it's almost just as good. And we'll need, you know, can you use a beaker? Yeah, you can use a beaker, but you could also use like the 20 mil plastic container, which I think is actually a little bit better. So I'm going to use the plastic. 20 mil container. Now, one thing about um, cornstarch is it is messy. Uh, <laughs> it's it's very difficult to pour this without the powder going like everywhere, and you'll see in a moment because I'm uh, see what I'm talking about. <laughs> so probably want to like oh, three quarter fill this or something. Oh, what a mess. Okay, that's okay. It's easy to clean it up. So that's plenty of corn starch, and I might just grab my little cloth. There we go, perfect, almost perfect, good enough. Great, so we also need some water. So I might just put um, five mil of water into this uh, conical flask with a little bit of food coloring, of course. And woo, green's nice. Sort of reminds me a little bit of like a I don't know, like a swamp or something like that. And then we need a stirring rod. So, glass stirring rod. Now, this this is a powder. Now, is a powder a solid or a liquid? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's does it have a fixed shape? Not really. The individual powdery parts do, but I, I'd, I'd classify this as a solid, personally, um, powder. This this is definitely a liquid, and let's add some of that liquid to it. You start off with a little bit, and then you can you just start mixing it in, mixy mixy mixy, and you might have to add a bit more. Try and get it down to the bottom. When you're making a small amount like this, it's really easy to do. In my teaching career, there was a few big science events like science days, and I used to buy hundreds of kilos of cornstarch and had giant like swamp runs I called them or moonwalks and I used to set up like paddling pools with this stuff uh, because it is very very interesting now I'm going to add the tiniest bit more water I might put it in the I might add it via the pipette that way I can control how much goes in there and actually, by adding water, the, the volume has actually decreased quite substantially. So I might even, I might even add a bit more. Oh no, more mess. Messy, messy, messy. How are you going? Have you made a lot of mess? Are you thinking about buying, like going to the supermarket and buying like 40 kilos of it? There are better ways to, you can buy it by the big bagfuls, like from bakery supplies. You don't have to buy it in you know 250 grams if you're going to have a big birthday party or something you could have a you could have an oobleck party or you make a small oobleck pool out the back and people can run on it and jump on it now that that is fun i can tell you so this is pretty good now the question is is this a solid or a liquid now clearly clearly you would say oh look it it can pour you know clearly you would say that's a liquid yeah but interestingly if you jab it, <laughs> if you jab it with the rod, it behaves like a solid. And that's why Ooblack is an interesting solid slash liquid, also known as a non-Newtonian fluid. You see, Sir Isaac Newton came up with the three laws of motion. 
basically that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, that the acceleration of a body or how fast it speeds up depends on the force and its mass, and also um, commonly known as for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. But his second law says that the, the bigger the force, the greater the change in speed. Well, in this case, the larger the force, the less the change in movement of the oobleck. That's why it's called a non-Newtonian fluid. Very, very fun. Now, I believe that like tomato sauce also behaves a little bit like a non-Newtonian fluid, but this is the absolute classic. Now, I'm actually going to get it a little bit more watery by adding <laughs> a bit more water. <laughs> How else would you get it watery? Uh, liquidy, let's add the rest of it up, perfect. And I'm going to get this Bunsen burner going. So, there we go. Oh, I've got a little bit of a contaminant in that. That's okay now. So I'll pop that there. I'll put my goggles on. Make sure that this is nice and liquidy. I have to sort of mix in the... Get it moving, 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 moving. There we go. Once it's moving, it's quite easy to stir, isn't it? There we go. Oh, that's very liquidy now, and it's lost the non-Newtonian fluid property. I'll put the... Now, never put an empty beaker. Never put an empty beaker onto a Bunsen burner. So, let me pour some of this in. I'll start with about half. That's fine. And then, I'm going to just start heating it. But when you heat it, make sure you keep stirring it. Okay, keep stirring it. It's easy to stir. To start with, it's easy to stir, and then it gets quite difficult to stir <laughs> because it will sort of become gluggy. Now, if you were to just dry this oobleck out, you'd end up with just like cornstarch, and that would be what we'd call it a reversible change, you know, drying it out. But heating it up now, I'm actually going to be, it's actually going to undergo a chemical change or an irreversible change. I can actually feel it getting quite it is glugging up. It is actually getting quite difficult to to stir. And sometimes I wonder, is it best just to actually like heat it up without stirring it? Will it burn? Or will it just sort of like undergo the chemical reaction from the, the bottom up? That's a, that's a good question to ask. And I guess you could experiment with that. This is definitely changing properties. Like, look at Look, see how it's going all sort of gluggy? Gluggy, 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 gluggy. Wah! But not only does it go gluggy, it also changes appearance, okay? It actually goes from being an opaque substance. Now, opaque is where light does not travel through it, to being a translucent substance. Now, because I've put um, food colouring in, that might be make it a little bit harder to actually tell. Um, oh look, my heat, my heat has gone off. Let's get the heat going again. Oh! <laughs> oh! Oh, don't pick that up with my fingers. That will be hot still. Pop that on. Give it a bit more heat. That's probably a bit too much heat. But that is definitely now a chemical reaction, and you can actually see the base there. See, look at the base there. See how that's sort of like a darker color? That's actually the transparent, um, the transparent or translucent uh, look I was actually waiting for. So, yeah. That. How, how, do you, how do you know when you've gone far enough in terms of this chemical reaction? How do you know? Very, very good question. Um, until it starts smoking and it's gone black, that's when you know you've gone far enough, that's for sure. <laughs> but, um, it's actually, and it's a little bit difficult to hold this. Now, what can you do with this? Well, good question. I'm going to put a bit of water in to this beaker and I'm going to transfer some of this glugginess to this water and I can actually dissolve it in there. Now there has been a chemical reaction and so it's not like I'm putting, it's not like I'm just putting 
um, cornstarch back into water and I'm going to get this oobleck. Absolutely not. We've, we've got a totally different substance now. In fact, the substance that it's probably closest to is, I'd say, glue. Okay, we've act we're actually making a glue here. And this is actually a paper mache glue. Now, I love paper mache. Uh, if you get a balloon and you cover it with uh, paper mache glue and then you put strips of newspaper in the paper mache and then you put it over the balloon, you can actually make like a, a, a ball, which you can then paint and you can uh, paint it has a, a planet, and you can actually make a series of planets uh, to scale size. Uh, what else can you do with paper mache? You can make um, masks. Masks are really great to make with paper mache because you, once you've made them with the paper mache, you think, can then go and paint them, which is wonderful. And so, but you know what I've always liked making the most? Volcanoes. I am a little bit of a pro volcano maker. Here's a little wooden board. Now, this, this metal here, this soft, I used to use chicken mesh, but now I actually use, it's actually gutter guard. Uh, it's, the, it's the metal that they put over gutters to stop leaves going in. It's an aluminium gutter guard. Uh, but if you use the aluminium or if you use a chicken mesh, cut it into a circle, then you cut a slit down to the middle and then you cut a circle out in the middle because what you can do then is you can then fold it up into a cone see and you can actually end up with a beautiful volcano which you can then um, staple to the wood now I've made a paper mache volcano that only just fit inside a trailer I made a model Mount Fuji and on the inside I had blowers and I had pumps and I had you know liters of vinegar and bicarb and flour and it was like you know gas bottles and flame and ah oh, fantastic the first one i made actually caught on fire and the whole thing burnt down uh the second one though was it was really really good uh there's an image of it on the worksheet um of me erupting this volcano so that you then get some newspaper strips of newspaper and you cover the newspaper in this watery glue and then you can put them over the um metal framework and then over a few days, um, or a day or two in the sun, it will go really hard. You can paint it, and then you can do your eruptions and that sort of thing. Anyway, there's our lesson on interesting liquids and solids, particularly a non-Newtonian liquid. That's it for now. Hey everyone, in this lesson, we're going to be looking at atoms, compounds, and molecules. Now, have you ever wondered where the word atom comes from? Now, atoms are what we'd probably call the building blocks of everything. Just like if you've got like a Lego house or something, and the Lego house is made up of like different shaped and different colored blocks. Those blocks would be the, you know, the, the building blocks of the Lego world. Well, there's about 126 different elements which are made up of the same type of atoms. Um, that make up everything in our wonderful universe. Now, it was a, uh, a man called Democritus who really put a lot of thought, well, lots of people put a lot of thought into um, what stuff was made from. Uh, but Democritus did this thought experiment and he said, what if I took a stick? Now, I think it was a stick, but we're going to do cheese. And this is like 430 years before Christ. Oh yeah, we're in uh, 2023. So we're talking about like oh, 2,400 years ago, two and a half thousand years ago. Anyway, I take this knife and I'm going to cut this block of cheese into half. There we go, roughly half. And I'll put that half there. And now I'm going to cut this half into half. So I'll put, well, it's a quarter there. And then I'll cut this half into half so pop that there and then let's cut this one into half and then this one into half now the question is how many times can i keep cutting it into half you know can i keep cutting the cheese forever and ever and ever into half will i always will i always have cheese 
or will eventually will I come to you know uh, something that can't be halved anymore and Democritus said when you come to something that you can no longer cut in half that that means it's <coughs> indivisible indivisible and you know what the Greek word for indivisible is the atomos that's where the word atoms comes from atomos see have a look at this right Oh, half, 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 down to the tiniest little tiny, tiny. Now, I can tell you that real atoms are much, 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 much smaller than that. And you'd need like a, an electron microscope to even get close to, you know, getting down to the uh, atomic level. But it does give you a good idea where the word atom comes from. Okay. So what is an atom? It is the building block of everything. Okay, and there's 127 or so naturally occurring ones which you'll find on the periodic table. Now, I've got a gold ring, which is my wedding band, and it's mostly, I hope, unless I've been ripped off, made out of gold atoms. And if I was to get an electron microscope and look very, very closely, what I hope to see, what I'd hope to see, and I'm going to model model those atoms and you can do the same. You can model the atoms using little round balls of plasticine. Okay, so I think the purity of my gold ring, I think the purity of my gold ring is about 99%. So if I was to have like 99 uh, little red uh, plasticine balls here, then I'd have to have one impurity atom in there. And so, for example, I'll get a, a green ball of impurity and I'll pop it in there. And that might be something like tin, an atom of tin or an atom of copper, something like that. But basically, my gold ring is pure gold, made up of billions and trillions of gold atoms. So... What are three different types of atoms? Well, gold is an atom. I've already mentioned that tin is an atom. Copper is an atom. Silver, um, aluminium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium. Any sort of um, element that you can find on the periodic table is an example of an element or an atom. Uh, radon, xenon, krypton, uranium, the list goes on. Uh, lead, boron, bismuth. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Okay, but what is a compound? Well, water. Water is an example of a compound. Do you know the formula for water? I hope so. It's probably one of the world's most known formulas. And the formula is H2O. Because a water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms chemically combined with one oxygen atom. And so a compound, it's a pure substance made up of two or more different elements in fixed ratios combined chemically together. So H2O is water, but there's another substance, it's, another, it's a liquid, and it looks very, very similar, H2O2, and that's actually hydrogen peroxide. Now, although chemically it looks very, very similar, <laughs> to water, if I was to drink pure hydrogen peroxide, it would literally burn and sizzle its way down my throat. Uh, it would literally kill me. Um, you can buy uh, very dilute solutions of it from like Coles and Woolly, 3%. Um, you can buy from like chemical suppliers, 35% concentration, but 100%, whew, it'd be very, very strong. But wherever you go in the world, hydrogen peroxide will always be H2O2, and those atoms are chemically bound together in that ratio. Not H2O3, not H2O4, that's something else. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. So that's what a compound is. Now, your sets um, come with a variety of different compounds. Now, they're not all compounds, though. That's the thing. There's a few bottles. Okay, I've got six bottles here. And um, magnesium. Magnesium. Do you think magnesium is a compound? No. Magnesium is an element made up of the one type of atom, and they are magnesium atoms. And 
that's actually a metal. Now, metals have a few properties in common. They are good conductors of heat, good conductors of electricity. They're malleable, that means you can hammer them into sheets. That's why this is like a, a thin piece of ribbon. Uh, they're ductile, you can draw them into um, wire. And they're shiny when freshly cut. So that's all properties of metals. Now there's a mixture in here as well. Uh, and this mixture is sand, iron, and salt. Now, sand is silicon dioxide, SiO2, that's a compound. Um, salt is NaCl, sodium chloride, that's a compound. And iron is, and the symbol for iron is Fe. So we've got two compounds and one element mixed together to form this, um, what is it? Iron powder, sand, sodium chloride mixture. Now, different people in different sets have probably got slightly different combinations of that mixture. But if you were to isolate the sodium chloride, the salt, the formula would be the same for everybody's sets. The iron would just be iron. And the sand, silicon dioxide. And that leaves us with copper sulfate. And copper sulfate is a, an absolute classic uh, compound. Absolute classic compound copper sulfate, and the formula for copper sulfate, you'll see it, it goes CuSO4, but now if you look closely, it actually says dot 5H2O, 5H2O. That's because the copper sulfate is actually uh, combined with five molecules of water. Now you can actually heat this up in a test tube and it will go white, and then you're, that's actually driving away the um the water molecule and so you'll let water molecules and you'll end up with uh pure copper sulfate now um what are the constituent elements copper sulfur and oxygen what's the ratio well you could say cu1 s104 that means it's the the atoms are in the ratio of one copper atom one sulfur atom and four oxygen atoms chemically bound together but what you have to realize is once you com chemically combine them together, they lose their individual properties. Copper sulfate, although it's composed of you know, copper, it's not conductive to um, electricity. It's not a good heat conductor. It's not uh, malleable. It's not ductile. In fact, it's quite brittle. It's actually so it's a soluble solid. Okay, so compounds have totally different properties to their constituent elements. That's very, very important. Copper oxide. Okay, which one's copper oxide? Well, it's black. Now that's interesting because copper is an, like an orange metal, right? So copper oxide, CuO. Copper is a orangey red metal. Oxygen by itself is like a clear colorless gas. But if you chemically combine them together, you actually get a black solid. Interesting. But you can get copper and oxygen from this. In fact, if you were to heat this strongly, you probably form copper and oxygen. What's next? Um, manganese dioxide. There we go, manganese dioxide. Um, the, the, the word die gives you, well, the prefix die gives you a little bit of a hint. Manganese dioxide. Die means two. So there's the two on the oxygen. Manganese dioxide. We're going to use that later on to split hydrogen peroxide into, into oxygen and water molecules. Very, very helpful. Sodium carbonate. Now this one is sodium carbonate decahydrate. That means there's actually um, a lot of water molecules trapped there as well. But the sodium carbonate by itself, Na2CO3. Na2 is for the sodium, and then the carbonate is the CO3. This also is a compound, and the constituent elements are sodium, carbon, and oxygen. Uh, our final one, but I don't have it here, is sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, and sodium chloride is NaCl. Now, if I was to use plasticine to model it, I'd use two different colours of plasticine, and I'd go... You know, red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green. But I might actually just do it on the um, board. And I'll go the sodium ion and the chlorine ion. And I'll go, okay, that's 
they're going to be blue and the chloride ions are going to be red and so sodium chloride is NaCl yeah and so I will go NaCl NaCl let's go again I might go Na Cl. I need another. What's that? Cl Na. And so I'm I'm building up the compound NaCl. See that? And so I'm modelling. I'm modelling the compound with um, these little different colours, uh, magnetic pieces. A more realistic model would be to use plasticine balls and actually go as a three-dimensional shape. It would still be a model, right? It would still be a model, uh, but it would be more realistic than this model because this model is just flat. So I guess, I, I wonder if I can actually go outwards. Let's try. If I go, oh, no, I can't really. If I started putting them on like upside down and building them out like that, that will probably uh, be a little bit more realistic. So the question is, what is a molecule? You know, well, compounds and molecules are, there's a, there, is quite a, there is quite a similarity. All molecules are actually compounds. And a very important one, which we've already talked about, is water. Okay, so water, if I was to sort of model it with this, I'd go H2, two hydrogens, <laughs> two hydrogens, and an oxygen. There we go. Let's we could call that a water molecule. And let's do another water molecule over here. Now, a molecule um, is just a little lump. Okay, a little lump. And it's the smallest entity capable of separate existence. Okay, so it's the smallest entity capable of separate existence. H2O, the red ones are O. When we breathe in oxygen, when we breathe in oxygen, we don't actually just breathe in individual atoms of oxygen. Oxygen in the atmosphere actually exists as what we call diatomic um, diatomic molecules. That means the oxygen is actually made up of two atoms of oxygen. But they are what we would call molecules of oxygen. They're in um, little individual lumps. So water, if I was to model it using my plasticine, um, I'd go H2. So I'd need two atoms of hydrogen. Um, now hydrogen is a very small atom. Oxygen is a much larger atom than hydrogen. Uh, about, I think it's about 18 times more massive, something like that. And so I'm going to represent that by doing a slightly larger um, lump. So in some ways, this is a more realistic water molecule Okay, this is more realistic than these water molecules because these water molecules show that the particles are about all the same size, where in actual fact, they are different masses. So this would represent a water molecule. Now, water is a fascinating, fascinating substance. And if you get a, your plastic plate, and if you get a beaker, and if you put some water in it, And if we get some food coloring, of course, Jacob and his food coloring, <laughs> and my plastic pipette, what we can do is, the question is how many drops of water can you squeeze out and put onto a plastic plate? Now, you should count these. You might think like it's 50 or 60 or something, but I'm going to do this quite quickly because something very, very interesting happens as you build up the water. Okay, all of a sudden, if you look carefully, the water actually starts to dome. It seems to defy gravity. It almost seems fairly magical. And I've actually, I think I've had kids who've put like 170 drops of water onto a little plastic plate before. I'm not, look at it bulging up. Look, 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 look. Whoa, there we go. That's because of surface tension. And it's because of the way the water molecules arrange themselves around the surface, okay? 
Now you need to go around the house and you need to find some objects that are composed of one type of atom. So if you find a periodic table and there's one in our worksheet, um, if you look at the periodic table, you might find something like with aluminium on it. Well, you can go find some aluminium foil. You might find iron, so you can go find an iron nail. Uh, you might find some carbon. There might be some charcoal in the barbecue. Um, what else might be a common uh, atom or an element from around the house? Oh, thinking about it, not wood. That's not a, that's not an element. That's for sure. Not plastic. Um, what else might you have that's a... Well, you might have some silver jewellery or some gold jewellery. Uh, Tin-plated spoon. Um, you could breathe in nitrogen because <gasps> the air is about 80% nitrogen or 77% nitrogen. You can breathe in oxygen. That's an element. Um, oh, there's probably some phosphorus on the end of a match. Okay, so there are, there are elements around the house, but typically you will find things that are more likely to be compounds. So for example, sodium chloride is a compound, sand is a compound. Uh, what else is a compound? Water is a compound, although water's, you could say it's also a molecule, so, and you'd be right in both. Plastic bags are compounds. Anything made of plastic is, uh, is compounds, but you could also say that that's molecules as well. So it gets a little bit tricky, uh, <laughs> but I don't want to be too pedantic about this sort of thing. Uh, molecules from around the house, definitely water, definitely the gases that we breathe in. Um, but maybe you can do some research and find what sort of molecules that you might find around the house. Anyway, that's enough for this lesson. Thank you for joining me today and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be looking at the periodic table of elements. Possibly the most important document in science, or at least in chemistry. And this periodic table shows the arrangement of elements by a Russian called Mendeleev. And he has arranged them according to atomic number and also according to similar properties. Um, <laughs> Anyone doing serious chemistry basically knows, you know, most of these elements and symbols off by heart, without a doubt. Um, now, I taught high school chemistry, like senior chemistry, only a couple of years. Uh, most of my science teaching career was teaching physics. Um, and so I used to be very familiar with a lot of this. Uh, now, oh, it's a little bit uh, rusty, and so maybe we can have a little bit of a competition um, with finding some of these elements. Now, I'm going to get a, a red pencil, and so should you, because we're going to find some different metals, and we're going to shade them red. So, the first metal we're going to have a look for is magnesium. Magnesium symbol, Mg, and that's an easy one to find. For me, it's the magnesium there. That's a silvery metal quite relative reactive. And so because I know it's a fairly reactive metal, that would also mean that the calcium, the strontium and the barium are also reactive metals. That's the power of this periodic table. Zinc, uh, Zn, where are you Zn? Over here, zinc is a metal used to coat iron to stop it from corroding. When you he he hear of something called galvanized iron, that's because zinc is, uh, covering that iron to um, prevent rusting. A very, very important form of what's called galvanic protection. Uh, uranium. Now, you might not associate uranium as being a metal, but it's a very, very dense metal. And one of the isotopes can actually be split uh, via fission. And some of the mass is changed into energy according to E equals MC squared. And so uranium is used in the atomic bomb and also in atomic or nuclear power stations. So uranium. Now, interestingly, uranium is actually in this group. Here we've got what's called the lanthanides, which is that row, and the actinides, and that's row. And really, they should be up here. But if we actually put them in their correct place, this periodic table will be like twice as wide. And so we sort of like cut out a section and then stick it below. Okay, just for your 
for your heads up. Uh, Mercury, HG, HG, very, very interesting um, element. Where are you, Mr. HG? Um, there's a HF, HG, there we go. Mercury is one of two elements that are liquid at room temperature. Yes, Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Uh, the other element that's liquid at room temperature is bromine. Um, look, Mercury's very fascinating. Uh, very dense, silvery, liquid metal. It's, you could call it, some people call it quicksilver. And apparently, some of the Egyptian pharaohs used to have a bath in Mercury where they would like, and they'd float on top of the Mercury. You could sort of push your hand a little bit under it, but very, very dense and you'd float on the top. It's also very toxic. Um, so that was a big problem as well. Uh, copper, very important to our modern society, copper, because copper is an excellent conductor of electricity. Now, most, all metals are conductors of electricity, and the copper is particularly good. So is gold, by the way. Uh, lead, lead, uh, where's lead? PB, plumbum. Now, lead is a soft, very soft, malleable metal uh, quite dense, used to make sinkers if you go fishing, uh, lead flashing for houses, but they actually used to, in the early days, in the Roman days, made um, water pipes from lead. And so if you work with those water pipes because they were made from lead and the, and the word for lead was plumbum or plumum, plumbers, plumbers, um, that's why they're called plumbers because uh, lead used to be water pipes. So PB, where's PB? It is not personal best, okay? It is not personal best. It is PB stands for, have you found it? You've probably found it while I've been chatting away here. Um, come on, where are you? Ah, here we go, down here, PB, lead. Very important. Also used in 12 volt car batteries. Uh, lithium, talking about car batteries, lithium is an essential ingredient for car batteries, particularly electric vehicle car batteries, uh, and hoverboard batteries, and skate, you know, electric skateboard batteries, and electric bikes, and all your all your rechargeable batteries now are, uh, use a lot of lithium. Uh, lithium and copper, very important to our society. Silver, AG, AG, silver. And that's actually pretty close to where gold is. So we'll be coming to gold later on. Fe, ferrous, ferrous, uh, iron. So let's find iron. Where is our Fe? Here it is here. Iron's very important to our modern society as well. Australia is the world's largest exporter of iron ore. Um, and most of it goes to China to be made into iron. You use um, carbon and you use calcium carbonate and iron, uh, iron oxide uh, to make steel. Very important uh, material. Uh, all our, uh, well, what's made from steel? So much is made from steel. All your train rails, your train wheels, your train bodies, uh, lots of parts in cars. Um, but all your white goods, your fridges, your microwaves, your ovens, all, all contain lots of iron. Iron's hugely important to our society, and Australia is blessed to have so much uh, of it. Vanadium, it's a fairly rare metal, but it's added to with chromium to iron to make stainless steel. Gold, oh, very dense, very precious. The reason, it, the reason it's very precious is because there's not a lot of gold in, in this world. Uh, and it also doesn't corrode. So you actually find gold as the elemental form. Most of these elements, you don't actually find them in, in existence as just by themselves. You'll, you might find some copper in some seams. Um, you might find some silver. Obviously, you can breathe in oxygen um, and some nitrogen. You'll find sulfur near volcanoes. Uh, but almost everything else, all the others are, you'll find them reacted uh, with other elements to form compounds. So sodium, you'll never find a lump of sodium by itself, because if you did, if it rained, it would explode. But you do find it with sodium chlorine, okay, sodium chloride. Uh, what else do we have? Aluminium, AL, 
over here, very important uh, metal to our modern day society. All our window frames, a lot of our plane fuselages, um, car parts are made from this very lightweight metal. Calcium, CA, here we go. You know that's good for your bones. Our bones are hard on the outside and soft on the inside. That's because the calcium salts form hard, um, the hard structure. And chromium, CR, over here near the vanadium, that's used for stainless steel. And titanium, oh yes, titanium is a, also a very expensive metal. It's very strong, very lightweight, and so very good for replacing body parts like uh, artificial hips. So here we go. Notice though that all these metals that I've said are all on the left. Okay, all the metals are on the left. Now I'm going to get a different colour pen, uh, pencil, and I'm going to get um, blue, blue. And let's highlight some of the blue non-metals. Okay, so we've got oxygen, O, <laughs> very important to our to, to survival. You know, we breathe oxygen. Carbon, oh, carbon is a fascinating element. I'm going to find out that. In fact, there used to be two branches of chemistry, inorganic and organic. And organic chemistry was all based around carbon. Carbon itself is actually probably responsible for half of the chemistry that we do. Because carbon, it's got a very interesting electronic structure where it can go either way, basically. But we're, we'll learn about that another time. Uh, helium. Helium is found at the top of... Um, uh, gas gas um, deposits and the amount of helium in the world is actually depleting so it's maybe not a great idea to use it in party balloons uh, it's used for a lot of research to actually get cold temperatures so helium a non-reactive gas it's definitely a non-metal nitrogen makes up 77 percent of our um, atmosphere uh, combines with hydrogen to form ammonia, and that's very important for fertilizers. So plants need nitrogen uh, to grow well, often, and it's, it's, it's locked up in fertilizers. Uh, sulfur, it's a yellow, yellow um, solid, often found with um, near volcanoes underground. It's easy to melt it uh, and pump it around as a molten um, solution. Uh, or molten uh, liquid, and you produce uh, sulfur dioxide and you can react that with water to form sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid is the most important industrial chemical. And in fact, uh, the, the wealth of a society is basically determined by how much sulfuric acid that, that society uses, just out of interest. <laughs> All right, um, neon your neon signs. Neon is a non-metal. It's also a, uh, what we call a noble, a noble gas. And all the noble gases are here. They're noble because they're like kings and queens. They don't, um, they don't like interact with any of these lesser beings. Um, yeah, they don't form chemical compounds with anything else. They're, they're they are standalone elements. Um, what else have we got? Uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen in this case is found on this periodic table is found top left. Occasionally you'll find hydrogen here and occasionally you'll even find hydrogen over there somewhere, but on this one it's here. Hydrogen is the lightest element. It's the simplest element. Um, there we go. Phosphorus, P, uh, over here. So apart from hydrogen, we're, we're seeing that all the blue, all the non-metals are over here to the right, agree? Krypton. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like Superman, doesn't it? Krypton, kryptonite, um, chlorine, Cl, very important element, very important element. Um, yes, it is made uh, used to make chlorine uh, for your pool, but chlorine from your pool, the liquid is not this chlorine. This chlorine is chlorine gas, but it is it is in pool chlorine. Um, yeah, iodine over here. Iodine, very interesting also. It's a solid, it's a solid non-metal that uh, if you heat it up, turns into a purple gas by sublimation. And then xenon, xenon is here, Xe. 
So what are we noticing about the non-metals apart from hydrogen? They're all over here. And then but last but not least, I want least I want you to actually um, highlight or colour in the semi-metals. They've got some metallic properties and some non-metallic properties, and those properties are also dependent on um, like if they're heated and that sort of stuff. So what have we got? Silicon over here. And I'm going to do it nice and firm. Silicon. What else do we have? Uh, tellurium. Uh, T. That will be T somewhere, won't it? And it's got to be around here. I know that I'm not even going to move my pencil very far because I know I know where they're going to be. Germanium is here. Germanium is here. Uh, polonium here. Um, boron. It's not boron. That was lame. Sorry. Um, arsenic. It's a deadly poison. But basically, these are forming a line called the zint. Well, they're not the zinter line. The zinter line is the line that goes between the semi-metals and the metals. Uh, so we've got this line of non-metals, not non-metals, um, semi-metals. Everything on the left is metals, including the lanthanides and the actinides. Everything on the left is the metals. Then the semi-metals are here, and then the non-metals are on the right. So there we go. Periodic table. We've started learning about it, which is a fantastic thing. Now, properties of metals. I have mentioned um, conductivity of metals quite a few times, and Tiny Science Lab actually produces this fantastic, here we go, this is a little bit of a plug, right? Um, fantastic electricity set that comes with 10 lessons and videos like this one. And you will, if you do that course, you will investigate the reactivity of metals. Um, this is a clip circuit type equipment, but I've actually invented myself the, well, invented, I've produced the ammeter and the voltmeter to go into this set and also um, a, a make your own switch, and make your own loudspeaker, and make your own motor. And anyway, you can do seven to 10 science and 11 and 12 physics with this set. Um, very, very good. So this is our Tiny Science Lab electricity set. Boom. So properties of metals, um, good conductors of electricity, good conductors of heat, malleable, that means you can hit them into a sheet. Ductile, you can draw them into a wire. Um, what else? Shiny when freshly cut. They're generally hard. They generally got, have got some like flexibility. Very important um, materials for our society. Non-metals, you might go the other way. Don't conduct electricity. Only if you're cut, unless you're carbon and you're in the, the form of graphite. So for example, here we go, I've got some here. This, oh, these are carbon rods, okay, in the form of graphite, and they will conduct electricity. So they're the only non-metal that conducts electricity. Uh, well, they're not very good conductors of heat. So for example, for example, uh, if I was to hold these tweezers in the Bunsen burner, it would not take long for it to get very, very hot at here because the metal conducts the electricity. Ha <laughs> the metal conducts the heat, sorry. Uh, but this glass rod, the, the heat is not conducted. The heat is not conducted. So not good conductors of heat. Generally, non-metals are quite brittle if they're in the solid form. So for example, sulfur is actually a very brittle substance, but uh, most of the non-metals are probably actually gases. Okay, they're, they're gases. And then semi-metals, Depending on the conditions, they can have properties of metals and properties of non-metals. So silicon, if you heat it up, actually becomes conductive. It's the same for germanium. So my friends, um, that is the periodic table of the elements. Um, I hope that you've had a, a good learning experience. I know that this is a practical course and I can assure you that um, very, very soon the lessons coming up are going to be very, very hands-on. I'll see you soon. Thank you for joining me today. Bye for now. Hi hey everyone. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at modeling atoms. Okay, now, a very important um, 
thing to have with us is the periodic table because it shows all the different elements and each element is made up of its own unique atom. Now it's probably best just to start with the simplest atom of all, which is the hydrogen atom, okay? Now the uh, symbol for hydrogen is H, and here it is on the periodic table, and it has got atomic number one. Now, atoms are made up of three subatomic particles. Protons, which are positive, electrons, which are negative, and neutrons, which are neutral. Now, I've just made a little bit of a board from, it's actually the outside case of a microwave oven, which I took off, and it's made out of iron, which is great because iron is magnetic. And so I can stick onto it these little magnetic discs um, that are colored and that will be very, very helpful. So hydrogen, Let's model it. I'm going to put one proton right in the center of the atom in what we call the nucleus. And it's got a positive charge. And so I can actually put a little positive on there like this. These are positively charged and the electrons are negatively charged and the neutrons, believe it or not, are neutral. <laughs> neutral. <laughs> so I might call it zero. Now, whizzing around the outside of the nucleus in the electron shells is one electron. So this basically is our hydrogen atom, if you can picture sort of this electron whizzing around so fast that it sort of looks like a sphere. Now, if I want to try and get this to a real scale, um, probably the largest um, sporting arena in Australia is the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And if you can picture a P, a P right, like a little green P, right at the center of the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And in the stands is a fruit fly. And that fruit fly is whizzing around the whole stand so that if you were to stand back, the whole MCG would look like this haze. So in actual fact, most of an atom is actually empty space, believe it or not. Um, it's very mind boggling, absolutely mind boggling. Now, a very, 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 very few, okay, hydrogen atoms have actually got a neutron in there as well. So very, maybe one in a thousand hydrogen atoms have actually got this neutron. Um, and so, what is the atomic weight? Well, the atomic weight is given by the the number at the very, very base under the, the, the name of the um, element. Now it's very difficult to read there, but in actual fact, the atomic, the atomic weight, I should say, for hydrogen is 1.008, um, which is close enough to one, okay? So one electron, one proton, and basically no neutrons. Now let's have a look and model the next atom along, which is helium. So now helium is a noble gas and it's got two protons. Now in fact, I should actually move one from up here to here, two protons. And it's got two electrons, okay? Two protons and two electrons and those electrons are whizzing around. But it's actually got an atomic weight of four. And so where does that atomic weight from come, come from? two protons and two neutrons. There we go. So in the nucleus, it's actually got two protons and two neutrons, which give it an atomic weight of four. You see, the protons and the neutrons are about 2,000 times more massive than an electron. And so the atomic weight of an, of an atom actually comes from the protons and neutrons. Uh, lithium, her heli, <laughs> lithium is number three, atomic number three, and so we can put him there. And I'm going to need another electron because you always have to have the same number of protons as electrons. Now I might just clear out the um, neutrons just to simplify it. I've got, so we're doing lithium here. We've got three protons and three electrons. Now you might want me to put it there, but in actual fact, uh, there's a shell, there's an electron shell, 
And that electron shell is actually now full. So now I have to start a new electron shell. So now I've got three electrons and three protons. But what is the atomic weight? The atomic weight of lithium is actually 6.94, which is very, very close to seven. And so I need to have seven particles in the nucleus. Let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's why it's got an atomic weight of seven. Well, in actual fact, the atomic weight is 6.94. And that's because most lithium atoms have got um, seven nucleons, but some have got six. And so that's why it's a little bit less than seven. But most of them have got seven like that. Okay, let's get rid of these neutrons again. And let's do carbon. Now, carbon is an absolute classic. Um, carbon has got an atomic number of six. So let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, one too many protons. <laughs> so six protons. And so how many electrons do I need? I need six electrons. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, Six, there we go, so I've got six electrons now. How many neutrons do I need? Well, the atomic weight is 12, and so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, so I'll go seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12. So there we go, so a carbon atom has got six protons and six neutrons. Now they're probably, that's probably not the best representation, they're probably more randomly spread, sort of like that. That's probably a better representation. Um, remember, this is only a model, and this is actually showing that the nucleus is quite large compared to the overall soul size of the atom. But don't forget that that is this is totally out of proportion. I, I'd need I'd need a piece of metal this big, you know, as big as you know a house to to show this properly. With these, with these size um, nucleons. So uh, what's the atomic weight? Um, 12, and so I've got 12 uh, nucleons there. Let's go to oxygen, okay? Oxygen, if I go to my periodic table here, oxygen has got an atomic number of, what have we got? Eight. So let's put in two more um, protons, there we go. And I need two more electrons. So that now I've got six protons and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. You always have the same have the same number of protons as electrons. Um, that's just what makes up atoms. And if you add up the positive charge, that's the same as the negative charge. So you've got eight plus and eight minus. That actually makes the neutral the the atom neutrally charged and all atoms are neutrally charged. Now have I got the number of proton, uh, neutrons right? No, because oxygen has got a um, atomic weight of 16 and so I need 16 particles. And at the moment I've got eight plus six is 14 so I need two more neutrons. There we go. Let's put two more neutrons in. Beautiful. And then the last one we're going to model is Sodium. Now, sodium has got an atomic number of, let's find it, 11. So I need to have 11 protons and I need 11 electrons. But, whoa, this outer shell is now full. This outer shell is now full. So I actually have to start a, start a new shell, which I'll pop here. So we've actually got an electron in the outer shell. Now, I'll give you a hint. All the metals have got one or two electrons in the outer shell, or one, two, three electrons in the outer shell. That's actually what gives it metals their, their, their properties of being a good conductor. You know, conducting is conducting electricity. Electricity is electrons, yeah? And so these outermost electrons in it, the outer shell are the electrons which carry the electricity. Non-metals, right, non-metals have normally got a full outer shell or a little bit short of a full outer shell. They actually don't have any electrons to spare. So little bits of hints for our learning of, um, our learning of um, 
some chemistry later on. Uh, oh, and I forgot to add the extra uh, neutrons required for sodium. So look, this would be a great thing to do with um, plasticine where you're in a, a, maybe a dinner plate and you actually build up, you could actually make each atom up to whatever you like, probably up to the number 20 is great. And it goes two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the next shell, eight electrons in the shell after that. Um, and you can do further research. It gets a bit more complicated after number 20. Um, but if you can do the first 20, that'd be really, really good. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson on modeling atoms and you should definitely do some modeling yourself. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in this lesson, we're going to be looking at something called flame tests. Now flame tests are a way to identify if a particular element is contained in a certain sample. Now we're going to do this what's called qualitatively as opposed to quantitatively. When you do something quantitatively, you're, you're actually taking numerical measurements. We're just going to be talking about, you know, a yellow or a green or a blue, which I guess in some ways, because wavelengths have got their own values, um, you could convert to quantities, but <laughs> enough of that. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, we'll need a Bunsen burner. Now, probably the best way to probably do this is a little bit different than normal because I probably want to hold the flame at an angle like so, so that when I heat my sample, if any bits and pieces fall off it, they fall down, but not into the Bunsen burner. You see, this is a very uh, precision, precision piece of equipment. And if you get any bits or pieces in, in that Bunsen burner, uh, it won't work, probably won't work at all. Uh, you'll need to clean it with water. Now, if you want to clean it, it's probably uh, have a glass of water, turn the gas on and hold it, hold and bubble the water, bubble the water with the gas to try and dislodge anything that's lodged in this head here. Now, in actual fact, you can actually screw off this um this top bit and you know clean it out with a jet of air but if there's anything that's blocking it uh, it won't work now always tighten it on nice and tight uh, we're going to need a heat proof mat a beaker of water beaker of water for this and let's squirt this full some matches some matches and we're going to start with some copper sulfate. So I'll get out my watch glass and I'm just going to put a little bit of copper sulfate onto the watch glass, just a little sprinkle. You don't need much for flame tests. And to be safe, I will put on my safety glasses. Now warning, warning, if you're going to use your Bunsen burner out of the um, hole, You've got to be very careful that you don't bump it over, okay? Because if you do bump it over, the flame might point in different directions. So I might loosely, mm, what's a, what's, if, as long as I don't bump it, it should be fine, okay? Maybe you could put it in a glass or something like that uh, so that it can't fall over. That wouldn't be a bad safety idea actually hold it so it can't tip over. Let's go get something to hold it so it won't let fall over. Okay, I've just found a, a jug and if I pop that there, then I, if it does fall over, it's not going to fall too far. And I think I'll light it up straight away. Rotate. Excellent. So let's pop that there and remember that that flame is quite hot and quite dangerous. Now I've got this burnt match. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop it in some water, give it a shake and then hold the burnt match in the fire. Now there is a little bit of a, there's an orange glow. I'm just seeing what, what the colour looks like when I've got nothing on the match. Okay, uh, I guess this 
could be like what, what we'd call a control in science. It does glow a little bit. There's an orange glow there. There is an orange glow. A faint red glow, but not much of a glow. Now, I've wet it, I've wet the match, and I'm going to put that little bit of a match into the copper sulfate. Just like that. And let's see what happens when I heat that. I can definitely see a green look. That's wonderful. Oh, wow. There is a very bright, clear green flame. That's fantastic. I'm actually getting some globules forming on the um, on the match. I bet those globules are actually copper. I bet I'm actually forming some copper metal there. Wonderful. So there is a greeny, and I can actually repeat that with a bit more. I've sort of wrecked my match though. It's definitely a green flame with a slight touch of blue. No, I can't use that match again. I've just turned my Bunsen burner off. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? To keep it 100% safe, I'm only going to have it burning when I'm holding it. That, that is the way to keep it safe. All right. No, no problems developing safety techniques as you proceed along. Um, what I do, I need to dry, I need to get dispose of the copper sulfate. Because it's such a small amount, it can go in the bin. Um... And so I might just get my waste material here and I'll need some, I'll just get a little cloth and there we go, I've wiped, wiped off the copper sulfate, perfect. What's the next chemical we're going to do? Sodium carbonate decahydrate. Now, just need it. This one, this one might be a bit hard to pick up with the, with the um, with the match. My crystals are actually quite big. Now you might need, you might need to dig in there a little bit with your tweezers. Okay, so I've just got a few crystals there. Instead of using a match this time, I don't think I can pick those up with a match. I'm actually going to pick pick a crystal up with the tweezers. That's what I'm going to do. So. I'm going to light my Bunsen burner. Now, notice I can actually just hold it with my left hand and twist the top. There we go. Blow that match out. Get a crystal of sodium carbonate decohydrate and hold it in the flame. Wow! See how I'm holding it a long way away from my flame? I really don't want to get any chemicals it's sort of spraying. That's why that colour is going all the way back to the flame. Okay. It's a very bright yellow flame. So the copper sulphate, it, uh, it had a flame like a green flame. And the sodium carbonate decahydrate is definitely a yellow, a yellow flame. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> now, with my... Um, beaker that's to wash that's to wash my um, tweezers so that they don't become contaminated I can even give them a wipe and I can uh, give them a clean like that and in actual fact in some ways I've made a little bit of a mistake and I can correct that mistake because I don't know if you picked up on it or not but the mistake I made was I didn't actually put the empty tweezers in the flame. I didn't do a control test for the empty tweezers. And as you can see, really there's not a much color change when I heat the tweezers. A little bit of orange. That could be from contamination. Or, no, yeah, it probably was. There was a little tiny bit of sodium carbonate decohydrate there. Good, okay. And <laughs> sizzle will keep that nice and cool. What's our next chemical? Manganese dioxide. Manganese dioxide. Manganese dioxide. All right. Now, the manganese dioxide is going to be used um, at a later stage as the catalyst to split hydrogen peroxide into its 
um, hydrogen are into water and oxygen. Uh, but not this lesson. There we go. Just, again, a little tiny sprinkle. You don't need much. Now, I can't pick that up with the, um, with the tweezers, and so I'm going to use a match. Now, get my match. There we go. Let's pop it in. I have to sort of prepare this match. I have to sort of burn it to get rid of, to make sure it's not glowing too much yellow. Now, pick up my manganese dioxide on the match and let's see if we get a colour. Uh, I'm seeing a, a darker orange glow. I think it's fair to say that I'm seeing a bit of a darker orange glow. So I'll record that as a darker orange glow. Nice, nice. Pop that away. Again, you can just um, dispose of that chemical down the sink or into the bin. It's not particularly toxic. And our next one is the copper, copper oxide. Now, what's your inference? What's your inference? What colour do you, or th well, not your inference, sorry. Well, yes, I guess it is an inference, but what's your prediction for what the colour will be? Now, if you look at your table, you'll see that the copper sulfate went green. So my prediction is that it, the flame will go green. And the reason for that prediction is based on the copper sulfate test. So let's get some copper oxide and let's see what color we go. Well, it's certainly not. It's certainly not as green, but I can see the edges of the flame. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get a nice big amount. I can see a green there. I can. I can see a green. Can you see the green there? You're probably saying mm, not much. Not much. Okay. I'm going to tw try my tweezers. I've wet my tweezers. It's not as intense, that's for sure, but the green is definitely there just on the edges of the flame. 100% there is a green present. So I'll put a slight green. Whoa. Whoa, that's, that's going to be quite contaminated. <laughs> so let's clean this one out. Now you're going to do table salt, sodium chloride. Now there's no table salt in your sets, so you... The reason I didn't include um, table salt in your sets is that table salt's in every kitchen, basically. So why send out something that you already had, basically? Put the, some sodium chloride. What's your prediction? What's your prediction? Hmm, I look at my table. I see a sodium carbonate. That was yellow. So my prediction. My prediction is yellow. Now, I have contaminated my uh, beaker, so I'm going to get a new beaker of water to avoid cross-contamination. Okay, cross-contamination. Pop him in, pick up some sodium chloride. I think I've got some sodium chloride. Oh, yes, a very bright yellow indeed. Super, super bright. Look at that. That's, that's clearly yellow. And I know that, that for flame tests, when you've got sodium, <laughs> it, it glows very, very brightly yellow. Okay, 100%. If I pick up a bit more. Salt, there we go on the tweezers. You can actually see that bright. Look at that, that's wonderful. Woo, excellent. And then the final one that I've got is um, 
And the final one that I've got is some sugar. And let's see what sugar is. Now, sugar has got the formula C6H12O6, so carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And um, oh, how am I going to get this out? I should be using a spoon or something so I don't contaminate my sugar pot. I'm just going to use the end of my tweezers. Don't tell anybody. Okay, all right. There we go. Always avoid contamination, particularly when you've got food, food um, things in the science laboratory. And sugar. Pick up some sugar. Just sort of melts, it's sort of melting. So just be careful with that hot melted sugar. That's actually toffee, that's carbonizing now. Whoa, uh-oh, <laughs> it's turning, it's getting rid of the hydrogen and the oxygen in the form of water and it's leaving carbon behind. And we'll have to clean that up later. Uh, no real distinct uh, color from the sugar. So anyway, there we have it. If you have a fertilizer that you buy from the, um, or let's say it's a potting mix or something that you buy from the hardware and you test the sample and you see a very bright yellow glow, you probably know that there's some sodium in there. Uh, if you get a, some a soil sample, um, particularly from your say, gold mine and you hold it, you probably get a green due to the copper. So flame tests can help scientists <coughs> um, determine what elements are present in different samples. Okay, I hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson, that you're staying safe, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're looking at pure substances and mixtures. Now another word for mixture might be an impure substance, I guess. Now don't forget that matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. So let me, let's just pull out a few things out of our, our set. I've got a glass jar of um, iron powder, um, sand and sodium chloride. What do you think this is? Do you think this is a pure substance or a mixture? Well, it'd be a mixture, of course. It's a mixture of iron powder, sand and sodium chloride, which is salt. And you can see it looks, you know, there's different colours throughout, there's the white from the salt crystals, there's the darker iron, there's the brownish sand. It's a mixture. You can actually use physical techniques such as magnetic separation, such as uh, dissolving and filtering, uh, evaporation to actually separate the components uh, into its, or the mixture into its constituent components. So. Pure substances, well here's a pure substance, this is aluminium, and this little pan is made up of aluminium atoms. Now, I can melt this down, um, and I can get a small lump of aluminium, but if I was to heat it up and actually turn it into a liquid and boil it, uh, all the aluminium atoms would head off, and <laughs> they wouldn't turn into other types of uh, atoms, or wouldn't be able to separate it at all, and so, Pure substances, such as elements and, well, here's a compound, sodium chloride, um, they can't be separated by physical means. So, pure substances um, cannot be separated by physical means. And when I say physical means, I've mentioned a few, but we can talk about crystallization, chromatography, distillation, evaporation, uh, decanting. Um, they are all what we call physical means. Compounds, well, here's a compound. Copper sulfate is a compound made up of copper, sulfur, and oxygen. Uh, and those atoms have chemically bound together. They're bound together, they're, they're sharing electrons, they're giving electrons uh, away and receiving electrons um, according to their electronic needs, I guess you could say. And this copper sulfate, if it, if it is pure copper sulfate, and I think it it is, it's probably like 99.9% .9 copper sulfate. 
Wherever I went in the world and I asked for copper sulfate, I would get CuSO4. Uh, wherever I went in the world and I asked for copper oxide, CuO, um, if I asked for copper oxide, I'd get CuO, which is this black powder. But if I went somewhere in the world and I said, can I have a mixture of sand, salt, and iron filings, I'd get all sorts of different combinations and percentages and types of sand and types of, you know, um, size of the iron particles and that sort of stuff. So anyway, let's have a look at a few examples um, to get a, a better picture of um, what uh, pure substances are. And pure substances can be broken down into elements and compounds. Now, elements are made up of the one type of atom and are found on the periodic table. I already pulled out the aluminium. already pulled out the aluminium. Aluminium is uh, made up of aluminium, at aluminium atoms. Here's a steel pan, which is basically made up of iron. There's a little bit of carbon in there, but let's forget about that for now. <laughs> um, so I've got an iron pan made up of iron atoms. I've got a gold ring, oh, my wedding band, and it's made up of gold atoms. These are these are all metals. Do I have anything in my set that is, oh, you know what? I've got some matches here, and that red, it's not pure phosphorus, but there is phosphorus in there. So let's just pretend that that red is pure soft phosphorus, just for just for today's lesson. Don't tell anybody, okay? Um, sulfur, I don't have any sulfur. Um, is there anything that's elemental in here made up of the one type of atom? Um, maybe, no, this is stainless steel. Really, it's a, it's a mixture. So I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Oh, but I think, I think our little spoons are coated in tin. Okay, I think our spoons are coated with tin. And you know what? Um, I could make pure oxygen by separating the air into oxygen. Uh, actually, I can't separate the air into the oxygen. Uh, you'd need refrigeration techniques to do that. But I could separate hydrogen peroxide into um, water and oxygen, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so elements are made up of metals. Um, non-metals, and I've actually I've already mentioned a few non-metals. I've mentioned red phosphorus. Did I mention sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen? Um, this is where the periodic table comes becomes very handy. Uh, remember at we, our periodic table where you shaded things uh, on this side red, they're the metals. The yellow ones are the metalloids and the um, blue ones are the non-metals. So that makes it very easy to complete a table with metals. All you have to do is list any of these um, ones on this side, they're metals. The non-metals are on the right hand side of these yellow ones. The um, metalloids or semi-metals, uh, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, tellurium, polonium, um, they're metalloids. And then interestingly, on this far right-hand column, okay, group eight we shall call it, uh, we've got helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and OG. Well, what is OG? How's your eyesight? Oh, better than my eyesight, I hope. I wonder whether you can tell me what OG is. Um, but all these are called the noble gases, and they're noble because they've all got complete um, outer electron shells, okay? Their electron shells, their outer shell is full, and so they actually don't need to react with any other elements to complete a full outer shell. And that, my friends, is the secret to chemistry, and that is for elements to get a complete outer shell of electrons by sharing electrons, uh, or sharing electrons, taking electrons, giving electrons to other um, entities, so to speak. Um, compounds, yeah, well, we've got quite a few compounds. Copper sulfate is a compound that I've mentioned. Um, copper oxide is a, a compound that I've mentioned. Copper oxide, uh, that's a mixture, the sand, sodium chloride and iron powder, but I've got um, the sodium carbonate decahydrate, that's a compound. The, oh, <gasps> magnesium. <laughs> forgot about magnesium. Magnesium is an element. Oops, sorry. Over in the elements, it's a metal. Never mind. Shh. Okay, and uh, manganese dioxide. Uh, I've also got some sodium chloride is a compound, and I've got some sugar uh, in a pot, which is a compound. Very straightforward. 
um, compounds have got chemical formulas and those formulas are fixed. Compound is basically uh, two or more elements that combine together chemically to form a, well, a, a pure substance that can't be separated by a physical means. Whew. Now, talking about um, mixtures, let's, let's talk a bit about mixtures. So if I get a beaker out and some water, well, water is a compound, H2O, you'd call that a pure substance. But what about if I was to add to it some copper sulfate? Okay, so I sprinkle in some copper sulfate. Now I've got a mixture. This is a mixture that can be separated into, uh, into water and copper sulfate via evaporation. But notice that the copper sulfate is down the very, very bottom. Now, this is what we'd call a heterogeneous mixture. A heterogeneous mixture is that the, the mixture is not um, the same throughout. The mixture is not uniform throughout. I've got copper sulfate down the bottom and I've got water up the top. So to make it homogenous, to make it homogenous, the only way that I can do that is to dissolve, okay, dissolve the copper sulfate so that I don't have any crystals in the bottom and so that the tiny little, um, well, when copper sulfate dissolves, it actually breaks down uh, into copper ions and sulfate ions. And if they're mixed evenly throughout the entire, if they're mixed evenly throughout the entire solution, then I've actually got what we call a homogenous, a homogenous solution. So a, hom a homogenous solution or a homogenous mixture is one where the, um, the it's got uniform it's got a uniform consistency throughout so let's try that again because that was quite fun um let's go with i'll ask you a question this is water into a beaker what do we have here did you say compound you'd be wrong <laughs> it's a beaker and a compound so it's a mixture sorry just just tricking you there okay all right Let's just talk about the liquid inside the beaker and not confuse things. Yes, the liquid is a compound. I'm going to add a drop of food coloring and yay, I've discovered blue food coloring finally. Um, now we've got a mixture, okay? Then the, the blue food coloring is not chemically combined to the water. It's not forming a new substance. Um, I've got the two substances that can be separated by physical means, particularly evaporation. But would you call this homogenous or heterogeneous? I'd call this heterogeneous because the uniform is the, the the consistency is not uniform. It's not the same throughout. I can see different thicknesses, different layers, all that sort of thing. But if I give it a stir and mix it evenly, yay! I do have now a homogeneous mixture. Okay, I've got a homogeneous mixture. So what about okay? Oh, while we're at it, what about if I get some sodium chloride? There we go, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is a compound. And if I add to it some, put my finger in there. <laughs> Don't put your finger in the sugar. If I add to it some sugar, sugar is a compound, like so. But do I have, oh, it's a bit sticky that sugar. It must have some water in it, so it's not a pure compound at all. But anyway, if I give this a mix now, Oh, that's a bit of a telltale sign, isn't it? If I give it a mix, then all of a sudden I've got a mixture. I've got a mixture of salt and sugar. Now, this would not be easy to separate into the salt crystals and the sugar crystals at all. Now, I've, there's some lumps in here. Now, because there's some lumps of sugar in here, would that make this a homogenous or a heterogeneous mixture? Heterogeneous, of course. Okay, when the when the consistency uh, is not consistent, then it's heterogeneous. If I was to put it through the blender and mix it all up perfectly so that it was absolutely evenly mixed throughout, then it'd be homogeneous. Now, how could I ever separate? Could I the sugar from the salt? Could I use like a, a microscope and little tweezers and pull out? That might do it. Uh, there is a more complicated way of doing it, and that is where you dissolve it and then you heat it and you uh, one of the substances crystallizes before the other substance and then you do some filtration. Complex and messy and it would take a number of those re repetitions to, to get a pure 
um, substance. And every time you do a repetition like that, it's it's expensive, and that's why copper sulfate. When I said it's ninety nine point nine percent, they they get it to that point because that's good enough. If you want it, if you want pure one hundred percent copper sulfate, then you'd have to do some more purification, and that would add to the cost of it. So, yeah. Anyway, that is our lesson on pure substances and mixtures. You can make some of these yourself to explore them and to think about them. A very important uh, and interesting thing to do. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in today's lesson we're going to be doing an experiment uh, to investigate a reversible change. And the experiment will be, what dissolves faster, um, sugar or salt? Now, this experiment, it's quite straightforward, but it's designed to develop our scientific skills how to design a fair experiment, how to follow the scientific method, how to analyze our results, do a graph and draw a conclusion. So we're going to need, um, or you're going to need some sugar and some salt. Um, sugar, salt, don't need a lot. Um, need uh, some water, because that's going to be the solvent. Need a little beaker, a stirring rod, and some water, I've got the water. I also need a stopwatch to record our time. I'm just using my um, iPhone, that's perfectly fine. And we'll also need the little spoon and somewhere to record our results. So how about we get 10 mil of water. Now, when I, when I design an experiment, I, used, I like to use the lotus, um, the lotus flower. At the center of the flower, is the independent variable. And the independent variable is what we're going to change. So the question is, our aim is, what dissolves faster, sugar or salt? And so the independent variable, what we're going to change is sugar and salt. The dependent variable is going to be time, the time to dissolve. And you need to be able to measure the, the time to dissolve. Now around the outside of the, the um, center of the flower are the petals. And the petals contain all the, the variables that we're going to keep the same. So every time uh, we do a trial, we're going to use the same 10 mil beaker. We're going to use the same water, well, the same fresh water from the, um, from the measuring cylinder. So we need to get exactly 10 millimeters and I need to make sure I'm at the right height uh, to avoid parallax error. There we go, perfect. That's 10 millilitres of water. Um, what else are we going to need to keep the same? Um, so the amount of sugar or salt added each time. So we'll do a, a level spoon. Uh, the amount of liquid is 10 mil. The type of liquid is water. The temperature of the water, well, I'm going to stay in this room using that bottle. So I could record the temperature, but I don't, re yeah, I probably should. We should record the temperature, okay? That would be a helpful thing just to record um, the temperature of the water. And it's just, it's 18 and a half degrees. That's the temperature of the water. Um, what else? The rate of stirring now, this is the single most important factor to um, control. It is very difficult to control the rate of stirring. Um, so I'm just going to do a practice. That's the, the rate I want. I don't even know how to, I could count them, one and two and three. I can't even count because it's dictated. But I think I can just do that speed at a, actually I probably want to do a slightly faster speed. I probably just want to get a little bit of a swirl happening in that water. Just like that, that would be a good speed. So, see if you can do that speed with me. And another decision is to decide when it's fully dissolved. Um, that's There is a little bit of a decision to be had there. Okay, so we're going to start with one spoon of sugar. One spoon of sugar. So I'll get a spoon and I need to make sure it's a level spoon. So I might just drag the glass tube over it. So I've got a glass, one spoon, and I need to get my stopwatch. And here we go. 
stopwatch reset and a little bit awkward because I'd like to get my stirring right there and are we ready set go and so now I am stirring at a constant rate stir stir I'm not trying to be a, I'm not trying to race I'm just trying to go at a constant speed okay sometimes I move the stirring rod just into the middle so that I can sort of like um, disperse the crystals because sometimes they end up sort of going right into the center and not being part of the okay got a few crystals left I might just lift it up so that I can see it now this is where you've got to make a decision is it absolutely everything that's dissolved or just like the absolute majority? I think I'm going to go with the absolute majority. So I'm going to call that 50 seconds. Okay, 50 seconds and stop. So I've got a results table here and spoon number one, the time to dissolve for the sugar was 54 seconds, 54 seconds. Now I could tip that out and I could tip that out and put 10 ml of water in it and then do salt and get a good, um, what's the word, uh, probably get enough information or data to answer the question. But look, to be honest, I'm actually interested in what happens. I'm, I'm a little bit more interested. I wanna, I'd like to find out what happens if the water gets a little bit sweeter. So I'm actually going to keep this um, sugar the same and I'm going to get another spoon I guess you'd say that this is excess this is excess to the experiment okay so pour that in press start and stir again so stirring notice I'm trying to keep the same speed occasionally I stir into the middle just to, to sort of dislodge any crystals that have found their way into the middle, like the, the vortex action. The vortex action tends to drag them into the middle. Now I'm going to lift this up. Now, my prediction is that this would take a little bit longer for the sugar to dissolve. That's my prediction, but my predictions are sometimes wrong. In this, in this case, I'm, I'm having a little look at the time and I'm looking at here and I'm thinking, you know what? This is pretty close to being dissolved. When should I call it? I'm going to call it now, 48 seconds. Okay, now that's a bit surprising. That's a little bit surprising. I would have thought the time would be longer because there's a limit to how much, there's a limit to how much um, sugar can be dissolved into water. So I found that a little bit interesting, uh, but I'm going to do it again, okay? Tip, 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 and tip that in, start, and off we go. This is now my third spoon of sugar. Again, I'd like to try and keep the um, stirring action the same. And if I was to make this a really fair experiment, I'd probably, number one, I'd probably have to make a motorized stirrer. That's the first thing I'd have to do. And I'd probably have to find a better way to decide when it's actually fully dissolved because this is a little bit dodgy, sort of holding it up and looking at it like that. Again, I bring it to the middle and stirring, 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 stirring. And that's pretty close, almost close to being done. I'm having a... All right, and I'm going to call it, stop. I'm going to call that 50 seconds. Huh, well, it's sort of a time in the middle there, isn't it? 50 seconds, there we go, I've got some raw data. And let's just do one more spoon. Now, I do know for a fact that you can dissolve a lot a lot of sugar, <laughs> you can dissolve a lot of sugar in water. I'm talking like, probably like a hundred spoons. So, all right, ready, set, start, and stir. Okay, around we go. Now, given that fact that you can probably stir in a hundred spoons, probably just, you know, 
when you're only looking at four or five or six or seven spoons, that's actually not going to really affect the time of dissolving. Does anyone have any idea why the time maybe has gone down a little bit? Got any ideas? My idea, my idea is that this mechanical energy of the stirring could actually be increasing the temperature of the water just a smidgen. And because I'm increasing the temperature of the water just a smidgen, I know, I know temperature has a dramatic effect on the speed of dissolving. Okay, that's pretty close. And I'm going to call it, that's 52 seconds again. I'm quite surprised. I'm quite surprised at um, how similar the values are. Now, I might just put in the um, thermometer just out of interest. I wonder if there's been any increase of temperature that I can actually measure. Now, do you remember what the um, original temperature was? I think it was 18 and a half degrees. And you know what? That is interesting. That is 20.6 degrees. That's actually a, that's a rise in temperature of 20.8. It's probably a rise in temperature of over two degrees Celsius from that stirring. That's probably why the time went down. Ha! Fascinating. Fascinating. Oh, I do, I do enjoy a good science experiment, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna rinse out the um, sugar and now we're going to change our independent variable to the salt. So now we're going to test for the salt. So, reset and make sure I get the right one. Salt, okay, yep. Oh, this one's, the salt is a bit more powdery. I'm um, not powdery, like more crystal. Yeah, it's sort of a bit wart. Mm, I'm not too sure, but anyway. Uh, it doesn't look exactly the same. Tip that in, press start, and around we go. Stirring at the same rate. Stir, 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 stir. stir. Go to the middle, stir, 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 stir. Go to the middle, stir, 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 stir. Go to the middle, stir, stir. Whoa, hang on. Hello. I think, I, th I think this might be done. 22 seconds. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to call it 22 seconds. Wow! That salt dissolved a lot quicker. 22 seconds. Okay, let's do a second spoon. Stop, reset. Again, I'm on a level spoon. Trying to get the same amount. Now, it's the same volume, but I don't know whether it's the same mass or not. Oop, oop, oop. Okay, stirring, stirring. Now, the, the water is going like a more of a translucent, slightly milky from this salt. That's interesting. Oop, stir to the middle, stirring, stirring, stirring. Look, that's fairly close, actually. I'm going to actually call it, I'm going to call it at 22 seconds. That's the same time. Ha! There you go, 22 seconds. And let's go again. How are you going? Are your values similar? I'm, I'm guessing that they're similar, but don't forget, there's different types of how salt is actually... Um, Oh, that's interesting. There was some salt left in my spoon. Oh, I think I've just made this an unfair experiment. I don't know whether all the salt went into the previous one. I think, I think the salt I'm using is not fantastic. I think it's a little bit like clumpy. There's a bit too much moisture in it. Um, there we go. Well, that's something I can talk about. That's something I can talk about or we can talk about in our discussion okay or if there's any improvements okay yeah that tipped all out so that's good okay stirring 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 beautiful Woo! okay we'll get there stirring stirring to the middle I suspect this one's taking a little bit longer, probably because there's a bit more salt in it this time. <laughs> okay, that's it. 
28 seconds. Okay, well, that sort of tells me that maybe the previous spoon number two was maybe invalid because of the fact that I didn't actually put the whole spoon of salt in, and that, that would make a big difference, wouldn't it? I think it would. And make sure that the spoon is dry. That's very important. And let's scrape the top off. Perfect. In it goes, got it all in, press start. And around we go, this is our final one. So hopefully you're not bored, bored to pieces. Hopefully you're doing this yourself, then you're not bored. Then you're learning. You're learning about salt and sugar and dissolving and stirring at a constant rate, controlling variables, independent variables, dependent variables. Okay. 25 seconds, 25 seconds. Fantastic. So, so now I've got some raw data. How about we graph the raw data? So let me set up my graphing board. Okay, all right. So here I've got my new uh, graphing board. Um, I decided not to use white because I found white quite reflective. I actually use my laser cutter to laser those um, lines on. A little bit risky because I'm not 100% sure what this surface is and if it contains any chloride ions it's, then it's not a good surface to laser because um, then it produces chlorine gas which is actually quite destructive to laser cutters. So if in the next two weeks my laser dies then I'll know it's because I cut a poor, a, I made a bad choice with the material to cut. So with the uh, a graph we need to do a title straight away. So dissolving Salt and sugar. All right. Now, what did we change? We changed sugar and salt, and we also changed the number of spoons. So I'm, I'm going to call that spoon one, spoon two, spoon three, spoon four, and we'll call it the spoon number down here, like so. And then the time we'll do on the vertical. Okay, so the time in seconds. And the largest time we had was like 55 seconds. So I might go up, I think I might go up by tens. Okay, so bear with me, I'm going to call that value there zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Spoon number one for the sugar was 54 seconds, so I crawl across to, to number one, and I go up to 54, there's 55, so 54 is about there, and I put a nice little cross. Spoon number two is 48, so let's go there. Spoon number three is 50, that's an easy one to graph because it's right on the line. And spoon number four is 52, so it's a little bit high. Yeah, so about there. Now, to be honest, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking that's probably going to be a fairly straight line of best fit. Now, when you do a line of best fit, it can be a curve. And also, it doesn't have to go through any of the points. I'm actually going to call that my line of best fit for that graph. And I can label that as sugar. So that's my sugar one. Now, how about we do... How about we do the salt one? I'm going to use a different color pen. I'm going to use the red pen. Spoon number one, salt the first value was 22 seconds. The second value, 22 seconds. The third value, 28 seconds. Oh, that was quite a bit higher. And then the next one was 25 seconds. So, hmm, how about if I was to do a line of best fit, I'd probably do something like that. What does this show us? This shows that there is a dramatic difference between the dissolving rate of sugar, which took a lot longer than the dissolving rate of salt. Oh, let me label this, okay. Salt, and so my conclusion from this is that uh, my sugar uh, took longer to dissolve than my salt. 
But is that fair in general? Probably not, because I look at the sugar and the salt and I see that they're different sized crystals. To make this a fair experiment, you'd need salt and sugar crystals of the same size. Now, I'm not too, I'm not 100% sure how to achieve that. Maybe you'd have to go to the shops and buy lots of different sugars and salts and do some grinding and that sort of stuff. Um, my gut feeling is that in general though, salt, salt would be a, a compound that would dissolve faster than the sugar. Um, there is some big chemical differences when you're dissolving salt. When you're dissolving salt, the sodium chloride actually breaks apart into sodium ions and chloride ions. You're actually breaking what we call um, intramolecular molecules, or uh, I guess not. they're not molecules, but they're, um, it's an ionic compound. Whereas sugar, you're actually just bond breaking the bonds between the sugar molecules. And maybe they're longer, to, maybe those bonds are longer, and so, and they're more intertwined somehow, and so maybe that's why it takes a bit longer. Anyway, uh, is it valid? Was it valid, our experiment? Probably not really, but I think our results still ended up to be fairly valid. I'd be interested to find out what other people get. And my conclusion is that the sugar dissolves, uh, or the salt dissolves faster than the sugar. There we go, there's a very interesting uh, scientific experiment exploring a physical or reversible change. Okay, bye for now, I'll see you again soon. Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to be looking at how temperature affects the rate of dissolving. And the word rate means to do with time. So how does changing the temperature affect how quickly something dissolves? So it's an interesting experiment in itself. However, it will help us develop our scientific uh, investigation skills using the scientific method. Uh, so looking at what's the independent variable, the dependent variable, uh, controlling variables, uh, recording results, uh, graphing, uh, looking at a discussion and a conclusion. So let's get into it. What are we going to need? Well, we're going to need some water and particularly we're going to start with some chilled water, so out of the fridge. Now you could do this with um, sugar or salt. I'm actually choosing to do this one with sugar um, because uh, it, it dissolves a little slower than salt uh, and obviously you need your set. So we'll start with a thermometer, um, a beaker, a stirring rod, some scales to uh, measure uh, the weight of the um, salt, that, uh, the sugar that we're dissolving. Uh, a little white plate. I think that will be all for now. We'll get the Bunsen burner out later. So, what are we changing? Okay, we are changing the temperature. So the temperature becomes the independent variable, and that's going to be at the centre of our lotus flower. Um, what is the dependent variable? Well, that depends on the independent variable. So we're looking at the time uh, for the sugar to dissolve. That depends, hopefully, on the temperature. And then everything else needs to be kept the same. So what do we need to keep the same? Well, we need to keep doing it in the same beaker. We need to keep using water, of course, can't change it to oil and then like petrol and methylated spirits. No, we have to just change the temperature. Everything else we need to keep the same in order for it to be a fair experiment. Um, we need to, we're going to do 10 mil of water. Um, the, probably the hardest thing to keep the same will be the rate of stirring, okay? If we don't stir, this would take forever. Like I'm talking, probably an hour to dissolve each time. Now, unless you've got like forever, um, don't stir. But if you're like me and you've got lots of things to do, we're going to stir. Now we have to stir at the same rate. Now that's the hard part. And also we have to decide when the substance is dissolved. Like, do we go like totally 100% or do we like wait for like 99%? Um, so we have to make a decision when everything's dissolved. So firstly, I'm going to pour um, approximately 10 mil of water in. Now, as long as I bring it up to the same line each time, that's okay. It doesn't have to be exactly 10 mil. It just has to be at the same line on the B 
speaker. I need to get, um, I think we're going to try and do half a gram. So let me have a look at what half a gram looks like. I put my plate on, I tear it. Let me get my spoon and let's get half a gram of sugar, shall we? And see what half a gram looks like. A little tiny spoon there. Okay, 0.24. Now water will dissolve a fair bit of sugar, so I think half a gram looks good actually. And 0 0.49, 0 point, not 0.50. Perfect, excellent. So I've got half a gram of sugar, 10 mil of water. I need to record the temperature. I need to record the temperature. So let's put the probe in. And it does take a little bit of time for the temperature to, uh, or for the, for the probe to adjust. And so I've got my results table ready to go. I'm going to be collecting one, two, three, four, five, six results. Uh, the temperature. And this is probably, probably got the 12.3 degrees. I thought it might have been colder than that. It's a bit strange. I mean, that's out of the fridge. No, surely. Surely it's colder than 12 degrees in my fridge. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I think may maybe the beaker has, maybe the beaker has like warmed it up. Um, so I might actually just tip out the water out of the beaker now that the beak is cold and I'm going to put 10 ml of water in again. Whoop, it's a little bit much. All right, so let's pop that back in. I suspect that the, the beak was, the beaker actually warmed up the water when I put it in. So I'm hoping that will go a little bit lower than 12 this time. Yay! Look at that. At the moment, it's on 10.3, and I suspect that's as low as it will go. So there we go, 10.3 degrees. I'm happy with that. So let's write that down so that we don't forget. 10.3. Um, now, when you write the results, um, because I've got the units in the heading, I don't have to write degrees Celsius, degrees Celsius. I can just write the number, okay? And you'll need your stopwatch. So, let me get my stopwatch, and clock, reset, okay, all right, and ready for action, and in it goes, press start, and I have to stir at a constant rate, okay, round, round, round. How do you decide what the constant rate is going to be? I like to, just to see that I've got a bit of a swirl happening, right? Um, a little tiny bit of a vortex. I can see it like lifting up a little bit in the middle. And that's for me a good constant rate. And as long as I keep doing that every single time, that will be a good thing. Now I can see the sugar disappearing. The sugar is dissolving, which is great. Occasionally I'm moving my stirring rod to the very middle just to sort of mix it just a little bit up a bit to make sure that um, the sugar is getting an even stir. It's almost, most of it has disappeared. Okay, most of it has disappeared. Now remember how I said you have to make a decision about when it's fully dissolved? I'm pretty close to calling it. Okay, it's mostly gone, there's few, tiny little bits and pieces, but I'd say 95%. So I'm going to call it a minute 12, a minute 12. Now we have to convert that to seconds, so 60 plus 12 is 72 seconds. So time, 72, and then I don't write the seconds. So that's that value. Now. What's important now is to rinse out, rinse out the sugar and to put in another 10 mil. Now this time I'm just using 
the room temperature in here. Okay, the room temperature in here, that's fine. And pop the thermometer in. And while that's coming up to speed, I'm going to get another half a gram of sugar. So it's important to keep dissolving the same thing. Oh, that's another thing that we can put on the outside of our lotus flower, uh, that the fact that we're using sugar, yeah? And also the fact that we're using half a gram of sugar each time. So that lotus flower is really good because it almost is a method in itself. Um, you can have so many details in it the lotus flower is a way to, to plan, to plan the experiment. Okay, I'm at 16.5 degrees. Okay, so the temperature of the room is 16.5 degrees and that, that water has been sitting in the room all night and so it's 16.5 degrees. And are we ready? Reset and pop it in, press start, and we're off. Okay, again, stirring at the same rate. Now I sort of can tell that I'm stirring it at the same rate because I can see the height of the sugar raising, rising up like half a centimetre. And so if I keep that speed going, occasionally, as I said, I move it to the middle, okay? Now, what do you think? Do you think this will go faster or slower, hey, well, how will the temperature affect it? What's your hypothesis? What's your best scientific guess based on the information that you've learnt over your life? Have you ever made hot tea before and dissolved some sugar in it? Okay, it's certainly disappearing. Now, it, it's not a good idea to look at the clock and then look back at here. It's best just to look at your your experiment and make a decision. That's fairly, fairly, that's pretty close. I think I'm going to call that. Yep. Okay, this time it was 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Oh, a little bit shorter time. I think we have a trend, people. <laughs> oh, but let's get some more data. Okay. So, also, it's very important to start with fresh water each time. Don't just keep adding half a gram each time because of course, oh, I'm running out of water, because that will change the starting conditions and will invalidate your experiment. So we have to start with fresh water every time. Now I'm just going to now warm up this water a little bit. Quickly get the Bunsen burner going. And action. Whoop. And, whoop. and let's give that a little bit of a stir. Okay, I don't want I don't want to heat it up too much. It's probably pretty close, you know. There we go. That's all I want to do. Pop it there. Now I'm going to actually get my half a gram ready of sugar because the temperature of that changes quite quickly. So put that on, tear. If you heat something up, it will tend to cool down quite quickly. So there we go, 0 0.5 grams. I'm going to get my calculator ready. Oh, not my calculator, ah, my thermometer ready. I mean my stopwatch ready. I'm losing my mind. Okay, in goes the probe and make sure I've got everything ready. And it's 26.7, 27.6, it's going up, 28.2, 28.5. We have to wait for it to stop going up, 28.8. 28.9, will you go to 29? Yes, 29 degrees. Quickly write that down because the temperature is falling. 29 degrees and action. 
almost action and bang start let's go and go around around and around we go where we stop nobody knows okay bring the glass rod to the middle see how it's lifting it's not a race it's not a race I'm not trying to do this faster each time okay whatever you do don't try and do it faster don't try and say oh race 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 no whatever you do don't do that 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 would invalidate the experiment okay Oh, the sugar has almost disappeared. Shall I call it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to call it. 43 seconds. 43 seconds. Whew. 43 seconds. And tip that out. Let's get another 10 ml of water. I'm running out of water. So let's pop that in there and let's warm this up again. It's like a rocket blasting off, isn't it? Watch out for my probe. Okay, I'm going to get half a gram going. Oh no, my spoon has gotten a little bit wet. Oop. Okay, that's definitely hot enough. Now, you know what? This is, I'm actually, this is going to be my last trial. All right? I mean, I want you to do six, but for me, four. For example, for results example for what I want to show. Otherwise, this video will go on forever and ever. No, no, you can, you can press pause after I've done this one, and you can go and do another two. Okay. So let me heat. Not heat. I've already heated it up. What temperature do you think it's gone to? Uh, it's at 39, 41, 43, 43. 44, 45, 45, slowing down now, 45.5, 46, not 46, 45.6, okay, that's at 45 degrees Celsius, reset, and stirring rod, 45 degrees, write that down, quick, 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 time is of the essence. And this is where some help would be good. And around we go. Around and around. There we go. Dissolving. Oh, yeah. It's, it's coming much, much quicker. Much, much quicker. Perfect. Whoa. Decisions, 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 decisions. I'm going to call it 24 seconds. 24 seconds. So. I've got some results. Like that. Now, I want you to do the next two higher and higher temperatures, maybe like 60 degrees and then 75 degrees. Um, but I'm now going to do, I'm going to show you how to graph the results. So here we go. All right, so we need a title. Uh, rate of dissolving versus temp. Now, what did we change? We changed the temperature. So, let's put temperature down here. In degrees Celsius. And we measured the time. So, time is the dependent variable and temperature is independent. Now, 
I'd like to start at zero. I love starting at zero. And maximum that you can go up to with water is 100. So, and I know that there's 10 lines. So I'm going to go up 10 degrees each time. 10, <clears throat> 20, 30, 40, 50. Now I only went up to 45, but you can keep going. And the time, my maximum time was 72 seconds. So this is nice and easy. I'm going to go up by tens each time. So at 10.3 degrees, the time was 72 seconds. So uh, 10.3 is about here and 72 is about here. So I'm going to put a nice cross at 16.5, which is about here. It was 60 seconds. So 16.5 at 29 degrees. It was 43. So 29 was 40, 29. Is it 43 there? And then at 45, it was 24, 45, 24. All right, that looks like a beautiful trend there. Now, would it be like a straight line? No, I don't think so. Um, it would be good if I had a few more results. Um, but I think... I suspect I can actually show you what the trend is going to be using these for. Yes, I should have had maybe a couple more results, but I'm, I'm fairly confident. Now, curve of best fit. I think it's going to look something like that. Okay. Oh, that's a little bit messy down there. That's fantastic. So I can actually extrapolate. So if I wanted to know how long it would take if it was five degrees, then I'd probably say, okay, well, five degrees is... Okay, it crosses the line here. So if it was five degrees, I'd expect it to take 85 seconds. What about if it was 60, 70, 80 degrees? I'd go, oh yeah, 80 degrees, I'd expect it to take about six seconds. Oh, that would be fast. And I could actually go and test that practically as well. Uh, so the conclusion is that definitely as you increase the temperature, the rate of dissolving increases. Um, so actually, And it's actually like an exponential relationship. So if you cooling, cool the temperature, then it takes exponentially uh, longer so very, very interesting, uh, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you say so? So anyway, thanks for joining me today and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be looking at diffusion layers. Very interesting. <laughs> in fact, it was a um, student who actually showed me this um, effect and I thought, oh, we could turn this into an experiment. So for this lesson, you need some water. Um, so I've got some water in my wash bottle, uh, some salt, sugar, plain flour, um, bicarbonate of soda, cornstarch. Um, if you don't have any of those, that's fine. Uh, the more of them, the better. You could even use, you know, citric acid or bicarbonate of soda, uh, not bicarbonate, baking powder. Um, you can use what you've got basically because it's an experiment. So we'll start with a beaker to which you add five mil of water. Now five mil roughly, it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be hugely accurate. So basically half, half a beaker of water. Um, so half a beaker of water. So even if it's like six mil, it goes up to the six mil mark. Then we're going to start with some salt. And I'll need my spoon and my stirring rod. And I've got some salt here. And we need to make quite a concentrated um, solution. So quite a concentrated solution. That's fairly important. And so I'll put in three big spoons and let's dissolve this fairly rapidly. 
uh, dissolve, dissolve, dissolve. The sodium chloride breaks apart into sodium ions and chloride ions. Um, something that you'll learn about uh, in further courses. What ions are and charges and electrons and protons. and Okay, so I've got a nice concentrated um, solution of sodium chloride. And now this is the heart, the, the challenging part. You have to add fresh water to the top. Now I'm going to do that just by gently squeezing, gently squeezing water onto the side surface of that beaker so that the water level just goes up very gently, very slowly. I don't want too much mixing to happen and I can get it almost all the way to the top like so. Excellent. Um, I'm sure there's been a little bit of mixing there. In fact, I can see that there's been a little bit of mixing there. And I'll pop that there and I'll wait a little bit. Now I've got some food coloring. I forgot to mention food coloring. I'm going to drop one large drop of food coloring. I don't want, I want to drop it near the surface. I don't want it. Whoa, there we go. That was really quite interesting. I saw it shoot down and then sort of bounce back up. Like there's this invisible um, barrier. Uh, red, and yeah, you can actually put a color of each food coloring in, okay? Yellow, and, well, the yellow and the blue make green. There we go, oh, bounced down and came back up. So that is our salt, which I'm going to move across there. And quite clearly, quite clearly you can see that the colors are diffusing in the top section, but not traveling down into the bottom section. Now the question is, does that occur with other dissolved substances such as sugar? So let's try sugar. So I can do the same thing. Half a beaker full of water, get a small spoon and one for one, two, three, three sugars. That should make it a fairly concentrated solution. Okay, so I want a nice, sweet, concentrated solution to see whether this diffusion layer occurs. Let's find out. Mixy, 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 mixy. Takes a while to dissolve the sugar. The, the sugar crystals are larger than the salt crystals, but also sugar itself might not dissolve as rapidly. There we go. Excellent. Let's get the water and gently squirt it in. It is mixing a fair bit. I can see that. Maybe there's a better way to add the water without the mixing. If you know, you can let me know. And then we'll both know. Okay. And let's try. I'll start with a different color actually. I'm going to start with the yellow. Let's try green. And blue. And red. Okay. Oh, I've got, I've got some strong similarities there. We've got the salt and the sugar. And um, it certainly looks like there's two layers. It looks like the food coloring spreads throughout the fresh water and then sort of stops. Um, interesting, interesting. Now I do have some plain flour which I could use. I reckon plain flour, flour is going to do something very interesting. I think it's not going to dissolve. I don't think plain flour dissolves. I know bicarbonate of salt soda dissolves and cornstarch doesn't really dissolve either. Uh, I've got three beakers, probably you've got three beakers too. Um, let's just do plain flour and see what happens, shall we? Okay, so five mil, and I make um, 
plasticine from plain flour and mm, I'm just going to try and put in a little bit. Let's see what happens when you put plain flour with water. Oh, it's just floating on the top at the moment. That's about three spoonfuls. That's interesting. It's just floating on the top. Oh, and then it sort of falls through. And if I give that a stir, is that dissolving? Hmm, interesting. I don't think the word is dissolving, to be honest. Okay, I actually, to work out whether it was dissolving or not, you'd want to have this sitting here for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And if the, if the colour sort of lowers, leaving uh, like water on the top surface, clear colourless water on the top surface, then it's not dissolved. It's like just a, what's called a suspension. Um, and those large particles will slowly settle over time. Um, anyway, I'm going to try and add the water to the top. Gentle, gentle, gentle. It's definitely mixing because otherwise it wouldn't go up with the white. Uh, would, the white wouldn't travel up. Um, okay. All right, let's just see what happens. I'm going to leave it for about the same amount of time. Hmm, right. it's travelled down, but not as to a layer, basically. Ooh. Green. Oh, that was two drops. That was cheating a little bit. And yellow. Oh. Fairly similar effect there. Salt, sugar, flour. Um, a fairly similar effect. Very interesting, isn't it? These diffusion layers. Yeah. Now, I've got bicarb soda um, and I've got um, cornstarch, but I'd have to tip out these three beakers to do the other two. And this is a practical course. This is where you should be doing this yourselves and not just watching me doing it. So you should be having this equipment and you should be doing this experiment and so you can continue on and do the bicarb soda and a cornstarch by yourself and then maybe one other substance, for example, citric acid or baking powder, up, up to you. Anyway, very interesting, uh, the diffusion of colours through um, uh, diffusion, uh, well, through through some layers. Okay, all right. I'll look forward to seeing you again. Oh, before I go though, this is this salt, this salt um, layer. It's quite a um, important phenomenon because if you've got seawater, ocean water, which is salty, and you've got river water coming and the two meeting, you'll actually find that the salty water is actually going to be more dense and is going to be underneath. And in fact, you can have layers of salinity in the ocean itself, where the deeper you go, you will actually pass through salt layers. And that salt layers can actually uh, cause turbulence and movement as well. So it's actually quite, uh, quite an important phenomena having different um, concentrations of salt in bodies of water. Anyway, that's it for now, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in this video we're going to look at something called fast freezing. Now I remember doing this when in my first year of high school and I thought it was really, really, really interesting. So I thought, oh, got to do it, got to do it with, um, you know, <laughs> within this course. So you're going to need 16 ice cubes from your um, little ice cube tray and put those 16 ice cubes into the plastic container, the 20 mil plastic container like that. And it almost fills it up, doesn't it? It's about 90% full. Now we're going to be adding salt. Now salt will lower the temperature. Now the ratio of salt is about uh, one salt mass, uh, what is it, one to three. Um, so 16 ice cubes has got a mass of about 15, 16 grams, so 15 grams. So that means we need about five grams of salt. 
So I've got my little plate there, I'll tear it, tear, and let's get five grams of salt. Let's see what five grams of salt looks like. Oh, it's actually quite a lot. Wow, wow. Oh, it's really loading it up. It's a little bit surprising, actually. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's more salt than I thought, okay? And I'm going to put that whole lot in there like that. I've got salt everywhere now. Um, in we go. Try and try and keep your scales as clean as possible, yeah? <laughs> that was not a good example. Then I'm going to get my um if you don't. <laughs> That's how I do that. That's how I clean the benches. Um alright now. I need to mix that salt through the ice cubes. Mixy, 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 mixy. Trying, I'm trying to get the salt all over the place. There we go. Perfect. So, now that I've got that, I uh, might do a little bit more. Well, oh, just lost the ice cube. Got it back. One more bit of meat. Oh, get back in there. I wonder whether it's a better idea if I crushed up the ice. Ooh, probably would be. Okay, well, if it doesn't work, I'm going to blame that. Okay. Then, we need a test tube. And I'm going to first add a little bit of food colouring. First this time. Normally I add food colouring last, but I know that it won't mix well if I... The last one. So there we go, a little bit of food colouring, and we only need a little bit of water, okay? Just, just a little bit of water like that. Now, if I was to tip this out, and I'm going to do that, if I tip this out, have a look, tip this over, the water runs out. See that? I'll do it again. Oh wow, surprise, surprise. <laughs> you tip the water out and it goes out. Well, in actual fact, that's not always the case, do you realise? What? Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. Well, I'm getting blue water everywhere. That's not what I wanted at all. <laughs> I'm going to... Um, and there we go. So, I've got some blue water swishing around in there. So now I'm going to push... Hmm... Am I going to push? Hmm. It's not really doing what I wanted to do, so I'm going to tip it all into the mortar. Tip it all into the mortar. All of it. It's, hmm. What's happened down here? Okay, tipping it all into the mortar. Go. Like that. Then, then, or now, I'm going to hold the test tube in place and tip this whole lot. There we go. Aha! You can see I'm an expert at this thing. <laughs> tip that in. And there. So, now I'm going to let that just sit there. Just sit there. So it's called fast freezing crossing my fingers and seeing indeed whether this will be fast freezing. But while we wait, I want to sh I'd want like to show you two things. Firstly, if I get a beaker, a beaker, let's get a test tube, and I'm going to go red this time. I'm going to go red and put some, a little bit of red into that test tube. And this time I'm going to fill the test tube up as far as I possibly can. You can do this too while you wait. All the way up until literally it's got, it's almost overflowing. Okay. All right. So I've got a slight meniscus on the top. Now I'm going to invert this. I'm going to turn it upside down. What do you think is going to happen if I invert this? Shall we find out? And over! <laughs> mm, that's not what I wanted to happen at all. <laughs> what about if I don't fill it up all the way? What about if it's just under, just under the lip there? 
Turn it over. Okay, all right. Um, I don't think this is going to work. What about just on the line? Okay, all right. Strike that, strike that. I was hoping and maybe, maybe, maybe it's working for you that if you turn it upside down, it actually, the water stays up there due, due to the surface tension and the air pressure. Maybe. Not for me today. Maybe it's the test tube. Let's try a different test tube. Okay, so there we go. One more try. One more try, upside down. Oh, you're joking. What a mess. Okay, strike that. I should edit that totally out of the, the video. But for the, for the sake of honesty, in science, I've left it in, okay? Could have made it disappear. You know, I could have pressed the delete button and it was all gone and I wouldn't have looked so silly. But no, for science, I am deciding to look silly. Now, if you have the privilege of going to India and if you uh, go out on the streets and it's a hot day, I've seen lots of videos where they make this special sort of dessert and they use like milk and cream and condensed milk and sweeteners and flavors and chocolate syrup and colors and and basically to freeze this beautiful dessert they use lots of ice and they add rock salt or salt to the ice and they mix it up and i've seen this wonderful uh, machine that they make it's like a metal drum uh, like this milo can um, now, I didn't quite realise that the, the Milo can had all these ridges on it. That would probably even make it work even better. They, the reason that there's ridges on this is so that you get less Milo. No, no, Nestle wouldn't do that to us. The reason all these ridges are here are, I believe, to actually give the can greater strength. strength. Now, if, once you finish the Milo, and let's admit it, Milo is a beautiful food, uh, or is it a drink? Well, the amount of Milo that my kids have in their drink, it's definitely a food. But anyway, once the Milo's empty, um, somehow to attach a rod coming out here, um, I think you could use a nut and a bolt. If you drill a hole in here, and make sure your parents are helping you. If you drill a hole in here and use a nut and a bolt, you'll have a bolt coming out here. And if you do the same here with a nut and a bolt, you could actually have it... And then maybe you could put them through some like fidget spinner bearings or something like that. So that you could have this rotating. Yeah. So you could make it rotate and then a little bit of a, I don't know, you could probably just rotate it by hand. But then you fill it up with ice and salt. So it's chock-a-block. And then you rotate it. And so this, this surface becomes very, very cold. And then you make up your delicious mix of milk and cream and condensed milk and chocolate. Uh, or not chocolate. Or you could even then like, uh, if you go watch these videos, um, you know, they smear like mango over it. And then they pour their... And then they keep rotating it. And it freezes. It freezes. And then they scrape it off into a cup. And it's a beautiful dessert. Oh, that now that would be a fun thing to do. Okay? Yeah. Now, with all that talking, without all that talking, that's given us a hopefully enough time for this fast freezing. Okay. Have you? You haven't frozen. You're joking. What? What is happening to science these days? It's just not, it's just not like it used to be. When I was in high school, this froze. What about if I like mix it around like this? Mixy, 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 mixy. Will that freeze? Mm. Maybe I'm using too much salt. Maybe I'm not using enough salt. Maybe I need to crush the ice cubes. Maybe you need to try again with maybe more ice or I'm not too sure. But why don't you have a go and see if you can actually demonstrate something that I was not able to do. Um, see if you can achieve fast freezing because I feel like I've failed again anyway. Okay, well, 
Hopefully you've enjoyed watching me fail at science once again, but I'm hoping that when you succeed, you'll feel like a great success and uh, it will give you confidence uh, throughout the rest of your life. Okay, all right, well, thanks for joining me today on this science video and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be looking at chemical changes or chemical reactions. Now they are considered irreversible reactions. Physical changes, um, changes of state, are, are called uh, reversible. Uh, these are irreversible. That is that they're virtually, well, they're not easy to reverse, put it that way. Now, there are some signs that a chemical change or a chemical reaction has occurred. One, one is when there's a reaction and like light is given out. That's, a, that's an indicator that there's been a chemical change. Another one is where there's been a fairly sharp rise or fall in temperature. So uh, that's another indicator. Uh, if there's bubbles of gas produced, well, that's a new substance. Gas is a new substance, and so that's evidence of a chemical change. Or a precipitate is formed. Now, a precipitate, again, is a, a new solid is formed, generally when there's um, liquids involved. And then also, if there's a colour change. So there are five common indicators that a chemical change or reaction has taken place. Now, have you ever been camping and have had a fire? Well, a fire is a chemical change. You know, there's light given out, there's a temperature change, there's lots of heat given out, uh, there's new substances produced, there's colour changes, you know, like uh, the, the wood goes black. Uh, that there's actually new substance produced, you know, black charcoal. Well, have you ever cooked a marshmallow on a fire? Well, that's an example of a chemical reaction or a chemical change, and we're going to cook a tiny marshmallow over the Bunsen burner. So, <laughs> let's see how we go. Firstly, I'll get the gas going. And here's my first chemical change. Light given out, heat given it out. Uh, there's a change of color of the wood. Uh, lighting a match is definitely a chemical change or chemical reaction. The gas burning, you know? We've got heat coming out, we've got a change of temperature, we've got light given off, we've got a new substance, i.e., well, what is the new substance? We can't tell, but later on we'll be able to see. So, how about I get a little, uh, little kebab stick, and I'm going to skewer no, a tiny marshmallow. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and there it is there. Um, beautiful little marshmallow. And how about I gently cook it? Now, my favorite way of cooking them is gently because that sort of, ooh, that warms them up and makes them all gooey and squishy. Um, or, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I've got a chemical change, all right? Look, it's gone black and crispy and charcoal -y and um, heat, oh, I've just blown out my, marsh, my Bunsen burner. Let's hold it like this, so that, there. I didn't want to put my um, marshmallow on the table because of contaminations. Oh, it's sort of coming off the stick. Oh, so soft and gooey. Nice. Oh, okay. Make sure you cool it down a bit. Oh, that's magical. Mmm. That is absolutely delicious. Mmm. I'm going to do that one again. Rotate, 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 and you'll wonder why I like science. Eh? <laughs> Woo! How good is this? I love it. Oh! And blow it, and. Mmm! Absolutely delicious. Wow! Make sure you do that. Okay, make sure you do that. Um, that was. That's the best science I've done for a long time. All right, that was a chemical reaction. Light's given out, heat's given out, change of color, new substance, absolute classic. Now, what could be quite interesting is if you were to get a larger marshmallow and weigh the larger marshmallow using the scales and then heat it up, you know, maybe get it all charcoal-y, but not too, like, soggy. 
get it all off the stick and then re-weigh it and actually see if there's any type of temperature, uh, not temperature, um, if there's any mass difference. So we're going to look at a few other um, examples of chemical reactions. And the first one is, I've got some steel wool. I've got some steel wool here. Now I got it uh, from the hardware, but you might be able to get it from under the kitchen cupboard. There might be a steel of a, um, uh, I got it from the hardware, I think in the paint section because it's used to like help um, remove old paint and old flaky surfaces. But you can get it uh, in the kitchen section, I think, too, as well, like the Steelo. But you need really quite thin, like this is really thin steel wool. Like, whoo, if I drop it, you know, it doesn't like drop very fast because it's sort of so lightweight. Um, now, I should put on my goggles for this. Hey, now, safety glasses never act a good experiment. <laughs> I'll also need some tweezers for this. And let's light the Bunsen burner. And there we go. Now, if there's no tripod, well, I'm going to put a tripod here, you know. That sort of keeps it a little bit safer as well in my mind. It means you, yeah. I'm going to take half of the steel. Do you think metal burns? I think most people will say no metal does not burn, but let's find out, shall we? Whoa! Look at that! Wow! That's amazing! The steel now it's not technically burning. It's definitely a chemical reaction. I mean look, light is given out. It's gone black. It's gone black. That's a new substance forming. That's actually iron oxide. Um, look at that. Absolutely fantastic. Um, heating iron wool is definitely a chemical reaction. Particularly when that the sparks travelled up. I love it. Now, I happen to have a 9 volt battery here. Let me just turn that off. I happen to have a 9 volt battery here from my microphone. And I'm actually going to put the, the whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> I ignited it with the electricity passing through that wire. That was really interesting. Notice that once it's burnt, though, the iron oxide itself is not particularly conductive. So although this still looks fairly similar to what it started out as, it's actually totally different. It's actually iron oxide now. So very interesting. It would be interesting to weigh, weigh before and after. And what you'll probably find if you do this carefully is that the weight will probably increase because the iron has reacted with oxygen to form iron oxide. So uh, absolute classic. Now, what about we put a piece of magnesium ribbon in some copper sulfate solution and see what happens. So I'm going to get a small beaker and mm, just a quarter full, so just up to the two mil. And I'm going to tap in some blue copper sulfate. Don't think we need too much. Don't think we need too much. Just a spoon or two full. But we do need to dissolve it. So at the moment, I've just got a, I've got the water on the top and the undissolved copper sulfate on the bottom. But if I stir, that will actually speed up the dissolving process. And I can see that the water is now going blue due to the dissolved copper sulfate. Now, copper sulfate does take a little bit longer than salt to dissolve. So, sodium chloride, table salt. Um, it probably takes about the same time as sugar, to be honest. There we go. Once you've got that solution, then get a piece of magnesium and stand the magnesium into the copper sulfate. Okay, so I'm just standing the, the magnesium into the copper sulfate. And if I look, I can actually see some bubbles forming. Yes, I see bubbles forming on the magnesium ribbon. 
Now bubbles or are an indicator that there's a chemical reaction going on, okay? Because bubbles are bubbles of gas. They weren't there before. There must be a new substance forming. What are those bubbles of gas? Well, <laughs> sometimes you have to think about what's actually available. There's magnesium available. There's water available. There's copper and copper ions and sulfate ions. And sulfate is CuSO. Oh, copper sulfate is CuSO4. So it could be, could be oxygen, it could be hydrogen. Um, it's unlikely to be nitrogen. Um, I'd say, I'd say it's probably, oh, I'd say it's probably oxygen, bubbles of oxygen. That would be an interesting thing to, to test at, a, at, at some stage. But if you actually lift it out, you'll also notice that another change has occurred. There's another change that's occurred. And where it's been dipped in, it's gone like a dark, well, it looks like black, but, so there's a new, there's a color change and there's a new substance. And if you leave it in there long enough, if you leave it in long enough, and you can do that, you might see bits falling off, and I believe they're copper. Okay, I think copper atoms are coming out of solution. Um, and actually the magnesium is um, producing magnesium ions and going into solution. But that is a chemical change. What's another example of a chemical change? We're going to try precipitation. So again, I need um, two beakers and a small amount of water in each. Okay, we don't need much water. And we need to put some copper sulfate into one. So I'll pop that in there and that can actually start dissolving. And I'm going to get the sodium carbonate decahydrate, which is white crystals. Sodium carbonate decahydrate, white crystals, and pop oh, a few of them into that beaker. Now with my stirring rod, I am going to give, I'm going to dissolve the copper sulfate. So stir, 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 stir. Uh, that's fantastic. Now, I'm not going to put this stirring rod straight into that, um, the other beaker, because that will contaminate it. So I'm actually going to just wash with my wash bottle the stirring rod first before I use it again. So there we go. I'm avoiding contamination. And stir, 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 stir. And those crystals will slowly dissolve and disappear and I'll have a clear colorless solution. A clear colorless solution. Basically it looks like water, but it's not water. It's, um, it's water with dissolved sodium carbonate decahydrate. So there we go. And the common name for sodium carbonate decahydrate is actually washing soda and can be used um, to help wash clothes. There we go. I've got now a blue clear solution. So I've got a clear solution because I can see through it, but it's blue. And now on a watch glass, okay, so on a watch glass, and I might even put the watch, no, I'm not gonna put the watch glass on the white plate. Um, I'm just gonna put the watch glass on the wooden table, pour in some of my clear um, sodium carbonate solution, and pour in some of my blue clear copper sulfate. And in actual fact, I get a, it's like a, there's like little gluggy particles, little gluggy particles, a solid has formed. Then that solid is actually a precipitate. So we've actually pr produced a precipitate. So <clears throat> um, how can I show you that? I can do it in another, in another beaker. Oh, I'll just pull up this magnesium um, copper sulfate one. And you remember how I said that there'd be bits and pieces falling off it? Well, there are indeed. There's all this black stuff down there on the bottom. I'm going to tip that out. Just wash this out. Oh, you know what? I don't need that beaker. I can actually just put that liquid into that liquid there. And all of a sudden I can see that it's not clear anymore. It's um, trans... Is it opaque or translucent? I think it's translucent. 
but they're like little solid particles that are suspended. And if I leave that for long enough, I suspect that those particles will settle down. So I might that, leave that there for a little bit longer. And one other one. Now this is an interesting one. It's, some people will say that this is not a chemical change. Others might say it is a chemical change. Hmm, no. I'm not 100% sure, but I've got a beaker of water here. And I want to record the temperature of that beaker of, of that water. That's the first thing I'm going to do. So let's get the temperature of that water. And I'll write it down so that I can remember it, because otherwise I'll forget. <laughs> uh, it shouldn't take long to cool down because this wash bottle's in the room and the thermometer probe's in the room, and so everything should be fairly similar in temperature. 17.1 um, degrees Celsius. 17.1 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature of the, of the water. Of the water. Now, I also... Well, it's actually gone to 16.9. So, let's, let's put it down to 16.9. Now, I also have some salt. Now, the salt's been in this room as well. And I'm just going to dry the probe. I'm going to measure the temperature of the salt. So, stick the probe into the salt. Now again, the salt's been in this room for hours and hours. It should be a pretty similar temperature to the water because they're both being in the room. At the moment, it's reading 17.2, which is a little tiny bit more than the, a little bit tiny more than the water. So, but I'll write that down. Okay, I'll go 17.2 degrees Celsius for the salt. Now, so it just went to 17.3, so I'll write that down. Now, I'm actually going to put a lot of the salt into the beaker of water. So I'm going to transfer a lot of the salt to the beaker of water. So in we go. Salt. Salt. Lots of salt. Look at that. Wow. I'm loading it up. Woohoo! Wow, here we go. And I'm just going to give it a little bit of a mix, not much of a mix. Now, what do you think the temperature will be? You know, the water was 16.9, the salt was 17.3. You know, people I think would guess, probably guess maybe somewhere in the middle, maybe 17 degrees Celsius could be a good guess. Yeah, I think that's a good guess. Well. I actually don't know. I've got, a, I've got a feeling what's going to happen, but I'll find out in a moment. So let's pop it in and let's see what happens to the temperature. 16, whoa, 16.3, 16.1, 16 degrees, 15.9. There's a clear temperature drop. Okay, there's a clear temperature drop, 15.8. It's cooling down. It's cooling down. Wow. There we go. This is what we call an endothermic change. An endothermic. If it gets hot, that's exothermic. But if it cools down, that's an endothermic one. Huh. So, uh, more than a degree uh, drop. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. I might just wash my probe. Um, because it's all salty and I don't want it to corrode away. Anyway, that was our uh, video on a lesson on chemical change, chemical reactions, and hopefully you enjoyed learning about the five signs of a chemical reaction. Uh, what were they? Light, temperature change, uh, gas produced, um, precipitate forming, and the change of colour. Okay, all right, look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're looking at water and in particular the, um, I guess, chemical reactions surrounding water. Now, did you know that you can get water from fire? <laughs> Let me show you. We're going to need your Bunsen burner and a beaker, uh, the 10 mil beaker, and some matches. And I think your watch glass will be helpful as well. 
but I'll just get the watch glass. Oh, this watch glass is a little bit wet, so I'll just dry that off. Perfect. I actually want to make sure that the beaker is dry, everything is dry, that there's no water, no condensation, anything like that. Fantastic. Now, what I'm going to do is I want to put some butane gas into this beaker. Now, to do that, I'm going to block the two air holes with my uh, th finger and thumb so that when I turn on the butane or open it up, just butane gas comes out. So I can hear the gas coming out. I'll squirt the gas in there like that. And then I'm just going to put the watch glass on top. Now it doesn't make a perfect seal because there's a little bit of a brim, but it will seal it for long enough. And to be sure, to be sure, I'll just pop on my goggles. So let's see what happens when we light that gas. Whoa, <gasps> look at that. It's like a birthday candle. It burns down. Now, what's very important to notice is that there is condensation on the inside of that beaker. Okay, now it's slowly disappearing because this was what we call an exothermic reaction. And that is that heat was produced and that heat actually warmed up the beaker. Um, and because the beaker's warm, the water that condensed um, is now evaporated and is almost gone. Now, I'm sort of like, I can blow air back into back into this beaker so that I can I can do the little activity again. And let's do it once more. And block the holes. In goes the gas. Close it up. And this time, I want you to try and notice the water vapor that forms. So here we let's light the match. And action. A little bit of smoke. But definitely not as much water vapor this time because the beaker was a little bit warm. So the chemical reaction is butane, which is the uh, liquid here, which uh, turns into a gas, butane, uh, reacts with oxygen in the air. Reacts with oxygen in the air. Now, if you don't have enough oxygen, we can see what happens, don't we? What happens if we don't have enough oxygen? Let me just light this um, Bunsen. I'm just going to put my heat proof mat there and my other heat proof mat on. Like so, put my watch glass away. Try and keep your area nice and tidy. This blue flame is what happens when the butane is reacting with plenty of oxygen. Now, if we remove the oxygen source by blocking the holes, we actually get what's called incomplete combustion. There's a little bit of oxygen that is reacting with the butane, but a lot of the butane is probably not even being burnt. Okay, so whoa. <laughs> so what's the reaction when you burn butane? Butane plus oxygen, and it produces, well, one thing that we saw that it produced is water. Yes, water. Water is produced when butane burns. And another gas is carbon dioxide. That's right, when you burn butane, you'll produce carbon dioxide and water. So, now what would happen if we try that again, but with a little conical flask? Will we get the same effect? Um, so let's see if I can fill up my conical flask just with gas like that. Well, try that again. Just with gas like that, put the little watch glass lid on. And will we get a nice flame that burns down like we had with the beaker? No, I got a little bit of a smoke ring or something like that, but I certainly didn't get the fire burning. There was plenty, there's plenty of gas there. The question is, why doesn't it burn down? And it's because the neck of the um, conical flask is very narrow and so it doesn't allow the required oxygen to go in. Now, what about if I was to try just putting in the gas without 
without blocking the holes. Doesn't that mean oxygen will go in there? Hmm. I'm hoping it might. Hoping it might. Does that mean it will burn? Hmm. My prediction is that it will, but I actually think it won't. Oh! Oh, that was cool! Did you... Did you see that? Did you see the flame that went down? I actually sort of didn't expect that. And I can see it's all misty in here now um, because of the condensation. So we actually did get combustion. That chemical reaction where a hydrocarbon, and butane is an example of a hydrocarbon, reacts with oxygen uh, to form carbon dioxide and water is called combustion. Let's try that again. Okay, so this time oxygen is getting blown in there. Put the little lid on. Will we get this flame going down? Hope so, because that was really cool. Woo! Went down a little bit. Shall I drop the match in? Oh, no. Okay, well, that was very, very interesting. So, now, water... Water has got oh, so much to do with chemistry, it's, it's all, it verges on the ridiculous. There is so much chemistry around water. Water supports so many different uh, chemical reactions. In fact, <laughs> when you're doing chemistry in high school um, and you're labeling like the reactants and the products, we'll often label them as solid, liquids and gases, but also aqueous, AQ because the word aqueous means water, aqua, aqueous. And there's just so many reactions that occur with water. So let me give you a little bit of an example. Um, I'll get a beaker of water and let's put it here like this. Let's get a beaker of water. Now, this is almost pure water, almost pure water. It actually will have some, some dissolved salts in it. Now, I'm actually going to use my electricity set for some of these, just these are really just little demos. Now, if you don't have an electricity set, you can either watch this, or, or if you use a nine volt battery with a terminal clip on it and two leads, and the inside um, carbon uh, graphite rods from uh, gray lead pencils, you'll be able to actually do everything that I'm doing here. So if you don't have an electricity set, well, boo-hoo for you, but <laughs> you can use a nine volt battery with some terminal, uh, with a terminal in the red and the black wires and some carbon electrodes from gray lead pencils. Okay, so I'm not leaving you out to dry, basically. Now, if I get a battery pack and I get some wires like this. Actually, I need a LED globe as well. And let me get my, oh, untangle these a little bit, unclip. I love the clippy clippy um, sort of uh, aspects of this set. Makes it so easy. Having said that, knots don't make life easy, but I'll soon have this knot. I'm done. Da, 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 da. I will not have you. <laughs> oh, yes, I will for a short moment. There's one done. That's not free. And almost done with the other one. Never pull knots. If, you, if you're ever undoing knots, don't pull them and make them tighter. It's better to try just to try and follow it along and then don't pull a knot because it won't, it won't become undone. So there is also, not only does water have a lot to do with chemistry, but also, woo! So I'm completing the circuit, see this, with um, putting these two alligator clips together. Now, in the electricity set, there's also, I can get them out, there's two graphite rods. Now, graphite, this is graphite here, this is the pencil lead stuff, the interesting thing about graphite is that it's basically the only non-metal that conducts electricity. Now, do you see how there it's very bright, and then as I go along, it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Now, an LED doesn't, LEDs are light emitting diode, and it doesn't require much electricity to glow. Now, if I touch those two carbon rods together, 
it glows. Now, what about if I go into the water? Ah! Hey! <laughs> I like it. Have a look at that. Uh, if I touch them together, the, there's good conduction. But if I put them into the water, there's only a little bit of conduction. See that? So this pure water, it's not quite pure. If it was pure water, that light probably wouldn't be on at all. But because, you know, it can't, our water comes from a dam, which is fed, spread from, fed by a, a spring, and the spring goes through rocks and dissolve minerals. Well, those, those salts and minerals um, uh, do conduct a little bit of electricity. To show you that, I've got my trusty container of salt here. And if I scrape in a little bit of salt into that, um, I've got to make sure it's salt and not sugar. If I scrape in some salt, all right, then when I dissolve the salt, okay, let's see what it does to the conductivity. Do you think it will make a difference? Let's find out. Ooh, the question might be, has that made a difference? Well, we can do a control, all right? So a control is the fresh water. Here's the fresh water. So we go fresh water, that brightness, and whoa, it is a lot brighter. Um, by putting salt in the water, it becomes a lot brighter. Now, interestingly, interestingly, um, if I make that really, really salty, okay, and super, super salty, look at this. And in actual fact, if I get rid of this um, light globe, actually, I'll just show you with the light globe first. I'm going to show you that the conduction is going to be much, much better when you've got a concentrated solution. So, stir, 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 and ta-da! I think that's much brighter. But I'm actually going to get rid of the light globe. I'm going to put it in here. I'm going to get another battery pack. So I'm going to double the voltage. So I'll just connect those two battery packs together. Perfect. Perfect. And you do know that I've got an um, electricity course for high school kids using this set as well. So if you're enjoying this chemistry course and you haven't done the electricity course, definitely um, you should organize yourself one of the electricity sets. No pressure. All right. And now, if I put those two in there like that, if I look carefully, one of these is actually bubbling away. One of, yes, the, the one on the black, the negative, is actually bubbling away. So the negative one is bubbling. That's where the electrons are. And that would mean that anything that's positively charged is attracted to it. So I wonder what's attracted to the um, negative that's positive in there. Hmm. Let's do a little bit of a, what's called a, a waft. I'm actually smelling a little bit of um, chlorine. Well, that's interesting, but I would actually expect the chlorine to actually be forming on the red one, not on the negative one. And there's probably a different gas forming on the negative one. So very interesting uh, combining electricity with chemistry. Uh, another very interesting to, thing to do is if I tip out my, I won't tip out my salt, I'll tip out some of that water I tip out some of that water. And if I get my copper sulfate, now copper sulfate is basically a cr crushed up, there's a there's rocks and minerals which can contain copper sulfate. And if you crush them up, you get copper sulfate. But have you ever wondered where we get copper from? Well, you can get copper from copper sulfate. What you do is you dissolve it in water so I'm dissolving it in water. And the copper ions, the Cu2 plus ions, which are positively charged, will be attracted to the negative terminal where they'll pick up two electrons and turn back into copper. So if I pop, oh, oh ah, 
<laughs> just be careful with copper sulfate because uh, it's not good for your eyes. So if you, that's why I'm wearing safety goggles, and it's not it's not great for plants either, to be honest, or or animals. Um, so it can small amounts can go down the sink, and <clears throat> these are only small amounts, so. I'm not very concerned about it at all, but it is best if you don't tip it over like I did, okay? <laughs> oh dear. So, if I put the copper rods in, like this, and I'll wait a moment for anything to happen. Now, you can actually use electricity, very similar to this, to split water into, so water is the, the compound H2O, you can actually split water into hydrogen and oxygen gas. Um, you can use a solar panel to do it, right? So if I've got a solar panel, oh, look at this, I do have a solar panel, look, and it even fits our set. Uh, you can use uh, solar electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And when you do have hydrogen and oxygen, that actually is an explosive mixture which you can use as rocket fuel or to uh, use in an internal combustion engine or even pass it through a fuel cell to get your electricity uh, to generate electricity. So that's called green hydrogen if you're making it with um, a solar panel. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this, but I can definitely see it. I might put a little white plate in front of it this is lovely, this is fantastic. Have a look at this. I put a little white plate in front of it like this. Can you see that orange on the um, end of that electrode, on the end of that carbon rod? That is copper atoms. We have, we have produced copper atoms from the copper sulfate. This is, this is how mankind obtains copper from rocks. How good is that? Anyway. Hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson on looking at water, some of the chemical reactions involved, combustion, um, splitting water into hydrogen, oxygen, and getting copper, and also um, producing a little bit of chlorine gas, which, whoo, <laughs> a little bit smelly. But anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be modeling the combustion of butane. Now, the butane uh, that we've been using comes in the can like this, and it's stored under pressure as a liquid, but if you remove the pressure from the top, then the liquid turns to a gas, and as we know, the, oh, <laughs> I'm running out of butane. So, let's get the liquid here, and, Fill it up with liquid, 80% full is as far as we want. And when I turn it over, yes, there's liquid here. Um, there's actually gas at the top here, and that gas pressure is actually pushing that liquid up, but then when it sort of um, leaves this vessel, it turns into gas. Um, the gas then mixes with some oxygen through these holes, and when we ignite it, that is called combustion. Okay, so this is combustion. It's a chemical reaction. The butane is reacting with oxygen to form what well, produces heat and it produces waste product, water and carbon dioxide. Now, I'm hoping that you might have some plasticine or modeling clay, something like that, uh, in three different colors. Because butane, is a hydrocarbon. Now, hydrocarbon is, uh, it's got a, a backbone of carbon atoms. So if I was to model uh, methane, um, I would need to have a carbon atom, and the carbon atom is bonded to four hydrogen atoms. Now, let me get four hydrogen atoms. Um, here we go, these are the little white ones. So this is methane, almost there, almost there. Now, a carbon atom is actually about 12 times the mass of a hydrogen atom, so 12 times the mass. 
these sizes are not quite uh, you know to scale um, if we we're talking about masses and that sort of stuff what we have to remember though is that you know a, a compound in reality doesn't look anything like this this is just modeling it to help us have a better idea at uh, chemical reactions ethane so you go methane ethane we now add a another carbon atom okay add another carbon atom and that needs to be surrounded by um hydrogen okay so let me find some more little bonds in here so this is this is ethane and ethane is actually very important to the plastic industry okay in um you might have you probably haven't but polyethylene polyethylene is your classic uh compound making up a plastic bag that's ethane now if you want to make um propane and propane is basically your bottle gas so if you're cooking with gas um with your barbecue outside if you go to bunnings and fill up that that bottle gas uh, that's actually mainly propane. There'll be a bit of methane and a little bit of ethane, but bottle gas, LPG, liquid petroleum gas, is mainly propane. And so, uh, if I click that on there, that's my propane. But we're using butane, and so we need four. Okay, we need four um, carbon atoms uh, surrounded by... Uh, let me get this right. Uh, I believe it's 10. Is that right? <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Sometimes my chemistry is a little bit um, rusty. Boom, boom. Bad joke. Okay, anyway. <laughs> rusty, chem rusty chemistry. My, my chemistry is a little bit like an old nail. Rusty. Uh, anyway, so we got um, butane. Here we go. Here we go. Give me another bond and i've got lots of now it's probably not the molecule's probably not shaped like a dog with a you know bent head um and so what have we got three five seven ten we've got ten hyd ah beautiful there's our butane molecule now i'm telling you that quite literally this liquid here is billions if not trillions of these molecules they're very very small now, if you want to model it, and I'm hoping that you are modeling, you're getting some dark plasticine four balls and you're wrapping, you're putting like 10 little white balls around it. That's your model of butane. If you want to model combustion, you need two of these. Okay, you need two of these. So you have to make two of these. Make two of these uh, molecules. And then you also then need 13 oxygen molecules. Now, oxygen, the air that we breathe, the oxygen that we breathe in, doesn't exist as single oxygen atoms, okay? Just doesn't. It actually exists in nature as what we call a diatomic, a diatomic molecule. Now, the word di in science, di means two. And so, oxygen actually looks more like this. Getting there? Bam! See that? That's a diatomic molecule. But you can draw, you can make a model of it. Your model, it, your model will be fine if it just looks like that. Okay. If you're using plasticine ball and stick, you can just use that. Now you'll need 13 of those, 13 of those, and you'll need two butanes. So basically, the butane is coming up the the tube, and the oxygen molecules are going into the little holes here the two combine and they're banging together but not a lot happens not a lot happens until you put in some heat to ignite it the the flame provides the heat and what the heat does is it causes the particles to move faster and they bang together harder that's the thing and that ish in, ish initiates the chemical reaction Okay, it causes bonds to be broken. So bonds break, but then new bonds reform. And so you'll end up producing eight carbon dioxide molecules and 10 water molecules. 
So basically, once you've got your two butane molecules and 13 oxygen molecules, you sort of like bang them together and pull them apart and then you rebuild, then you rebuild um, eight carbon dioxide molecules and 10 water molecules. And that is the modeling of the combustion of butane. Now, when you're pulling, when you're pulling um, bonds apart, that requires energy. But when the bonds reform, that puts out more energy. Now, if more energy is put out than put in, it's an exothermic reaction. But if more energy is put in pulling apart the bonds than the bonds um, giving out energy when they're uh, put together, then it's an endothermic reaction. <sighs> there you go. There's a lot of chemistry. <laughs> oh, now what is incomplete combustion? Incomplete combustion is when there is not enough oxygen molecules uh, present for the amount of butane you have. So what if you had two butane molecules and only 12 oxygen molecules instead of 13? Well, then you're going to get some incomplete combustion. And let's, um, let's I'll show you, show you this. So put your goggles on. And let's get some water in here. I'm not going to use the wire gauze this time. Okay, I'm not going to use the wire gauze. Go like this. I will pop the tripod on. And can you see how I am blocking the holes? I'm going to put that beaker on like that, and I'm blocking the I'm blocking the hole. See that yellow flame? Now, try not to burn yourself here. I don't think that's actually working how I wanted it to work. Let's try. I'm going to try something else. I'm going to block the holes there. There we go. That's a better arrangement. So, I'm collecting some of the substance that's being produced in this incomplete combustion. Remember, there's not enough oxygen to combust with the butane coming out. And, whoo, what do we find? Look at that. That is black carbon soot. Okay, that is actually carbon atoms right there, my friends. So, those carbon atoms, okay, <laughs> Uh, due to incomplete combustion and basically you're reacting butane plus oxygen, just not enough oxygen, to form water, carbon dioxide and carbon. Now if you put that under enough heat and pressure, you can create diamonds. There you go. <laughs> There's a goal for you. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be looking at the science of honeycomb. Now the honeycomb that we're making does not have any honey in it. It's got two ingredients. It's got sugar, which is the main ingredient, and some sodium bicarbonate or bicarbonate of soda. Now the chemical formula for um, bicarbonate of soda is um, NaHCO3. Now the Na stands for sodium, the H for carbon, <laughs> the H for hydrogen, um, C for carbon, and O for oxygen. So sodium, hydrogen, carbonate. Okay. Now um, we're looking at chemical reactions, and so we're going to we're going to need some heat, and so we're going to use a chemical reaction to produce heat. That's the combustion of butane. We will need our tripod, our wire gauze, and a steel or aluminium pan, one of the two. Um, I think I'll go the steel pan. And some tweezers, so that we can hold um, the pan, and also uh, the one of the wooden splints. Now, to be honest, with one of these wooden splints, I might just like snap it into two and put the other half back. So I've got a little wooden splint here. Now, we're going to put some sugar into the pan. And so I might just drag that sugar across with my um, wooden splint. 
Uh, how much do you need? Oh, a couple of spoons, tiny spoons, you know. Uh, not a lot. Now, we're making honeycomb, but because we're using this equipment, don't eat it. Okay, if you want to make honeycomb that you're going to eat, to eat, use, you know, the kitchen, use your fry pans, that sort of stuff, which don't have any chemical contamination. Okay, it's, it's a good idea not to eat things associated with your equipment because you can never guarantee what chemicals have actually been in those equipment. Now, um, we need to have some bicarb on the ready and I'm going to put my safety glasses on and get some heat happening. Now, we want this on a low flame. We don't want a lot of heat too quickly, okay? So, just a low flame, and this will go relatively quickly. So, I'm going to hold the pan. Well, I'm already seeing, I'm already seeing some uh, change happening. I'm seeing some liquid forming as the solid changes state and goes to a liquid. Now, that flame is too high. So let me turn the flame down. And as low as we can, there we go. Really need a low flame, because otherwise you're not, just, you're not just going to get a chemical, a physical change, you'll get a chemical change as well, which is basically your sugar burning. And I don't, I don't really want your sugar to burn, I just want it to liquefy. It will go a little bit yellow, golden yellow, which is nice. Um, excellent. And mine's fully liquid now. Um, can you see that golden, that golden yellow? Now I'm hoping that you're actually doing this experiment yourselves and not just watching me. The idea of this lesson, these lessons, are that you're doing the experiment and not just watching me. Now I've taken it off the heat and I'm going to get a spoon and I'm going to put a quarter of a spoon of bicarb soda in, just a tiny bit. And then I'll hold it and then I'm going to, oh, uh oh, it's hardened up. I need to, need to get it a little bit of heat again because the heat, ah, mine's frothing up. Mixy, 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 mixy. Mixy, 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 mixy. When you heat sodium, hydrogen, carbonate, which is what I'm doing right now, it actually decomposes, it decomposes to form a gas, okay? It decomposes to form a gas. And that gas is carbon dioxide. And that gas, woo, ha <laughs> ha, look at that. That gas causes it to expand and go, turn into like a foam, okay? It's a very, very hot foam, of course, though. Um, <laughs> but then when it cools down, it solidifies and well this is this is still has to cool down I could cool it down a bit quicker by popping it into water um, let's see what happens let's get some water cool this down quickly okay and now oh it's it's mmm smells a little bit burnt but it is quite nice um, <laughs> But what a fantastic example of a decomposition reaction. Now, in the decomposition reaction, two, two molecules of bicarbonate of soda break down to form a mo molecule of sodium carbonate, which is probably a salty taste, plus water, plus the key product, carbon dioxide gas, which causes this expansion, this foam of the, of the molten sugar. Now, if you have self-raising flour, that's basically just plain flour with some sodium bicarbonate added. So that when it's put in the oven and it heats up, then the heat from the oven causes the sodium bicarbonate to decompose, producing the carbon dioxide gas, which helps your bread to rise. You could do an experiment with that. You could actually compare um, dough made from plain flour and dough made with uh, self-raising flour, or you could even make your own self-raising flour, um, put, putting them in the oven with parent supervision, of course, and um, seeing how that affects the 
uh, expansion or the growing of the dough as the bread cooks. Anyway, um, stay safe. Uh, remem remember that honeycomb is hot. And so you need to, if you do get burnt, run it under cold water and seek medical advice. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to be looking at flaring magnesium. Now, magnesium comes in a, the bottle um, as a ribbon. Okay, uh, we, call, whoa, we call it a ribbon of magnesium and like most metals, it's got a silvery luster, uh, especially when cut. That's a property of metals, silvery luster when freshly cut. Magnesium is malleable. That means you can actually hammer into sheets. That means it's like flexible. Uh, it's ductile, means you can draw it into wires. It's a good conductor of heat conductor of electricity um, they are properties of metals and that's all because later on we're going to learn about um, how the electrons in the shells that there's outer electron shells and um, metals all have excessive electrons that they want to sort of get rid of and those excessive electrons uh, help provide all, or produce all those different properties. Now, I'm, you can use scissors to cut magnesium, not a problem at all. I'm just going to sort of wiggle it <laughs> until it breaks. And I'm just producing like some small little pieces, less than a centimetre long. Okay, small little pieces. I'm mainly going to use two pieces here. And we're going to do a chemical reaction. So, glasses on. Make sure you've got a second heat, a second heat proof mat really, really close by. Need some tweezers and let's light up the Bunsen burner for this chemical reaction. And there we go, fantastic. Now magnesium of course is made up of magnesium atoms and those magnesium atoms, well, surrounding it is oxygen and oxygen is around so those oxygen and nitrogen of course but we're interested in the oxygen component of the air uh, the oxygen and atoms are banging into or colliding with the magnesium um, but no reaction occurs we actually need to have a more violent um, a more violent collision and when that violent collision occurs then the chemical reaction now to get the violent collision we need to heat it up Okay, so this heat energy provides uh, the kinetic energy of the particles so that we get a... Uh, oh, I'm actually burning, I'm burning some sugar that was on the tweezers. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go, and action! Whoa, look at that. We're getting this. Now, it, it looks like white smoke, but it's actually not smoke. It's actually are tiny little particles of magnesium oxide. And this white powder is magnesium oxide. Was that a chemical reaction? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, like light was produced. There was a temperature change. There was a new substance being produced. A substance disappeared. Absolute classic, absolute classic signs that a chemical reaction has occurred. Now, it's actually possible, it's not easy to show this, it's actually possible to show that when you burn magnesium and produce magnesium oxide, that the final weight of the magnesium oxide is greater than the original weight of the magnesium itself. That is because the magnesium atoms combine with the oxygen atoms, and so you actually get more mass. The reason it's difficult to show it is because you need to do it within a crucible, a small little crucible. Now, if you've got the year 11 and 12 expansion set, uh, chemistry expansion set, then it's possible that then you'll have a crucible. You can actually purchase a small crucible off Tiny Science Lab um, and, and perform that. But for this course, it's good enough just to know that the mass of the magnesium oxide is more than the original mass of the 
magnesium ribbon itself. Maybe you can come up with a way to demonstrate it. I'm not too sure how it's beyond, the, it's beyond my a limited brain power, but you know, I don't want to limit your brain power. You might be able to work out a way to demonstrate it. Anyway, uh, that was just a short lesson. And oh, look, burning a magnesium flare, sometimes in rescue situations, people shoot up these, um, they use a, like a, a, a special gun that shoots up this flare that's on a parachute and it's a big lump of magnesium that floats down, um, that's burning of course, and uh, it's underneath a parachute and then that lights up the whole area. Fantastic, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be doing a milk vinegar uh, and temperature experiment. So. I've got um, some full cream milk straight out of the fridge in this uh, little pouring jug. And I've just got some white vinegar from Coles, but Woolworths, Aldi, wherever you get vinegar from is perfectly fine. Now, when you add like an acidic substance to milk, it could be uh, lemon juice, vinegar, probably even a citric acid dissolved, uh, the milk curled cur curdles. It, uh, coagulates and it forms what we call curds which are the solid part and waves which are the liquid part. Now a little baby when it drinks its milk from the mother um, well there's acids in the stomach that cause the milk to curdle and sometimes if you've got a little baby brother or sister they'll chuck up <laughs> and you'll see all the curdled milk you'll know what I'm talking about. This process though not the drinking the milk and vomiting, though, is used to make cheese or the starting process to curdle milk to make cheese. Now the question is, does temperature play a role in the speed of this curdling? So I say we find out and so we can do an experiment. So I've got a 10 mil beaker here and I'm going to add to it 10 mil of this cold milk. So 10 mil. And um, how about a measuring cylinder, measuring cylinder, and I'm going to get a funnel and I'm going to put in one mil. Okay, so one mil of vinegar. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that was way too much. Way too much milk. No, way too much vinegar. What shall I do? What shall I do? I might pour it into this little conical flask. And what I can do, I know what I can do, I will get a um, plastic pipette and I'll transfer one mil of um, vinegar. So, in designing this experiment, we need to think about how, how are we going to have a fair experiment. What are we trying, trying to find? The, the, the effect that temperature, temperature has on the speed at which the milk coagulates. So um, the temperature is what we're going to be changing. We're going to change the temperature. And so that becomes the independent variable. That's what we're going to put at the center of our Lotus experiment planner. The dependent variable depends on the independent variable and that will be the time it takes for the milk to curdle. And then around the outside uh, of our plan, we have to show what we're keeping the same. So in this case, we're going to keep uh, the 10 mil, of, 10 mil volume of milk the same, one mil of vinegar the same. We're going to keep the same type of milk, okay? We're going to keep the same type of vinegar. If we stir it, and I'll make that decision later on, we need to stir it the same. The hardest thing to control in this experiment will be deciding when the milk has curdled. I've got my 10 mil of milk, and I need to find out the temperature. Now, it came out of the fridge. So I'm guessing, but it got poured into a beaker that was at 17 degrees. So I'm thinking it probably will go to about a 11 or 12 degrees, something like that, okay? Could cool it down even further, um, maybe with some ice. No, you couldn't put ice, you couldn't put ice in the milk. Why couldn't you put ice in the milk? Any ideas why you shouldn't put ice in the milk? 
because when it melts, it turns to water and that will dilute the milk. And so it will be, the milk will have, it won't be normal milk. And so that will um, cause it not to be a valid experiment. So 12 and a half degrees, 12 and a half degrees. And so let's go to our table where we record our results. And the temperature, our independent variable is 12 and a half and the time is question mark. The time is question mark. And so let's pour in our one mil and give it a little bit of a stir. Let's give it a little bit of a stir and see what happens over time. Oh no! Oh no! I didn't put a stopwatch on! Mm -hmm. Silly Billy. Is that curdling up at all? Is that curdling up at all? I don't know. Does it need more acid? Does it need more acid? How long, how long is this supposed to take anyway? Have I set up an experiment that's not going to work again? <laughs> Oh, hmm. How about I get another mill? Let's get another mill. Zoop. Maybe I need to add two mill of acid each time. Like, I would... Maybe it's too cold. Maybe it's too cold to curdle. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe my milk is not very good. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting, I might put it to the side and just leave it there for now, okay? So, let's get another beaker and put in 10 mil of milk. So, same size beaker, same amount of milk, but I am going to change the temperature, okay? This time I'm definitely going to change the temperature and see whether that has any effect. Now, where's my... Clicker, here we go. Click. Now, I'd like to warm this up gently. Um, so I don't want to damage the molecular structure of the milk. Now, I'm not going to use this stirring rod until I have washed the stirring rod. So I certainly need to wash the stirring rod because I don't want to introduce any contaminants. Now that hasn't been on for very long and that's probably as much as I'd like to warm it up this time. Okay, so I'm just warming it through. Warming it through and I'll need the thermometer probe. Okay, and I'll put the thermometer probe in and let's see what the new temperature is. Now I'm just going to look at this original one. I really, has there been any curling? Oh, actually, maybe there is. Maybe there is. How about I sort of pour it and see what happens when I pour it? Oh, uh-oh. It's gone sort of lumpy. This was 10 mil of milk with two mil of vinegar in it. Certainly there's lumpies there, that's for sure. So there definitely has been some type of uh, lumpies or curdles, waves and curds and whey, but I don't really know the time that it's formed. So I'm going to put a question mark, okay? Um, question mark, uh, curds, hard to observe, okay? I'm just writing a note for myself, curds were hard to observe. What's our temperature here now? We're at 20.6 degrees. 20.6 degrees and by the time I sort myself out that will probably be yeah, fallen to about 20 degrees so I'll just call it 20 degrees for now and let's get one mil of acid our vinegar and in you go will I need one mil or will I need more than a mil I don't think I'll need more than a mil pour it in and Give it a stir and <clears throat> again, 
how do I determine when the... Oh, I forgot to put the stopwatch on again. Hmm. What? What's happening? Like, like, it's hard to actually tell if it's curdling or not. Like, that's thickening. That's thickened up. That's thickened up. But it's certainly not curdled. See that? It's thick, but not curdling. But, what if I wait longer? Let's have a look at this first one again. Ugh, lumpies, lumpies, lumpies. Ugh. Oh, look, I'm going to get another 10 mil of milk warming up. Hmm. So, sometimes... The experiments I get kids to do are more, more for inspiration, more to inspire you to uh, do an experiment as opposed to me pulling off a working experiment that's got all the answers and all the results and, you know. Um, I know that sounds a bit like just a, a lame excuse for my experiments not working. And to be honest, yeah. I'm, okay. I, I just blew that out. There we go. So, maybe I need more than one mil of vinegar. I think that might be the case. I think that's the one of the issues that I've got here. One mil of vinegar just simply is not enough vinegar. I think I actually have to go to two mil. Woo! Now... Mixy, 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 mixy. I'm going to turn off the heat and just let it sit there for a bit. I'm aiming for like 30 degrees. Yes, there's there's just not a lot of curdling happening, happening there. I'm going to go to one mil. Let's add another mil and see what happens. Let's pour that in. Give it a little bit of a mix. And I'll let that wait there to the side for a moment. And for the next one, I'm going to put in the two mil straight away. So I guess in some ways, sometimes before you come up with a final method, you can have a draft method, okay? Um, because maybe the method that you think is going to work is just not going to work. And so you need to do a few trials and then you need to <clears throat> adjust according to the trials. Now, you might have some double strength vinegar from Woolworths and therefore, yes, you can easily do it with um, one mil. Whereas this seems like normal strength. Now we're at 30, 34, 34.5, 34.6, 34.8, and 35 degrees. That's the temperature we're at, 35 degrees. And so I'm going to pour in my vinegar, like that. Give it a little bit of a stir. And... Whoa, hello, hello, look, wow, oh wow, look, that looks like baby chuck, I'm definitely getting curds and weight, isn't that interesting, wow, oh, look at all those lumps, temperature makes a massive difference. Let's take, let's have a look at this, uh, this, oh, look, time though, time does make a difference, but temperature is making a huge difference there. Wow. Back to this one, which was the 35 degrees one. And I actually don't know how to call the end of it. That's the problem. I don't know how to say when it's actually completed. Hmm. 
what would happen if we do 50 degrees Celsius or, you know, like a really high temperature? I've only got three beakers, so I'm going to tip out this original one. Um, let's give it a little bit of a wash. I mean, 35 degrees coagulated so well or went to curds and whey so well. Certainly, a much higher temperature will work even better, won't it? Won't it? Hmm. Well, that's why we do experiments to find these things out, yes? Let's pop in here. Whee! Pop them on. Now, I don't want to blast the living daylights out of it, so I'll just turn it down a little. Oh, don't turn it down so much that it, oh, didn't go off. Perfect. And I do want to try and mix it evenly. Okay, mixy, 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 mixy. Should have my safety goggles on. I hopefully you've got your safety goggles on. Okay. I've said it once. I'll say it a hundred times. A pair of goggles. Never wrecked a good experiment. And I'm holding it with my hand, which is not a great idea. I probably should be using the metal tongs. And I'm sort of mixing it to keep the, so that the the bottom doesn't get too hot too quickly. So mixy, 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 mixy. Whoa, that's a little bit too intense, isn't it? And let's try that. Yep. All right. I think that's nice. And maybe, maybe because we're using two mil of vinegar, maybe the vinegar should be warmed up as well or heated up as well to the same temperature. Um, 35, four, we're at 40 almost. 43, that's a much higher temperature. 44, 45, 46. Remember, do you remember I was aiming for 50? I think I'll be close. 46 and a half, that's pretty close. And we need two mil, two mil of vinegar. There we go. And pour him in, zoop. And around we go. Mixy, 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 mixy so that Wow, just wow, maybe, maybe, ah, I think that's how we can determine, that's how we can determine, look, yes, you stir, you stir at a constant rate until it's all coagulated. That's what you do. Look. <gasps> I love science. Curds and whey. Curds and whey. So, I've just provided the stimulus for you now to continue with this experiment. I'd probably go to, I'd probably start at 20 degrees Celsius and I would stir at a constant rate until I've decided that it's coagulated. Then I'd do 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, 70 degrees. I mean, you're only using 10 mil of vinegar and <laughs> 10 mil of milk and two mil of vinegar each time, so not a lot. That's absolutely fantastic, okay? So, yeah, so modify, modify your, uh, the experiment where it says, instead of saying one mil, um, say the new and improved, use two mil. Just put a line through it and put two. Okay, you can talk about that in the um, discussion, right? Um, that's if there is any room on the sheet for the discussion. But wow, just wow. Okay, hopefully you are now going to proceed and do a real proper valid experiment with quite a few results, but the key is to stir and make your decision while stirring. All right, well, hopefully... You've found that as informative as I found it. Very, very interesting. And um, uh, be interesting to see 
whether it just gets faster and faster each time as you heat it up or whether something else will happen. I suspect something else will happen, but it's over to you to find out. Okay, bye for now. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're starting and we're thinking about and setting up a corrosion experiment. Now corrosion is effectively metals, um, well, oxidizing. Uh, iron oxidizes to form rust, so we'd often call it iron rusting. Now, to do this, I'm actually using one of my tiny science lab um, test tube holders. Now, you probably won't have one of those holders, and so you might have to maybe make one out of cardboard, or you could use a drinking glass and place them in the drinking glass. Um, anyway, you have to work out a way how you're going to just hold your test tubes upright. Now, for this experiment, you need some some things that are made out of iron. Now, I'm going to use iron nails, but to make this go a lot faster, you could actually use some steel wool. See, steel wool has got quite a, quite a large surface area, and so the rate of the reaction will be much, much faster. And so you probably get results within hours, whereas with nails, you probably might take days to get results. So just keep that in mind. Um, so we're, we're investigating what are some of the factors um, that affect corroding. Now, when you set up an experiment like this, you need what's called a control, okay? Basically, the control shows you what happens when there are no changes to made. So I'm going to get one bright nail. It's, a, it's called a bright iron nail. And I'm going to put it into my test tube. Now, just be a little bit careful. I dropped it then, and that that had the risk of actually, um, I probably should have put it head first down so the point wouldn't damage the, the bottom, but that's my control there. It's just like sitting in the test tube in air. Now, some people might argue with me and say, you know what, it would be better if you put some uh, like water crystals in there that absorb the water and if you put a lid on it. Yes, I admit, it'd be best to actually have it in a vacuum I agree, but I don't have the equipment here to make a vacuum, so this is the best that I can do. Um, now, what about water? Does water affect the rate of corrosion? So I've got a test tube of water, and I put the nail in, and the, the nail is fully covered with water. So one in air, one fully covered in water. Now, interestingly, interestingly, um, I think there is a difference if it's only half covered in water. Okay, so in this particular um, trial, the nail is half in, half in water, half out of water. So that might give some interesting results. Now, you might have a, a boat or you might be down, you might have gone down to the ocean and you've seen the effect that salt water has on metal and iron and how it accelerates rusting. So. How about we do one with covered in salty water? Yeah, so if I dig up some salt, well, that's a lot of salt. I don't want that much salt. <laughs> if I dig up some salt um, and I squirt that salt down and if I need to, and I do need to dissolve that salt, um, I can dissolve it by the tapping, the tapping method. Tap, 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 tap. Trying to, I'm trying to get a swirl happening here. And that salt will, that salt will um, dissolve. And so I can put the test, the nail fully under the salt. Okay, that salt will dissolve fairly quickly. And another one where I only half fill the test tube with salt water so that some of the nail is protruding like that. So now I've got a control and four variables. Now, if I had more test tubes, I could do things like, what about if I put it in vinegar? What about if I put it under oil? What about if I boiled the water first? What about if I put a stopper on it? 
Uh, there's so many different trials that you could do to investigate the rate of corrosion. But the idea is now that you will observe this over five days and you can you can either use uh, these trials or you can come up with your own trials. Uh, and But as I said, if you want it to go a bit faster, use steel wool. Okay, well that's it for today's video and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, I hopefully you find that your results are very interesting. Okay, bye for now. Well, congratulations, you've made it to the end of the year eight chemistry course. Woohoo! Go you! <laughs> so, in this lesson, we are looking at the nine forms of energy. Now, a uh, great definition of energy and the one which I learnt when I was in year seven high school uh, and has served me well until this old age of grey hair is that energy is anything that causes change. Energy is anything that causes change. And I think that there's nine forms. Sometimes you'll see ten forms, but... I don't think mechanical is a form of energy, but don't tell anybody I said that. They might get upset. Uh, and, and I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm allowed to say that. But let's see if I can remember them. Sound. Sound is a form of energy. And there should be some little balloons in here. And if we uh, blow up a balloon, um, you can get a sound that's a, a, quite an annoying sound by actually... Mm, getting your fingers sometimes and going like that. That's not working, but I know a really annoying way to get a sound. Here we go. All right, that will drive your siblings and your parents crazy. So sound is a form of energy. Now, if I blow up the balloon a little bit, and if I release the balloon, woo, <laughs> it shoots off. That's because movement or kinetic energy is a form of energy. So kinetic energy is moving energy. So if I blow onto a um, my hand, that's energy. Now I'm going to do something. It's a little bit. It's a little bit. I won't say naughty, but um, let's get the um, Bunsen burner. And if I light the Bunsen burner like so, and I put the wire gauze on, and if I get a conical flask and put a just a small amount of water in it, not a lot, and then push the rubber strop stopper on fairly firmly, but not overly firmly, and then stand back. Okay, so um, can you see the risk? That's here. Now you only need a little tiny bit. Now I do not actually recommend you do this. Let's take this as just a demonstration, please. Okay, so I'm just doing a demonstration. You should not do this um, at home. Okay, you should not do this at home or in the classroom. Just as a demonstration here, I'm just going to turn up the heat a little bit so it goes a little bit faster. But as the water heats up, the particles move around more. That's kinetic energy as the particles are moving around a little bit more. And then when, it, when the water reaches 100 degrees Celsius, those particles will shoot off uh, as it turns from a liquid to a gas. Now those particles shooting off will collide firstly with each, Way! <laughs> with each other. Oh. And um, thankfully it's all good. Ow! Did that, that catch you by surprise as well? Caught me by surprise. <laughs> but anyway, those particles, eventually they supply enough force uh, that overcomes the um, force of friction on the side wall, causing the rubber stopper to accelerate off. Um, the danger there, of course, is that there might be some hot water that sprays or that you might break your conical flask. But as I said, demonstration only. So that is kinetic energy. Now, what have we looked at? We've looked at sound energy, uh, kinetic energy, um, well, heat energy, of course. Um, heat is a form of energy. 
And <laughs> well, uh, that 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 tripod is probably quite hot. It's got heat energy. Let's see if that causes any change. Ah, oh, can you see that little bit of steam coming off? That's not very exciting at all, is it? That that heat energy was a little bit boring. Um, what's a more interesting form of heat energy? Um, oh well, if I get my Bunsen burner flame going, woo! And if I just put the tripod here, and if I heat the end of my um, tongs, yeah, if I heat the end of my tongs, get a little bit of water in a well. You should really use a, a glass beaker for this, okay? And if I put my tongue, woo, sizzle, 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 that, that heat energy um, is transformed into kinetic energy as, it, as the water moves and also sound energy. So you can't create energy. You can merely change it from one form to another. So you can transform energy from one form of energy to another, but you can't create it and neither can you destroy it. So, ooh, sizzle, 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 sizzle. Very good. So we've got sound, kinetic, heat. Now, electricity. Electricity is a form of energy. Um, oh, didn't I have some steel wool here? I'd had some steel wool here. What change can, what change can electricity bring about? Well, we, we've seen this in a previous. Woo, look at that. The electricity caused um, the wire, wire steel wool to, to heat up and ignite. It actually got past the ignition. Well, I don't want to talk about the ignition temperature. It's like really fast corrosion, if we're going to be honest about it. That's actually quite exciting. Um, so we've got electricity as well. So uh, one I can't show you is nuclear, nuclear energy. Now. Nuclear energy is used in nuclear power stations to produce heat, to boil water, to turn turb uh, to produce steam, to turn turbines, to generate electricity. Uh, you've got nuclear powered submarines, nuclear powered um, aircraft carriers. Uh, unfortunately, atomic bombs are also nuclear powered, um, and that's a really bad form of using that particular energy. Um, what else have we got? We got, so we got sound. Oh, light, light, light. Need light. Okay, well, we've done light before, haven't we? Um, the, probably the very brightest light that one can actually produce, um, that I know that you can produce, is actually um, a little piece of magnesium. So, magnesium. Burning. If I wiggle, 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 wiggle. And if I get my Bunsen burner going, well, there's a little bit of light with the Bunsen burner, isn't there? And, but, holding the little tiny bit of magnesium, and action! There we go, what a lot of light there is there. So, um, so okay, so, uh, let, me, let me see how we're going here with sound, kinetic, light, heat, electricity, nuclear. Okay, that then brings us to our stored forms of energy. Okay, our stored forms of energy. So again, I'm going to blow up this balloon. I like blowing up balloons. And yeah, there is some energy stored in here due to the elasticity, due to the elasticity of the balloon. So it's called elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy. And let's see what I can change elastic potential energy into. Are we ready? <laughs> Pop! Uh, produced sound and kinetic. So, another elastic potential energy. This stretchiness. This is, you know, I pull it apart and woo! Pulls it together. Pull it apart, woo! Pulls it together. That's elastic potential energy. Now, there is a little bit of um, debate. And if I get a, uh, a magnet and I bring it near a steel pan... If I bring it closer, 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 woo, it jumps up. Pulling it apart is almost a form of giving this, uh, this system some elastic potential energy because it will now attract it and produce some kinetic and some sound. That's all right. You can debate that with me whether indeed pulling a magnet apart from a source of iron is giving it uh, elastic potential energy up to you. 
Chemical potential energy, chemical potential energy, oh, there's chemical potential energy in a lot of our equipment, in the um, matches, in the butane, in the steel wool. Well, the steel wool doesn't come with the equipment. Woo! Uh, the magnesium ribbon. Um, well, if you were to burn a balloon, I guess. Uh, if you were to burn wood or the tapers, that's all chemical potential energy. Uh, last but not least is um, if I lift something up and I drop it, it gets um, kinetic. And so this is actually gravitational potential energy. When you do work against gravity, you get gravitational potential energy. So that's it, my friends. Yes, that's the year eight course. I hope that you've enjoyed doing it as much as I've enjoyed presenting it to you. I know that I'm not a perfect presenter and I know I get things wrong but it's merely to encourage you to do better than me. Um, <laughs> so if you want to be a better presenter, then you need to study hard and then you can come and see me later and say, Jacob, I want to be the next tiny science lab presenter. I think I can do a better job and I'll, I'll give you a try and see whether you can indeed do a better job. But I uh, look forward to seeing you maybe in real life one day. Make sure you come and say hi to me. Um, and who knows, uh, you might even want to be doing the year nine and year 10 courses if and when they're done, which hmm, hopefully will be a few months away from this point of time now. Or maybe they're already done and you're, you can get straight into them. Um, anyway, I look forward to seeing you uh, again soon and uh, thank you so much for doing this course with me. All right, bye for now and I'll see you later. Bye, 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 bye.